PHP and MySQL play a significant role in web and application development. PHP is a server-side general-purpose scripting language that is primarily suited for web development. MySQL is an open-source relational database management system that is used with PHP. MySQL is developed, distributed and supported by Oracle Corporation. So hi everyone, welcome to this PHP and MySQL full course by Simply Learn. In today's session, we will get an introduction to PHP and understand the PHP programming concepts. We will look at object-oriented programming in PHP and learn how to use PHP with MySQL. Then, we will see the CRUD operations and build registration as well as login forms using PHP. Moving further, we will look at how to develop a web application using PHP. Next, we will understand the basics of MySQL and database management systems. You will learn about various MySQL commands and functions to store, process and manipulate data. So, you will understand how to write SELECT, WHERE, GROUP BY and HAVING clauses in MySQL. Then, you will get an idea about the various joins in MySQL followed by looking at the advanced MySQL concepts such as triggers, stored procedures and window functions. Finally, you will learn the most commonly asked PHP and MySQL interview questions to ace your career as a web developer or a SQL developer. So, let's begin. Let us first meet Rob. Rob is the owner of an e-commerce business. Earlier, his customers were very happy with the products they purchased from his website. But with more traffic and user base, Rob started receiving complaints from his customers, not related to the products, but the website itself. Now, the customers were facing challenges like slow website speed, bad user experience, and poor security features. Like any other business owner, Rob wanted to rectify the problem, but he was unable to find a solution to it. Well, developing his websites in PHP can solve all of Rob's problems. And guess what? PHP is simple to learn and easier to implement. Let me elaborate on this. So PHP is useful in many ways as, first and foremost, it can make the website function faster. It can create dynamic web pages, and dynamic web pages are what makes a website more interactive. Next, it provides security encryption. It is a cost-efficient language. It is very compatible as it works efficiently with different databases and programming languages. And it is platform independent, which means a PHP application can run on any environment. Now, before moving into the details, did you know that 79.2% web is still powered by PHP, which nearly translates to 20 million websites and 1 million web servers. Now, in this presentation, You'll learn about what is PHP, how does it work differently from a conventional web page, what are its features, some major companies where PHP is implemented, prerequisites on learning it, and finally, we will have a look at the demo for our first PHP program. Now, without further ado, let's get started. So, what exactly is PHP? PHP stands for Hypertext Preprocessor which is a recursive acronym. It is an open source server-side scripting language that is embedded into HTML and used for web development. Now, before we get overwhelmed by the technical terms, let me simplify them for you. Now, for those of you who don't know, open source is a term for technology, which means it is freely available to everyone. While server-side scripting means that from writing the code to implementing and processing it, everything is done on the server side while the user just lays down and enjoys the experience. Now that we know what PHP is, let's see how a PHP script looks like. As you can see on the screen, this is the syntax of PHP. It opens with an angled bracket, question mark, PHP, and ends with a question mark and an angled bracket, while the code comes in between them. Now, as you can so notice, this is very similar to how HTML codes are written. Now let's have a look at some features of PHP. Now, while PHP being a very diverse and feature-rich language, some of its main features are listed here. Let us try and understand them one by one. First is simple. Now this feature comes as a good news to new learners, since PHP is simple and hence an easy to learn language. Next comes flexibility. PHP is a highly flexible language, 
In conventional web pages, even the smallest of changes have to go through the developer who changes the code to implement them. Well, PHP gives you the flexibility to make small changes without the intervention of the developer itself. It is also platform independent, which means it does not require any special plugins to run and can basically run on any environment. Next is interpreted. PHP is an interpreted language and does not compile the entire code, hence taking less time. Which takes us to our next feature, that is fast. Websites developed in PHP are faster. This is why developing dynamic websites using PHP is considered as the best option. As discussed earlier too, PHP is called as an open source language, which means it is free to use and implement. Next feature is security. The language consists of a few built-in frameworks that provides benefits like encryption and hence protection from cyber attacks. Next is a large PHP community. Since PHP is an old language, it has grown up to a large community which is very helpful and makes the language more stable. So that was all about features of PHP. Moving forward, let us discuss the workflow of a PHP web page. How does a PHP page work? So for a better understanding, let us first see how a basic HTML page functions. In the basic HTML workflow, when you open a website on your browser, a request is sent from the browser to the server and the server then returns the requested page stored on it back to the browser. Now that's it. No matter what device or what purpose you open the website for, the page return is always the same or you can say static. Now what PHP does different is when you open a website Developed in PHP, a request in .php extension is sent to the server. Into the server, there exists a PHP interpreter which recognizes the .php file and interprets it. Based on the request from the browser, it pulls out data from its database and file systems and returns a HTML page personalized according to the user. Now let me give you an example to make it more clear. When you log into your account on Rob's new e-commerce website made on PHP, it takes your unique request to the server and shows you products based on your past preference and liking instead of showing you the exact same page every time. Now this makes the website dynamic and more interactive to the user. Also guys, before moving forward, if you're enjoying this video, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to Simply Learn for more such content. So that was all about the workflow of PHP. Let us discuss the companies using them. Many companies have reached great success by implementing PHP into their websites. Let me list down a few of them. First comes Facebook, the biggest social media platform. Did you know that Facebook was created entirely on PHP? And according to the website SimilarWeb, PHP is visited by users for nearly 22 billion times per month. This means the social media platform has to deal with huge traffic volumes and PHP helps the website with this. Now before moving to the next website, a quick question for you guys. What is the one site everyone goes to for information? Correct, it's Wikipedia. And guess what, it is written in PHP too. Now platforms like WordPress which are used to create beautiful websites itself are also based on PHP and blogging and social media channels such as Tumblr and even multi-service platforms like Yahoo which face huge amounts of data traffic every day uses PHP to function. So now that I hope you're more motivated to learn PHP, let us look at some of the prerequisites of learning it. Now since PHP scripts as already discussed are embedded into HTML codes, a basic understanding of HTML comes naturally as a prerequisite. Again, a website cannot be complete without the implementation of CSS. Hence, a basic understanding of CSS is also a must. Next is basic knowledge of programming language. Now this is not necessarily a prerequisite, but if you have basic knowledge of programming fundamentals such as OOPS concept, functions and arrays etc, it would really help you along the way.
let's get started and learn what exactly is XAMPP. Now, XAMPP stands for Cross Platform Apache Server Maria Database PHP and then finally Perl. XAMPP is an open source application that is developed by Apache friends and is one of the easiest ways to host a local web server with access to MySQL database, PHP and Perl. So it is an all-in-one package. So now that we have an understanding of what XAMPP is, let us set up the software on our system and then see how to use it to run a PHP script. So now to set up the XAMPP software, what we need to do is let us open the browser and download our software. So as you can see here, apachefriends.org is the official website from where you can download the XAMPP software. Since we are using the Windows version, we'll download it for Windows, although it is available for Linux and Mac OS as well. Now let's wait for the download to get finished. It almost is. Now let's open the setup and install our software right away. Continue installation. Next. Now from here you can select all the extra files that you want to install along with the XAMPP setup or you don't want to install. Now this is the default folder for XAMPP installation that is C drive XAMPP and I would recommend you keep it that way. I think there's some issue here. Yeah, well, this is the folder for my old XAMPP. Yeah. Now, we wait for the installation to get finished and then we'll run a quick PHP script, a welcome or hello world kind of script to see how this XAMPP software functions along with PHP. Now the installation is almost done. We'll just wait for a few. Now the installation is complete and now let us open the control panel to check if it's done correctly. Yes, everything seems fine. Now so this is the control panel for the XAMPP software which includes all the services provided by it and in our PHP tutorials we will be mainly using the Apache server and the MySQL one. So you need to click on Apache server started and mysql now apache server will show you the default port on which it is running now to check if xamp is correctly installed on your system let's open the browser again and type localhost now this will open up the dashboard for the xamp application let's click on php my admin and the information is available here so the installation is complete Similarly, we'll install the Visual Studio code. Since I've already installed the software on my system, I'll not be doing that. Now, let us come to the important part. Let us redirect to C drive and there we have a XAMPP installed. Open the XAMPP folder and locate htdocs. Now, this is the folder where all your PHP files, codes and website related data will be stored. Now we'll open the htdocs and let us create a new folder here. Since it will be a first program, let us name it first php. Now let's open our code editor that is Visual Studio Code. Click on open folder. Locate to XAMPP htdocs and the folder we created first php 
Now, as you can see, let me close this first. As you can see, first PHP folder is visible here. Let us create our first PHP file. Let's name it hello.php. Now, don't forget the .php extension, otherwise, the code will not run. Now, since a browser only understands HTML code, we will have to embed the PHP script into the HTML code itself. So let's begin. Let me zoom it a little bit so you can see clearly. Let me add a heading. So H1 will be too big. Let's keep it to H2. My first PHP web page. Let's write our first PHP script. So a PHP script begins with an opening angular bracket, question mark, PHP. Now we'll write the PHP script that is echo hello world. Now echo acts as a print function which prints any string that is in front of it. In this case, it will display hello world onto the web page. Let's close the script with a question mark and a closing angular bracket and also close our HTML code. Now before running a web page, let us first check if the web server is still active. Yes, the web server is still running. So let's open the browser, type localhost. Now type the name of the folder that you have created that is first php. Now as you can see our hello.php file is present here. Let's click on it. And as you can see our first web page is visible which shows the heading my first PHP web page and the hello world from a PHP script. In this video on PHP programming, we're going to discuss different PHP concepts from the very basics such as syntax, hello world program up until learning how to collect form data using PHP scripts and also cover a lot more concepts in between. Now what we need to do is to use Visual Studio Code. What we do is we go to C drive XAMPP folder or wherever you have installed your XAMPP software, we go to that folder, locate htdocs and let us now create another folder and you can name it anything that you want to based on your project. Since we are discussing the concepts, let us name it concepts. Now right click on it and here as you can see it shows open with code. When you click on it, you can see that it opens Visual Studio Code for you along with the concepts folder that we just created. Now this is where you will create all your files for your project and will be writing all, your, all of your PHP scripts. Now let's create the first PHP file from here, new file. Let us name it tutorial dot php and see how a php syntax looks like so a php syntax begin with an angular opening bracket question mark php and ends with a question mark and a closing angular bracket while the php script goes in between so this is the very basic syntax of how PHP scripts are written. Now let us move on and see how to write a hello world program using a PHP script. So to print something on PHP, echo is used. Now to use echo, what you need to do is just write the string that you want to print in front of it and save the program. So hello and welcome to simply learn. Let us close it and save the file. Now 
I'm going to show you how to use the ZAMP software in order to run PHP scripts. Go and open your ZAMP control panel. And from the control panel, you have to start this first service that is Apache. Now this is going to start a local web server on your system. Now open your browser, go to a new tab and type localhost followed by the name of the folder that we just created into htdocs that was concepts and hit enter. Here you can see the file that we just created tutorial.php and when you click on it, you can see your first program visible here. Hello and welcome to Simply Learn. Now suppose you have a program that needs to print this exact same string again and again throughout the program. So what are you going to do? Type the entire echo statement through your code or make it simpler. Now to make it simpler what we need to do is we need to go back to our code and discuss the concept of variables. Now to create a variable what we need to do is we need to use this dollar sign followed by the name of the variable you can name it anything you want. So let us name it str and type hello and welcome to simply learn so this is our first variable now this variable str stores this string value also you can create different variables for different purposes such as if you want to store a number suppose so you can store number 5 and suppose you want to store a floating variable and that would be float and a floating variable is a number with decimal points so 7.6 so now we have three variables in our program now one thing to notice if you're coming from a different programming language is that you don't need to define the type of variable in php that is if it is a string number or a floating variable now to print this we can use echo but when you want to print a variable in echo you need to do things a little differently so let us start with h1 heading Now to print a variable what you need to do is you need to use dot followed by the name of the variable that would be str and another dot followed by if you want to type something along with the variable I'm going to copy this code and paste it now let us change the size of the headings and also change a variable so in the second line we are going to print num and in the third the float that we created so now we have all of our variables into our echo now let us save this program and see what it does so as you can see the variables are printed on your program and you don't have to write them again and again you can simply write the name of the variable along with echo and dot and print it along now that we know about variables suppose you want to print the names of different laptop brands available in the market now what you're going to do do you create different variables for each name that is a variable for HP, a variable for Lenovo, a variable for Asus or do you want a single variable to store, store all of the names of the laptop brands available? Now with 
arrays it is possible to store different information of the same data type that is integer string under a single variable the condition is all of the data that is stored under the variable should have the same data type now let us see how array works now array stores multiple values in a single variable as we already discussed now to make an array first what we need to do is name a variable laptop brand and type in array function and under that function we are going to write the names of different laptop brands that is hp with separated by commas lenovo asus and dell so suppose these are the four laptop brands that are available in the market in your area now what you need to do is you need to print what is in this particular variable that is laptop brand so to print it you need to first create variable dump now what variable dump does is it as you can see here it exports the variable that is in its function now we are going to write the variable that we just created into the variable dump function and it will just return the data type and value now suppose you want to print it so to print it what we need to do is just add echo in front of it okay now before moving on to seeing the result of this program let us just make this part of the code inactive now to do that we are going to learn a new concept in between that is comments so comments are the lines in a code that are not executed while the program is run so a single line comment starts with two slash and anything written in front of it is does not run along with the code so these comments are very useful when you're writing a code to make your code readable and more understandable by any coder who will or might later on use the code that you've just created now suppose what we can do with comments is i'm going to write a comment just in front of it this is a string variable now after these slashes anything written is not executed when i'm going to run the program also now what do you do if you want to make this whole part of the code not functioning do you add two slashes in front of everything or you can use a much simpler method that is multi multi-line comments to use multi-line comments what you're going to do is use slash star this marks the start of the multi-line code and to end this use star and slash again and everything in between does not run when you're going to run your program so we will now see how this array works we will just reload this page and as you can see hp lenovo asus and dell are visible here also you might notice this array 4 shows the length of the array and this shows the position where all of these strings are inside the array that is 
an array starts with the zero position not one but zero so the first would be zero position that is hp and then one lenovo and subsequently asus and dell now suppose you just want to print the second variable in your array what you need to do is you need to go back to your code and in front of the variable you need to write the position that you want to print under square brackets that is the second position in array would be number one and save the code go back to the browser and only the second array is the second variable in the array is visible now suppose instead of a variable you want to create a value that you don't want to be changed throughout your entire program so consonants are used for the same purpose now consonants are very much like variables except that once they are defined they cannot be changed or undefined so let us see how consonants work first we will put this code under a comment and now start writing a consonant so uh, to define or create a consonant what you need to do is use the define function and inside the define function what you need to do is you need to write the name of the consonant and okay first let us write the name of the consonant suppose laptops followed by the value of the hp consonant lenovo and asus and that's it and you close the define function and there you have defined your consonant in your php script now this cannot be changed or undefined throughout your program now to print it what you need to do is type echo followed by the name of the consonant that you just created so the name of the consonant is laptops save the code go back and HP Lenovo and Asus are visible here. You can also create consonant arrays along with a normal consonant. Now to do, create a consonant array, you just need to add a square bracket. Just a second. Let me close this one. separated by commas and now we have the names of the laptop as an array which by the way cannot be changed or undefined through your, throughout your code just like any other consonant now suppose you want to just print the name of the third laptop that is available in the market now what you need to do is you need to write the position and the third position in case of arrays would be number two save and only asus is visible here so this is how consonants and variables work in php now before moving on to the next section let me give you another situation now suppose i want you to print a number only and only if it is greater than 7 how do you do that now since it is a condition conditional statements are used to perform different actions based on different conditions now some of the conditional statements include in php are if if else if else if else and switch and we're going to discuss them one by one no so the first one is if
now let me create a variable let us name it bear and write the value 8 now the example that we just discussed if we want to check if this variable is greater than 7 and only and only then print the variable on our screen now to do that what we need to do is type in if and in the bracket we need to type the condition that we're going to check that is if variable greater than 7 now use curly brackets and inside the curly bracket write the code that you want to execute only and only if the condition in of this if is met so we need to print this variable so echo where and go and save it now go back and reload and you can see it is printed here now let us go back and change the value of the variable to 5 and save it go back reload and as you can see nothing is printed on the screen since the condition that we just mentioned inside if does not meet now suppose i tell you that if the condition does not meet you have to print a string saying that the condition does not did not meet how do you do that to do it what you need to add after if is else and else does not need to have a condition since as the english word suggests it is else which means the condition of if did not meet and inside the else we are going to write the code echo the condition did not meet save it the condition did not meet now time for another condition now suppose i want i ask you to check if a number is div divisible by 2 3 or both how do you do that now to do that first let us create a number 6 now check if variable percent 2 is equals to equals to 0 now what this shows is this brings out the remainder and if the remainder is 0 that means it is divisible by 2 and we need to add one more condition here and and variable percent 3 equals to equals to 0 and what this does is it checks if both of these conditions are true that is if the number inside the variable is divisible by both 2 and 3 we will display divisible by both now what we need to do is we need to check if it is divisible by 2 so else if so since it is else if we need to add a condition in it too else if variable person 2 equals to equals to 0 echo divisible by 2 similarly
divisible by 3 another you can add as many else if statements as you want and the final else will show okay let us go back and save a program since a variable is 6 it should show divisible by both and you can see it shows exactly the same divisible by both now let us change the value and see if our program works so what we are going to do is we are going to change the value to 4 save a program and run it again this by 2 similarly 9 this by 3 and finally 13 not divisible by either 2 or 3 so this is how you can make use of if else if and else statements now the next conditional statement is switch statement now the switch statement is used to perform different actions based on different conditions so let me again give you a situation so that you understand better so suppose you're playing a game which has four different levels and first level is easy medium hard and extreme so you need to print that now what will you do you can also use if else if but it's a lot of code switch statement makes it a lot lot simpler and more readable so what we need to do is we need to type in switch okay first what we need to do is first we need to create a variable so a variable suppose let us name it level and level is 3 To create a switch statement you need to type in switch and enter the name of the variable that will be passed into the switch statement to check for the conditions level and it also begins with a curly bracket and inside the switch statement what you need to do is you need to type case that is the first case would be case 1 followed by a colon and the statement that you want to execute that is echo you are playing at easy level and since you want your program to stop here itself what you need to do is you need to type in break similarly for rest of the levels i'll just copy this code here two three and four and just make the changes And similar to if else statements, you also need to add another statement that would be default if any of the conditions are not met in the switch statement. Suppose the value of your variable is 20, which does not 
make any sense to the game then what you need to do is you need to display a default error message and that would be invalid input and you also need to end the switch statement with a curly braces and end the php program all right let us save it go to a browser and run you are playing at hard level i guess you must have understood the concept let us just one more time change the value of the variable to 20 save it go back invalid input so this is how the conditional statements in php work next what we're going to talk about is php loops now suppose you want to run a block of code or a part of code again and again and again or in other words in loop so php has that functionality known as php loops to do the same task now there are different types of php loops available that is while do while and for loops which we will be discussing in this part of the video now let us start with the while loop now the while loop loops through a block of code as long as the condition that you have entered or specified in the while loop is true so let me just remove it now to write a while loop what you need to do is type while followed by the condition and to write the condition what we need to first do is let us create a variable and well give it a value of 2 now the condition which we are going to write is this is just an example so if or while the value of variable is less than equals to 10 and then we follow along with the curly braces and type the code that we want to run again and again until the value of a variable becomes 10 or till the value of a variable is less than 10 suppose number then the variable that is where and that's about it now what we need to do is we need to increase the value of the variable else this code this code will run for an infinite amount of time and the system might crash so to increase the variable in each iteration what we need to do is we need to use the plus plus operator which will increase the value of the variable by one in each iteration now we're going to save the code and run it number two three four five six seven and so on let me just add a break here and you can see all of the numbers up until 10 are visible here and after 10 the loop just stops so let me explain it again so what we are doing is we are writing while along with the condition until then the code is supposed to be run again and again so the condition is if the value of the variable is less than or equals to 10 since a value of value of r variable is 2 the condition is true so the code inside of this while is executed and the code will display the value of the number 
and the variable value will increase with each iteration until it becomes greater than 10 and then the loop will exit. Now the do while loop is very very similar to the while one. The only difference being in case of a do while loop a code this this code will execute at least once. I'll show you how it works. So in case of do while we start with do curly braces let us use this same example and after the curly braces what we do is we write while along with the condition that is equals to 10 let me just okay now let me tell you why do we need do while loop suppose the value of a variable is 11 now since the condition did does not meet in case of the while loop it will not even run once now suppose you want to display the current value of the variables whether or not if it meets a condition at least once so in case of do while it will first go into this do loop run the code and then after the do loop is complete this part of the code is complete it will go on to the while part and check the condition now if the condition does not meet the loop will end here and if it meets it will continue until the condition does not meet the while part so it will run at least once now save this and go back to a browser and reload this program and as you can see number 11 is visible here so do while is helpful in some cases which you'll realize as long as you start coding more and more now next up is for loop now for loop is used when we already know how many times we want the loop to run so for loop is used when you want to run a piece of code a specific number of times now let me show you how it works now the for loop is written in three parts here we don't need to define a variable beforehand the first part of the for loop is defining the value of the variable so variable is equals to let us value it at one now we want to make it run till suppose six values so what we need to do is we need to write the condition in the second part of the for loop if variable less than equals to six and in the third part will be the incremental part so as you can notice in while and do while we put the incremental part inside the block of the code here the incremental part is inside the for function itself variable plus plus and then we start with the curly braces and we write the code similar to I'll just copy it from here and now let us just save it and print to show you how it works number one two three four five and six now these loops are a very important aspect of programming and you all should try out different problems based on loops by yourself now next up in php is php functions 
now functions are a very very useful and very important part of programming in any language now, functions are of two types built-in functions and user-defined functions now built-in functions are the functions that are already present inside the framework of your programming language a very popular example of a function built-in function of php is echo echo is a function that is already built in php and is used to print out variables strings and values on the screen now user defined functions are functions you create yourself to use a code repeatedly in your program so i'll explain you with while writing the code itself so suppose you want to use this for code four or five times in your program so or even more maybe 10 20 30 40 100 times in your program if you're writing a very very large program you want to print or use this part of the code 100 times in your program what do you do do you write this entire code or copy paste this entire code again and again 100 times and make your code lengthier or do you just want to use this piece of code from here from anywhere in your program now to do that we need to put this piece of code inside a user defined function so how do we do that we do that by writing function followed by suppose you want to call this function a name name and start with curly braces now this is a user defined function named name now inside this name function is a piece of code this for now how do we reuse it i'll show you in a second so suppose you are a long way from your code from this code you don't even know where it is you want to use this code again after writing hundreds of lines of code so how do you do it you just type the name of the function that is name and close it that's about it this is called calling a function so it is similar to calling a friend for help so here you just call your friend name to execute this part of the code here save and well there are no changes since the output will be the same let us make some changes add another echo i am going to run it again later and call this function again save it and as you can see once the function is called the output is printed and i'm going to run it again later and then again the function is called and it uses the same piece of code again and again and again see how simple coding can be when you know what to use when now let's move ahead and understand the concepts of oops in php so as you can see on the screen i have listed down the eight concepts of oops that we will be discussing today first is class next comes objects then it's member functions and member variables then constructor and destructor inheritance and finally it is polymorphism now let's walk through each of the concepts one by one first is class it is a blueprint of an object that provides initial values for the state a class consists of both data and functions and data and functions together are called objects now let's first have a look at the class 
let me create a file named class.php and let us write the code first Here I have defined a class by using the class keyword followed by fruit which is the class name. Next I have added a pair of curly braces and added the entire properties and methods within the braces. So as you can see on the screen we have declared a class named fruit that contains two properties called name and color. Along with that I have also added two methods set name and get name. Now, now the purpose of these methods is for setting and getting the name property. So let me give you some in important information. So when you define a class, a variable in it is called property while a function is known as method. Now let us execute the code and see the output. Let's go to the browser and type localhost slash followed by the file name. Here's a file class.php and as you can see on the screen the code is running perfectly. Now that was about the class. Next comes objects. So it is an instance of a class. Basically a variable holds the data of a class. Now we define a class once and create as many objects in it. So for a better understanding let me give you an example. Suppose a car is a class, so Mercedes-Benz and BMW would be objects. Now let's see objects. Classes are incomplete without objects. So we can add as many objects as we want from a class. And every single object has the properties and methods defined in the class. But those objects will have different property values. So objects of a class are created using the new keyword. Now let me open the code editor and let's create another file called obj.php. So this code will be the same. Let's copy and paste it here. Now let me type the code for object. As you can see, I have used the new keyword to create object of the class fruit. Similarly, banana would be another object.
and now we'll use the set name function to set the name to apple on this object on the apple object that we have created similarly we will set the name for the banana object there's an extra bracket here let's move it now moving forward let us type the code to display what we have added into the objects for this can you guess which method we'll be using yes the get name method will be used to display the name saved onto the object using the set name method now that our code is complete let us run and check if it's working correctly let me go back and refresh now here we have our object.php file yes the code runs perfectly the fruit program and it is displaying apple and banana from the two objects that we created i hope now you have clearly understood the concept moving on to the next one Let's talk about the member variable and member function. A member variable is defined within a class. The data can be accessed by the member functions alone. Now, once the object is built, these variables are called attributes of the object. Whereas member function is defined within a class and is used to access object data. So next comes constructor. So it allows an individual to allot an object's properties while the object creation while a destructor is a function that is called when the object stops working we will have a look at the constructor program so constructor allows an individual to allot an object's properties while the object creation now suppose you build a program using constructor function php will automatically call the construct function while creating an object from a class also remember that when you write the construct function always prefix it with two underscores now let's have a look at the example where we will be using a constructor function with calling the set name method now this set name function is often used when you assign a value to the name attribute now let's open the code editor and create our constructor file will again create the two properties named name and color now we will create a constructor with two underscores and a construct keyword and i'll give the two properties as the attributes to the constructor now in this program will be using the constructor function as the set method to set the names and color of a fruit by default during the object creation itself we still need to create the get functions
Now let's create an object to invoke the constructor. Now since the constructor has attributes, we will have to give the values for the attributes as well. So the fruit would be strawberry and the color would be pink. So this creates a new object and it gives the values to the constructor. in the php script and our html code as well let us save the code and check if it's working let's go back refresh now our constructor file is visible let's click on it and yes so when the object strawberry is created the attributes we have given to the constructor strawberry and the color pink were already assigned to it and it is displayed in the browser itself now that the constructor program is done next let's see an example of how a destructor works let's open the code editor create another file destructor.php now the destructor code will be very similar to the constructor one so we will copy the code into the destructor file and make some changes so let us remove this we don't need it and write our destructor function so destructor function is written similarly how constructor function is written so it starts with two underscores and a destruct keyword it does not have an attribute now why did we delete the get functions is because we will be using the destructor for it Also, we won't be needing this. Just the object creation is sufficient. Now let's save our program and do the drill again. Open the browser. Here our destructor file is visible and it shows the fruit is strawberry and the color is pink so when the object function is complete and the program ends the destructor function is called which displays the strawberry and the color pink now comes inheritance so it derives new classes or child classes from the parent class however inheritance can have its own properties and methods too so inheritance has two classes first is parent class and the other one is a child class now let's talk about each of them in detail so parent class is otherwise called a base class that is inherited from another class and a child class is a subclass that inherits from another class a child class can have subclasses and derived classes now let's have a look at the inheritance program so the child class is derived from 
all the properties and methods from the subclass. In addition, it can have its own properties and methods too. So an inherited class is defined by using the extends keyword. Let's look at an example. Let's open the code editor. So I've taken the liberty to create the inheritance.php file and write some of the code that we have already written. So I'll be writing only the code that is necessary for the inheritance part. Now also remember when you derive a child class from a parent class only the public methods are derived into the child class. So we will be creating the methods as public in order them to be inherited. Made this function public let's end this class and create another class in order to inherit this class so we'll name another class as cherry extends fruit and we'll create another function for cherry so this function is exclusive to cherry So we have given a message through this method. Now let's create an object cherry new cherry and give the values for the attributes of this constructor. Let's save the code and check if it's working. Well, there seems to be an error. Now let's try to resolve it. Okay, got it. So we created the object within the cherry class so it got localized what we need to do is put that code outside of the cherry class and it should work fine now yes so is cherry a fruit or a berry a cherry is a fruit and the color of the fruit is red and now we will talk about the last concept that is polymorphism so polymorphism has many forms the same function is utilized for different purposes. It has a class with a variety of functions simultaneously sharing a common interface. So inherited methods are overridden by redefining the methods in the derived class. 
Now let me write the code to make it clear. So I've already created the polymorphism PHP file. I've copied the inheritance code into the polymorphism part. And then now we'll make the changes into the derived class that is cherry. So let's create a property named weight. Now to override the constructor and the intro function from the fruit class, we will have to create the same functions in the derived class also. Now this function construct has got one extra attribute in comparison to this function construct. Let's create the intro function too. Now a code is ready. Let us create another object to invoke the functions. Now, did you notice what we did here? So, when we created the object cherry for, for the cherry class, we gave three attribute values instead of two in order to invoke this construct function, uh, not this. Let us run it and check. So it runs perfectly. It displays the fruit, the color and the weight. In this video, we will discuss some PHP extensions that can be and should be added in Visual Studio Code to make PHP programming a little easier and a life a little simpler. Now to check the extensions available or search any of them, we need to go to this tab that is the extensions tab. Now these are the already installed extensions on our system. And from here you can search extensions available in the Visual Studio Code Marketplace. Now the first extension and a must have extension is PHP 
intellifans now to understand what it does let me go back to the explorer and open a test.php so what i'm going to do is write some basic php built in functions let us say php info so what you need to notice is when you type php info it shows a suggestion it is from the built-in feature that is already installed into the visual studio code but when you click on this that's it now i'll show you the difference go back to extensions and install php intellifence now go back to your test file and again type php info now as you can notice you can see two php infos here now when you click on this one you can see all the details about this function available right here so this is what php intellifence is it intelligently suggests and autofills parts of your code to make your programming simpler and much easier now moving on to a second extension a second extension will be php mess detector now what php mess detector does is it analyzes your php code on every save now there's no additional setup required if php is already installed on your system which already is so to see what it does let us install it now before that let us go back to test.php and let me just open this now here you can see the output of your code so if you go back to php mess detector install it and go back to your code you can see php mess detector is visible here and after everything that you write it analyzes your code after every save and it is pretty useful while writing big and complex php codes now let's move on to the next extension which would be php auto close stack now what php auto close tag as the name suggests does is when you open a tag when you whenever you write a tag that is suppose html or body etc etc anything that you write it will automatically close the tag and you can simply start writing the code so this extension has saved me a lot of time finding what problem is in my code fixing the bug when actually it was just that i did not close the tag so suppose i write html and as you can see it automatically closes the tag and you can simply start writing the code now moving on to a next tag that would be php fmt that is php formatter now what it does is it formats your code with proper indentation and well your code looks much more readable after this so let me just show you i've already created a test2.php let me just close this so as you can see this code is not indented at all and one might have trouble understanding what is going on and what part of code is under what loops and statements so we go back to our extension php formatter install it go back to test one sorry test two now when you right click 
after installing this extension you can see format document section available then when you click on it the code gets automatically indented and looks much more readable now so as you may notice all these codes under comes under this if conditions and rest, rest of the code looks much more readable now now the last extension that i'm going to discuss is php debug now this extension you may not use it on a very regular basis but this extension is very helpful when you want to debug your code and see what's wrong with it all the instructions on how to use this extension are written alongside it and how to install how to use how to install extra software in order to completely utilize its potential since this extension is a debug adapter between visual studio code and xdebug website that was developed by derek rithans so i'm going to install it and this is the very website xdebug where any of your code is debugged so these are some of the extensions that you need to begin or ease your journey into php there are a lot more extensions available for php and you can explore more into them as you move forward we will look at php in get and post so all of us know that php is a scripting language for creating web pages but what is get and post there are two ways the browser client can send information to the web server the get method and the post method let's understand get method in detail first the get method sends the encoded user information appended to the page request the page and the encoded information are separated by the question mark character now let's know more about the get method the get method produces a long string that appears in your server logs in the browser's location box it is restricted to send up to 1024 characters only also never use the get method if you have a password or other sensitive information to be sent to the server since it will show in the browser's location box next the get can't be used to send binary data like images or word documents to the server also the data sent by get method can be accessed using the query string environment variable Now let us try writing a code to understand the get method better.
so as you can see we have got the output but if you look at the link it has an ampersand symbol along with the username and age we entered now before the browser sends the information it encodes it using a scheme called url encoding in this scheme name value pairs are joined with equal sign and different pairs are separated by the ampersand also as we discussed earlier the page request and the encoded information is separated by a question mark sign so that was all about the get method moving on to the next one let's have a look at the post method now the post method transfers information via http headers the information is encoded as described in the get method and put into a header called query string the post method does not have any restrictions on data size to be sent the post method can be used to send ascii as well as binary data and the data sent by post method goes through http header so security depends on http protocol used by using secure http you can make sure that your information is secure now let's have a look at the code now
Now you must be wondering if both the methods give the same output. So what is the difference between them? Well, the major difference between POST and GET method is that GET method carries request parameters appended in URL string. As you can see here, the parameters are visible in the URL. While POST carries request parameters in message body, which makes it more secure way of transferring data from client to the destination. As you can see, there is no information in the URL. Now, a lot of people have raised a request to create a code on the request method too. So let me tell you, the request variable can be used to get the result from form data sent with both the get and post methods. Let us try out a code for the request method too. As you can see, we have got the output. Today, we will learn how to link MySQL database to your HTML code with the help of PHP. Now, to do that, we will build a simple registration form whose data will be uploaded to the MySQL database. And in this tutorial, you will learn how to create that database, how to link it to your web page, and also how to delete the tables or entries from the database. Now, before proceeding, I am expecting that you guys have some basic understanding of HTML, PHP and MySQL. So without further ado, let's get started. Also guys, for this tutorial, we'll be working on XAMPP and Visual Studio Code. Now let's get started. So first, we'll open the C drive, XAMPP folder, htdocs and let us create a folder let's name it tutorial and 
open the Visual Studio code and start writing the code for our registration page. Let's create a file and name it index.php. Let's give the title as registration form and close the head. Now let's give some heading to a registration page. Now to make it a little more interesting, let us suppose the registration page is for a blood donation camp. So we will name our heading as the blood donation camp and close it now let's give some background color to the page now to give some background color we need to first know the code for it let's search for color codes Well, I like the saffron one. Let's copy the code, paste it here. Mm, write div, a heading for the page registration form. Now, as you can notice, I wrote this heading as H1 and this one as H2, since this will be a little smaller from the first one. Let's close the div. And write a form. Now, in this action part, write connect.php and this is the file which we will be creating later in order to connect our registration page to the database and method as post Let's name it user. So the first entry would be name. Input type would be text. And we have to give every entry a name in order to use it in the PHP code to connect to a database.
let's give this name name now what i did here is i put the required keyword here which would make it compulsory in to fill this section of the form in order to continue I'm giving these break lines to not make the form clumsy. For email, so naturally this would be the label for email. And let me skip ahead with this section. So I have written the code for the different fields that we are going to have in a registration page so the first one was name second email third would be the phone number and fourth obviously the blood group of the person registering as you can notice i have given necessary type for different fields so for email i have given the type as email for blood group text and phone as text in case someone wants to enter the entire phone number with the country code so now let us create an input button that would be submit and name let us keep it submit id would be Submit. Let's close our form and close the web page too. Now let's save it and check if it's working correctly. Now let's open the browser. Before that, first we need to open the SAM control panel and start our apache server and mysql server and now let us go to the local host type a folder name that is tutorial and open the form well this seems to be a problem the other fields are not visible let's open a code and see what did we do wrong yeah well there's a spelling mistake here and since I copy pasted the code, the mistake got copy pasted too. Well, let's save it again and check if it's working correctly. Yes, perfect. Now, before moving on to creating our connect.php file, we first need to create our database itself. So, first we need to go to XAM control panel and click on admin now this will open the php my admin section where we will go to new and create our database okay, let us name our database as test1 let us give it five fields and name it users First field would be ID and it would be auto implemented. Second, we will name it as name 250 email. This will also be worker. Third one would be phone variable characters since people can enter the plus sign to enter the country codes and finally we will have our blood group and let's create our table here Well, as you can see this is the structure of the table and the table is created 
Now, when you click on browse, it will show you the data in this table itself. Since we haven't entered any data yet, it is blank. Now, let's open a code editor and create a file connect.php and let's get started. Now here we will have to enter the name we gave to a submit button and that would be submit. Now we will create a variable to create a connection and we will be using the mysqli underscore connect function to do that. Here we will have to enter the name of the server since we we'll, our server is the locally hosted server. So we will have to type localhost. Now the type of user that would be root. Now the third part is for the password. Since we don't have a password for our database, it would be blank. And the fourth would be the name of our database that is test1. Now we will also check if connection is not complete. We will have to display an error connection failed. Now in this if condition, we will check if the entries in the fields of the registration form are null or not. We will have to do the same for the second. Second one was I'm sorry, I did not enter the yeah email. A third entry was phone, and a fourth and final entry would be. the blood group I think we're done here and now we will have to create variables to pick data from the registration fields in a registration page now this post will be picking data what we'll be entering here now here we will have to enter the name we have given here so for the name field we have given the name as name itself so we'll be writing it here now let's Copy this code and make the changes. This would be email. Let us also name it email. This would be 
فون This would also be phone, and last one would be blood group. Now, I am naming the these variables same as the name I've given because naming everything differently would just create confusion in your code. Now let us enter these details into our database now insert into sql command now this would be the table name users name email phone and blood group now we will have to send the respective values that would be the variables that we just created so first would be name second would be email phone Blood group. Now that we have entered the data into the database, let's create a query. Connect it. With a command. and give a message if it's successful or not entry successful else error Occurred. Let us close our PHP script here and save the code and let's see if it's working. So let's go back to a registration form and give some details to it so let us name sam sam at the rate mail.com phone would be one two three four five six seven eight and the blood group can be o positive well there's some error that we've experienced on line four okay let's see Yeah, we did not close this. Okay, let's save it and try again. Another error on line 12. What do we have here now? Okay, so this is my SQL I, not my SQL. Save resend the form and entry successful now if the entry is successful you need to go to your database which i've shown to you earlier go to the table users and we can see the details present here sam sam at the rate mail.com the phone number and the blood group so now that we know how to create a database link our database to our html form and see the details into the database entered we can also delete these details from this php my admin section itself so as you can see to delete this field i just have to click on this delete button okay and the field is gone also if you want to delete this users 
go to your database click on users and click on drop what it will do is it will drop the entire table and if you want to delete your database itself click on this database icon and click on drop the database now this will remove the entire database and all the tables associated with it now let's enter one more detail set of details to double check it let us give it mac mac at the rate mail.com that would be one two three four five six seven eight nine and the blood group would be a positive and the entry is successful so to check it we need to go to a database our table users and there we have it math math at the rate mail.com and the rest of the details today we are discussing everything about CRUD operators in PHP. Let's begin with the definition first. CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update and Delete. These are the four fundamental functions of persistent storage. These operators are used in creating user interface conventions that help us to view, search and modify data via computer-based forms and reports. Basically, the data is read, built, updated, and deleted. Moving forward, let me talk about the purpose of these operations one by one with the help of demo codes. But first things first, let's create a database. To do that, open XAMPP control panel and start Apache and MySQL. Now let's quickly open our web browser. Open the local host and go to PHP MyAdmin section. Now let's create a new database and name it MyDB. Let's name the table users and we will have six fields in it. The first would be ID. It would be integer and auto incremented since it would be the primary key. The second would be first name type where care. Let's give it 250. The third would be last name variable character. Similarly, Next would be an email. Password. And finally, gender. So now that a table has been created, let's move on to the coding part. Now first we are going to create a, a file named config.php to configure the database. Now we will create variables and I will explain the use to you later now this is the default username for a local host now the default password for a database is empty since there is no password in a database and the database name would be my db that's what we have named our database now let's quickly create the connection using con variable my sqli command
server name username password and the database name now this will create a connection for our database and now let's also check for errors while creating the database now if an error is found while connecting to the database it will show a message as connection failed now let's end the file and move on to understanding the different CRUD operations. Now first comes create. So let us also create a new file and name it create.php. Now the create procedure adds the insert statement to create a new record. Now let's write the code for this. Now what this line will do is it will act as a link between the configuration.php file and this create.php to connect to the database. Now we are checking if the submit button on the form is pressed now when the submit button on the form will be pressed the fields are required to be sent to the database so for that we first need to create different variables Similarly, last name now these are the names that we have given to the different sections in the table of our database password was password and finally gender Now let's write the SQL query insert into the name of the table that is users and now we need to name the fields we are going to be entering the details into. Since id is auto implemented we are going to be starting with first name similarly last name email password and lastly gender now these are the fields we are going to be entering data into now the values would be the variables that we just created which are getting the data from the form using the post function into the variables so 
first name similarly last name email password and gender so the code to enter the values into the database is complete now let's also execute the query Do that, we will send the query using the connect and put the attribute as SQL fields. Now if the records are created, it will display a successful message. Else, in case of an error, it will show a error message. Now let's close the connection using the close function and move on to creating our HTML form. Now let's give a heading here. Now this since this is a registration page, let's give the heading as a sign up form and create the form. Let's leave the action field as blank and method would be since we're using post, the method would be post. Now I'll just skip ahead with this form part. Now as you can see I have completed the code for the registration form which will include the first name, last name, password and gender. Now let's save it and move on to the next part that is the view procedure. Now the view procedure table records data based on the primary key noted within the input parameter. Now let's create another file named view.php for it and write its code. Now I will run the entire code in a single go and explain how these different card operations are working on the web page. Now let's write the query to get the data from the user's table. From users 
Now this will retrieve all the data into from the table. Also let us execute the query using connect query and pass SQL into it in the PHP script and write our HTML code. Title would be view page. Now I'm linking this page to a Bootstrap CSS document to make it look somewhat stylish. Since basic HTML page looks pretty boring. Now to do that, we are going to be using the reference and I have added the link for the CSS file now let's complete the rest of the page Heading to this division users Now this will also display the ID from a table. So we are going to be creating a different set of column to display the ID. Similarly, it will be the same for the rest of the fields so I'll just copy this code this will be for email, gender and editor email, gender and action Let's close it. Let's put it on the next time. Now this will check if there is data present in our database. Now if there is data, we are going to be fetching the same data.
similar codes will be written for the rest of the fields. So we will just let me just copy and paste and change the details. First name, last name, email, and gender. These are the codes for the edit and delete commands. Finally, let us close the web page. Now, let's quickly move on to the third part update file and write its code. Now, when the update button for the form is clicked, we need this code to process it. And similarly, for the rest of the fields, let's quickly change user ID. This would be ID, 
last name last name All of our variables are complete. Now let's write the query for the SQL. Update name of the table users and set. First name is equals to first name and similarly for the rest of the code. Now let's execute the query. Pass SQL to it. Again, if the record is a successful updation. Pass successful message and if any error has occurred, we will give an error message for it. Now, if id variable is set in the URL, we need we know that we need to edit a record. To do that, we will again write a code using get method Now we will write SQL command to get the data. And Execute a query. This is a very similar code to what we have written earlier. To fetch the data if the number of rows is greater than 0.
now what i am going to do is i am going to also skip ahead for the code for this update form now this is the code for the update form and now last but not the least we will create the file for delete and write a code very similar to how we have written the rest of the codes Let's write the SQL query, the same old routine. So, as you guess, I'm going to be skipping ahead with some of the part, some part of the code. Now, this is the code for our delete.php file. And now, we will save all these files and go to a browser and try to run, check if they run correct. Now, let's open the local host first and go to php my admin and open our users field here so as you can see i've already created a record here i'll create another one to show you how for that let's go to local host demo and go to create.php so second record let's name it map x simply learn b now the email would be map x at the rate simply learn b dot com password and submit new record created successfully now let's refresh it and as you can notice we have created another record here now let's go to localhost again and what was our next operation for crud it was c create r read that would be view.php now view.php displays both of the records that we have saved in our database now these number differences would be because i have created and deleted two more records before recording this part of the video now let's go to edit section of any of these record so as you may notice it opens the update php file user update form also the thing to notice is that it refers to the id that we are updating in the url itself now since we clicked on the edit part of the first field it is updating the first field itself now let's update it miss xxxxx abc at the rate xyz.com and update record updated successfully now let's check the record and yes the record is updated now since we are done with the two parts create read and even the third part update cru 
Now let's move on to the D that is delete. Let's go to the delete. For that, we would have to go to the view.php itself. Now, let us delete this second field. MacX simply learn B, MacX at the simply learn B.com. Delete. Now, you may notice the URL delete.php ID 4. Now, ID equals to 4 is deleted from the database. Let's check. And yes, the file from the database has been deleted. So this is how we perform our CRUD operations with the help of PHP and MySQL database. Today, we are going to have a video session on PHP form validation. So what does this actually mean? Okay, well, let me give you an example here. So when you try to create an account on Facebook or Instagram, you submit a form. And then that form is cross verified with the code written in the backend. So today we are going to do the same process in this video. Now we will have a look at two demos. Now in the first demo we will create a form and in the second one we will validate it. So let's get started with the first demo. But first things first, let's quickly open C drive, XAMPP folder, htdocs and Create a folder, let's name it validation and open our code editor here. And let's create a first file form.php. Now I'm going to write the code for the registration form. Now here what we are doing is we are creating the different variables for the form and we are setting it to empty values. Let me put that in a comment too.
Now as you can see the form will contain full name, email, number, comment, gender and age. Now for this demo the username, email and mobile number fields will be text input elements while the comment field will be a text area. Let's write the next rest of the Now we are defining the test input function which we are calling in the above if statement. Let's start creating the form and add the method to post. Action would be So I skipped ahead and created all the details required in the form. So the details would be full name, its input type would be text. Uh, just wait, yeah, it's okay now. Mm, second would be email, similarly number, age, comment. Now notice the comment would be a text area instead of a simple input type. Gender and a submit button now the form is complete we have to write another php script to display the details
I'll just skip ahead in this part too. So now that we can display all of the variables from the form, let's close the PHP script and also close our form. Now let me explain some parts of the code to you before we move on to the web page part. So here we have post. So this function is used at the time of form submission. Now during that time the form data is sent with method equals to post. Second would be the server section. Now this server PHP self is a global variable that returns the file name of the code. Now also HTML special characters function converts special characters to HTML entities. Now this prevents attackers from exploiting the code by injecting HTML or JavaScript codes. That is cross site referencing scripting attacks in forms. So now that we know what these functions do let us jump and see if our web page works okay. For that first open XAMPP control panel and start the Apache server. And now let's open the browser and type localhost followed by the folder name that would be validation and then a file name form.php. So yes the form looks good. Let's add some name to it email xyz.com number is optional but let's add some number to it age would be 20 comment would be hello welcome to simply learn gender would be male and let's click here yes so our input is visible and the form works perfectly now let's move on ahead with our second demo that is validating a form. Now we will be writing a code but with slight variations. Now the fields like full name, email address and websites will be added here and these three fields will show an error if an incorrect input is given. Now however the code is validated against the input and returns an alert message if an incorrect data is entered. Let's go to the code editor and create another file and let's name it validate.php and write another code for it. Now I've added some color for the error that will be shown into the form. Again, let us write comment for it, define variables and set to empty and a variables would be name ERR that is error similarly email ERR gender ERR and the rest of fields
Well, let's give the else command for it. Now, if no error found or the field entered is correct, the name will be displayed as we displayed the name in the form.php file. With the help of post name. Now, what we are going to do is now we will check if name only contains letters and white spaces. And this would be in ERR Now we will check if the email address is well formed or not. To do that, we will again use an if statement. think I have used EMI somewhere since it's showing here EMAI so let's check before it throws an error in a code there's email yeah Okay, we made a mistake here. So this else was not supposed to be closed here. Let's move it ahead. Yeah, I think this looks good. Let's write another code for 
another variable that is website and do the same thing again website Now we will check if the URL address syntax is valid or not. So let just be a single. Now we will write the test input function as we did in the form section. So let's just copy it from there since it's going to be the same. Now let's write the PHP script for the form validation section.
home method would be post action would be php script again I'll just skip ahead with this part of the program. So now that we have a complete form here, let's close it. As you can see, we have entered full name, email address, website comments, and gender parts to the form. Now let's write a final PHP script to display the details. Now since this will also be similar to the last part, we will just copy it from there and make the necessary changes. So what we don't have is full name. This would be just name, email. Now this would be a website. There's no number, it's deleted. There's a comment and there's a gender. Let's close the script and also close our web page. Now let's save the file, open a browser, and check if our web page is working correctly. Type localhost, the name of the folder, and the name of your file. Okay, so let's write something mac, mac xyz at the. Now let's not write something after it so that the email address would be wrong. Just to check, 123. C comment anything would do gender mail and let's click on submit so as you can see it shows enter a valid website URL and the email address is incorrect let us also check by writing an incorrect name that would be Mac one email address Mac XYZ at the rate and 123.c. Now it's showing the error for the name too. Okay, let's write something that is correct. Mac at the rate gmail.com. Website would be www.simplylearn.com. Comment could be anything mail and no errors here as you can see we have got the output in this video we will learn how to create a registration page using php html some css and xamp software then we will use that data and store it in a mysql database so let us begin and start writing our code first now to do that, we need to go to my computer, C drive, now XAMPP folder. This is the folder where the, our XAMPP software is installed. Here, locate to htdocs and let us now create a folder for our tutorial and name it tutorial. Now we'll open this folder in Visual Studio Code. 
and start writing a program. So let us create a first file here and name it register.html. Now this will be the HTML file. That is the whole structure of how a registration page will look. Now registration page. Now this will be the title of our web page. I think that's enough. Now let us move on to the body of the page. Now I'm going to write register in an h1 font for the heading and now we'll create a form action would be the name register.php and method would be post Okay, so the first label that I'm going to create will be for the username. So in a registration form, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm just going to include three categories that would be username, password, and a third one would be email. So to create the label for username, so you always have to keep in mind whatever name you're giving here or in the database, whichever you write first, since the name has to match. So I'm giving username, the name username, and that's it for a label. Now let us create another label for, now before that. input type for this will be text name as we have already written will be username placeholder with display username and I'm going to put this field as required which means that the user cannot leave this field empty second one would be label for password Now I am going to give its input type as password and you'll know the reason later. You can also give input type for the password as text but it will not be secure then.
password id will be password and this is also a required field now let us move on to the label for our last section that will be email and give it input type email yes and email can be set as an input type name email placeholder will display email and you guessed it right this is also a required field i think this is it for the registration html now we move on to creating our css page in order for this html structure to look good well wait a second i left up of a pretty important section of the registration form that is the register button itself so let me just no not form let me just create the registration for registration button it will be of type submit and value displayed would be register now we'll move on to creating the css file and let us create a new file and name it style.css so the code for style.css is already prepared so instead of writing the entire code line by line i'm just going to paste it and you can see how it works so this is the css code that will make a registration form look a little better so i have created different sections for different sections of the registration form so this will be the registration form input button this is for the color of the submit button and the rest of the form as you can see now in order for this style.css file to work we need to link this file style.css to register.html now how do we do that we go on to the register.html back and we add just one extra line in the head of the program so here what we are doing is we are referencing a style.css page into this page itself now that's it now both of these pages that we've just created are linked to each other and now at least a registration form structure is complete it does not work yet but it will soon now before creating the register.php code let us first create our database so that we have some understanding of what is going on around everything so to create a database what we need to do is open xaml start the apache and mysql server now go to your browser and open the localhost php my admin now create a new database 
let us name it form click on create now let us name our table as users number of columns would be four the first column will be id which will be auto incremented second will be username make sure to use the same name that we've used in the code so that the code does not malfunction it will be of type variable character password will also be a variable character email and now so as you can see this is the structure of our table of a database form now let us move on to finally writing the rest of the code for our registration form so now that we have a database complete let us move on to a back to our code and create the register.php file now the first thing that we need to do while creating the php code is we need to connect our code with our database that we just created so this is why i stopped in between and created a database so that you need you understand better how this code is functioning Now database host, since we are using XAMPP to locally host a server, this will be localhost. Our user will be the root user. since we have not set any password on the database it will be empty and finally the name of a database what did we name a database it was form now i will create a variable con to connect to connect a database with our code So we have created host, user, password, and finally name. Now we have got to add an error message which will check if the database is connected or not. So will be error connecting to the database
Now let us add some code to check if any variable is empty or not. Now, if any of the field is left empty while filling the registration form, it will display the following message, empty field. Now, let us add another if code and check. So now that we have added validation into our code, now what we need to do next is check whether the username or the details that have entered that the user has entered into the registration form already exists or not. And if it does, display an error message and if the details are new, enter the details into our database. Now to do that, let us write another if statement. Now here I am writing an SQL command which will select ID password from users that is the name of a table where username and here we are going to check if the username entered still exists or not.
Now, if the number of rows is greater than zero, which means username already exists, so we need to display an error message that would be username already exists. Try again. And if it does not, now in this else part, we will be writing the code for to send our data into the database. Now here, instead of selecting, we are going to insert the data into users, which is a table. And the fields will be username, password, email, and that's it. Now the password variable is going to fetch the details of the password field. And email add another statement to execute and display another message now since we have enter our data into the database we need to display a following message too this would do no this will display an error message in case something goes wrong and now since we have completed this part of the code let us end our statement
close the connection with the database here and end our PHP script. So now that our code is complete, now let us run the code and check if it works fine. So our Apache server is running. Let's go back to a browser. Open the local host name of the folder. So as you can see, register pages are visible here. Register.html and create a user Tony at the rate Aaron Fan. You have successfully registered and you can now log in. So let us now check if it's visible in our database. So our database is forms, users, and as you can see, the file that we just created, Tony, is visible here in our database along with the email and one thing that you may notice is that the password is not visible here. Since we use the hash protection for passwords, so passwords will not even be visible to the database admins. So this is how you create a registration form with the help of HTML, PHP, XAMPP and MySQL database. In this tutorial, we'll create a simple login system using PHP and MySQL. Now, this tutorial is comprised of two parts. In the first part, we'll create a login form and in the second part, we'll create a local form. Also, we will show you how to create a database in order to access the login web page as well. Now, first things first, let us quickly go to C, XAM, HTDocs and create a folder. Let's name it demo and quickly open our Visual Studio code. Now, for this tutorial, we'll be creating a set of files for different functions. Now there will be six in total. Let us first create these files and we'll write the code later. Now the first file would be index.php. Now this is the file that will be responsible for the login page where we'll enter our username and password to login. Now the second file would be login.php. Now this file will be responsible for how our login system will work. Similarly, there will be a logout file that will be responsible for how our logout function will work. Next would be home.php. Now this is the file for our home page when we log in into our account. Next would be a file to link our web page to the database. That would be database connection.php. And finally, we'll add a CSS file to make the page look better. Now let's get on to writing our code. First, let's begin with index.php. Now in this page, we will create the login page. Let's add the title as login. Now here I'm going to link this page to the CSS file that we're going to write later. Now in this reference, we'll refer it to the style.css file we created let's create a form now since login.php is responsible for how our login page will work we will link this index.php to login.php method would be post let us add a heading login now this part of the code will be checking for error and displaying error if something wrong happens. Now we will add our username and password fields. Let's add another label for password. Input type would also be password. Now let us add the login button. It would say login and our form here now our index.php code is complete now let's move on to login.php and 
write its code now what we are going to do is we are going to connect this page with the database page now here we will be validating the data entered in the form let us create a variable for username and password make sure you're not making any spelling mistakes otherwise you will run into errors now what this code is doing is it's checking if there's an entry in the username and password field and if it is empty it will display the message as username is required similarly what we're going to do is we are going to create an else if that would check if the password field is empty and display an error message in a similar way now that is set up let's import our data from our database now we have not created the database yet but we'll write the sql query and we'll create a database later now what i'm going to do is i'm going to name my table as users so here i'm writing select star from users where username would be the value we passed and similarly password could also be the value that we passed now this is where if the password and username match with what we have in a database it will display a message as logged in now we are going to create a session that would be a login session now id will also be a field in a database that would be auto incremented and work as the primary key okay if function is complete time to write the else part now the else part would be if the username or password you have entered does not match with the one we have in a database so it would display incorrect username or password as the error message location will be same index.php so now we have our login.php file also complete now let's get on to our home.php file and quickly write the code for it we will start the session now this would be our home page let us also link it to the css file tile.css now with this php script we will display the username of the person that's logged in so suppose my username would be mac so it would display hello mac we will very soon see the practical demo for it too now we will link this home page with the logout session that is logout.php and end this okay so home.php is also complete so next would be to work on the logout part now this is a very small code since it is only working to in any session that has been created now first unset the session and then destroy it now can you guess the location it would be index.php now see this is all the code for the logout file now finally we will move on to database connection file where we will connect our entire web page these entire four files to the database so we are going to create variables for let us name it since we have already used u name or username now this is the name for the server and since we are hosting a server locally it is localhost now the next variable would be for the name of the okay let us let us change the spelling this would be name of the default database 
password would be blank since by default there is no password and this is the name of the database that we are going to keep now let us keep the name of our database as test underscore database now we'll pass the variables that we just created now we will check if the connection that we have created is working or not and if not we will display a message as connection failed now all of our files are complete the only thing left is style.css now since style.css is only for the looks of the of the web page and is not a very necessary file for our login function i will just copy paste the code that i have already written and let us now move on to creating our database now to do that first open xamp control panel and go to your browser and type okay localhost go to php my admin and click on new database now the name that we wrote for the database in our code was test underscore db so we will have to name it the same here too database has been created the table name would be users number of columns would be three the first column would be for the id and it will be auto incremented now id will act as also the primary key for this table second would be user name 100 would be okay and the third would be password now as you can see our table users has been created with id username and password now let us open our login page now this is our login page so to log in we first need some credentials in the database now we don't have that kind of time to go on and create a registration page for it too so let us just manually add one or two records into the database from here php my admin itself so now what we are going to do is we are going to this insert section and under the username let us type mac and password would be one two three four five so let's go back to browse and as you can see we have our credentials here mac password is one two three four five so let's add just one other simply learn its password would be a b c d e and yes so we have both of our credentials now now let's go to the login page and try to log in with the credentials that we just created so okay let us first enter a wrong password to check if our error messages are working correctly yes absolutely so it's showing incorrect username or password since the password i entered was incorrect now let us leave this username blank enter some random password so it is showing username is required so our program is working perfectly now let's enter the correct credentials and yes so this is our home page and it is showing hello with the username that have logged in mac and now we have got that logout button which will end this session and take us back to the login page now let's try to log into our second account and hello simply learn we will learn what is rest api with php now let's get started now suppose you want to create a weather app for weather forecast in your area now to do that you have to set up a supercomputer and a satellite to monitor the real time weather but i wish everyone could be that rich now for those who cannot afford the setup you can get the same information from an existing web service using an api now an API acts as a medium between a web service and your application, which helps you communicate your request with the service and get a response. So, in this video, we'll be learning about what is REST API, principles of REST API, how does a REST API work, and finally, creating a sample REST API with the help of PHP. Now, let's move on and see what exactly is REST API. API stands for Application Programming Interface. 
Now, API is a set of protocols which acts as a medium of communication between programs. In other words, it is a way two programs talk to each other. Now let us understand this with an example. Suppose you, the client, go to a restaurant to eat. Now here the restaurant is supposed to be the server. How do you communicate your order to the kitchen? Here the waiter comes in the picture. Now here the waiter acts as a medium between you, the client, and restaurant, the server, to send your request to the kitchen and get food in return as per requested. This is exactly what an API does. So now that we have an understanding of API, let us look at what REST means in REST API. Now REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It is an architectural style which defines a set of protocols of how an API is written. Now, REST follows a set of principles for the design and development of an API. Now, it is a very efficient technology as REST takes less bandwidth over similar other technologies. So now that we know what REST API is, let us move on to understanding the principles on which a REST API is designed. Now, the first principle is client server. The second stateless third cacheable fourth uniform interface fifth layered system and sixth code on demand now let us understand these principles one by one client server a rest api design works on the concept that the client and server should be isolated from one another and develop independently this helps in increasing manageability across various platforms Stateless. Now, according to this principle, REST APIs should be stateless, which means calls can be made independent of one another. Also, every request sent from the client to the server must include all the info needed to comprehend the request. Cacheable. This principle states that a REST API should be able to hold cacheable data. The data in the response should be indirectly or directly categorized as cacheable or non-cacheable. Uniform interface. According to this principle, there should be a uniform interface across all devices and platforms for the interaction between application and server. Layered systems. Now REST API's architecture includes several layers that operate together to construct a hierarchy that helps generate a more scalable and flexible application. Now due to the REST API layered system, the application has better security as components in each layer cannot interact outside the subsequent layer. Moreover, it balances loads and offers shared caches for stimulating scalability. Now the last, code on demand. Now this is optional, but this principle allows for coding to be communicated through the API as executable code to the client to be used within the application. We now know on what principles an API is designed. Now let us see how an API work. Now REST API makes use of HTTP methods to implement various tasks based on the client request. So, the HTTP method uses CRUD to perform various operations on the server. CRUD here stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. Now, in case of HTTP methods, POST method is used to create, GET method to read data, PUT method to update it, and DELETE method to delete data. So, I hope you have some understanding of what REST APIs are principles on which they are designed and how do they work. Now, let us move on to creating a sample REST API with the help of PHP. So first, let us open the XAMPP control panel and start our Apache and MySQL servers. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to create a database for my API. 
let us name it API. And let us name the table as users. It will have four columns. First one would be ID, integer, and it will be auto incremented. The second, let us name it as name. Third would be age. And finally, email. Now, name would be a text, and email will also be a text. Let us quickly save this. And now we have a table for us. Now let us add some data into the table. So Mac age would be 21, email would be Mac at the rate xyz.com. Now let us create another entry. Name could be simply learn age 30 email simply learn at the rate xyz.com now as you can see we have added two rows with the data that we just entered now let us move on to the visual studio code and see xam htdocs and let us create a new folder let's name it api and open with visual studio code Let's create a new file. Let us name it tutorial.php. And now let us start writing our code. Now, first, what I'm going to do is I am going to connect my database with this code. Now, since the database is locally hosted, it will be local host root. Since there is no password, this field has to be empty. Now, what was the name of a database? That is API. That is what we have to enter here. Now this is a variable to get the response from the server or the database. Okay, there's something wrong. Now it seems like my Opening curly braces key is not working, so I had to open this on screen keyboard. We don't need you right now. Now let us create another variable named SQL. Now this is select this command will select all the data from our table users. Users.
again we are going to need the curly braces what I am doing here is I am creating a variable as a counter and I am going to give it a value of 0. Now let us create a while loop and in this while loop I am going to fetch the data and display it in JSON format. Now we are going to write the names of all the rows that we created in a table. Now I'm just going to copy paste it, otherwise we'll have to use this on screen keyboard again and again. Second one was name. Age and email. Now what I'm going to do is I will plus plus the counter now to display it is in, in JSON format we have to write JSON in code with the response error message and now let us end the code let us go and quickly save our code open our browser go to the local host api this is the folder that we created now as you can see our tutorial.php is visible here and when you click on it you can see the data from the database being extracted with the help of api in json format in this video on php web development we will learn how to create a website with the help of php we'll also be using html css bootstrap and mysql in this tutorial so get ready to create your very own website now before we get started with the step-by-step -step tutorial let me give you a glimpse of the website that i'll be building in this video so let me just quickly go to my browser and type in localhost followed by the name of the folder where I have created the website. So I'll be making a photo gallery website like this. 
So in case you're a photographer, you can build a similar website in order to showcase your talent. And if not, you can always create your own personal website for anything you're passionate about. So without any further delay, let's get right onto a tutorial. So first things first, let me show you the environment that we'll be working on while creating a website. So we are going to be needing two softwares that is Visual Studio Code that we'll be using as our ID, the code editor, and the second one would be XAMPP. Now XAMPP is a web server solution package which we generally use in order to manage a database and create a local web server. You can download it from these respective websites since I've already download, downloaded both of the softwares, so we'll be skipping that. Now let us begin. So after that you've installed both of these softwares, just go to your C drive, locate XAM folder, and inside the XAM folder look for htdocs. And inside this htdocs, name a folder. You can name it anything. I'll be naming it photo since I'm creating a website regarding photos and then right click inside this folder and click on open with code. So this opens up our Visual Studio code and as you can see our photo folder is visible here. Now also one thing that we need to do is go back to this photo folder right click and create two new folders first one would be css so it's considered a good practice even if you're using a single just a single css file it is considered a good practice to create a separate css folder inside your project folder also create another folder and name it images so this is where we'll be keep, keeping all the images for the website so let us go back to Visual Studio Code. So as you can see, both of these folders are now visible here. Now go on and click on new file. The first file that we are going to create is index.php. And inside this index.php, we'll be writing the code for the main page of a website. So let us start. First, click on an exclamation mark and as you can see a block of code already written is visible here now so you, we just need to add a few things first let us put the title the title would be of course photo gallery next up we need to add a few links to our web page in order for it to function well. So the first link would be this is a link to link this page to bootstrap you can also easily find it on the internet or you can just type in from here let me just go to the browser to check if this link is working yeah 
seems fine to me now we are going to add another link to it now this link will be for the link for a CSS file that we'll be creating later on since we'll be putting that CSS file inside a CSS folder I am going to link it to style.css so that's it we are done for the first part of a code now let's end this head section and move on to the body section of our web page so inside this body section what we first need is to add a few scripts for our page which will be responsible for the design of our web page so these are the three scripts that I'll be linking to our web page you can just look and write them as it is also keep these three scripts at the end of your body so any code that we'll be writing inside body will be above these three scripts now let's design the web page so the first thing that we'll be needing is a navigation bar in a web page so let us quickly go to the browser so instead of writing an entire big block of code we can just copy it from the internet so bootstrap provides you with many such designs so what we are going to do is we will type in navbar bootstrap and hit enter so as you can see just scroll down and as you can see this is the navigation bar which this code will display also there are different navigation bars according to your need along with the code so you can just copy any of the one you like I'm going to be copying this one click on copy go back to the code and just paste it so now what we have here is our navigation bar ready so let us go to the browser and check how does our web page look so after the local host what we're going to do is we will write the name of the folder in which we are writing our project which is photo well there seems to be some problem since this nav bar is lacking the css design let us go back to our code and see what went wrong well yes this css file that we linked here after css there is not a dot but a slash i think it should work fine now well the problem still persists let me go back and recheck well yeah i made some spelling error here this is bootstrap not botstrap and let us go back reload and yes as you can see our navigation bar is well and good let's go back and make some changes to our navigation bar the first change that i'm going to be making is i will change the color theme of the nav bar to dark not mark yeah go back reload and looks better now here photo gallery good 
also since i'll be using the drop down menu it is absolutely up to you if you want to use it or not since i'll be using it i'll just change the name to categories and the three category will be the first is nature photo photographs the second would be architecture and the third would be travel so let's go back refresh categories nature architecture and travel so this travel looks a little different from this nature and architecture so as you can notice this this line that is dividing this section to this section so let's go back so that line comes from this part of the code so we'll just copy and paste it here looks good now that we're back we don't need this disabled and the search bar so i'll be removing that particular part of the quotes and this form 2 go back to the browser refresh and all of the parts of the navigation bar that we don't need are now have now been removed also this link would be for about section of the web page and we will also add another section or another link that would redirect us to the contact part of the web page so to do that to add another link we will just copy this code and paste it and instead of about this will be contact go back refresh home contact about categories so this categories should come before these two so what we are going to do is we will just copy this section of the code and put it after the drop down menu right Now go back, refresh, well, we copied it instead of cutting it, so it's now visible twice, reload, home categories, contact and about, looks perfect. So you see now that's the beauty of building a website. You don't have to write the entire code by yourself. There are codes already written for all these kinds of stuff. This navigation bar, the carousel that I'm going to be using in the website, the blocks of photos that we are going to display on the web page, and a lot of design templates, you can call them, have already been written for you to use them instead of wasting your time and writing the entire long blocks of code now next up what i'm going to do is i'll just go back to our photo folder and inside this images i'll just copy the images that i've already downloaded copy go back images and paste it here so now that we have our photos inside the images folder let's go back to our code and write a carousel code or just copy it from the bootstrap go back to bootstrap here look for carousel so as you can see 
this is what a carousel looks like so a big photo in on the front of your web page as you already saw when i showed you the website these are the different types of carousels available on the bootstrap website you can use any of them so the first one is just a single photo second one is slides of photos third is slides of photos with this marking and the final one would be all of them combined with captions so of course we'll be using the final one so copy the code for the final carousel or whichever one you like and go back to your code and here after this navigation bar paste your carousel code click on save go back and refresh so since we haven't added any images here there are none visible but you can see this carousel has been added to our web page so let's go back and now we are going to add the images that we just pasted in this images folder so in this carousel code look for image src so this is the location of the image that will be displayed so type in images that is the name of the folder from where you will be picking up the images put a slash and let me just go back to this images architecture for yep so architecture for in this alt type in architecture and here is the heading so this is part of the caption of the carousel so i'll be writing architecture here and i'll make this heading a little bigger it's three i think h3 would do and i don't want to add any more descriptions if you do you can write all of that inside this paragraph but i won't be so i'll just remove it from here i'll do the similar with this so what we're going to do is we will write images slash and go back what image i'm going to be adding nature 4 would do nature 4 type in nature similar to what we did above h3 h3 remove this and now here the last one would be travel h3 h3 and let me just type in the travel 5 travel 5 and in this alt type travel and we are good to go okay let's reload and voila so our images are visible here with this beautiful carousel and you can forward them and well does this not look beautiful to you so architecture nature and travel but as you can see we have some problem here the images are way too big to fit on this part of the screen and it's going all the way down and this part of the carousel is not visible on the main page when someone opens the website which 
absolutely does not look good so what we're going to do for it now to fix this what we're going to do is we will go back to a code editor inside the CSS folder we will create the file that we linked at the start of our tutorial style.css and here just write this code margin zero adding also zero and box sizing would be border box so now to display the images on the just on the main page of a website what we're going to do is we will put a dot go back to the main index.php and from here copy this name of the class carousel item go back to style.css paste it here carousel item and type ing and inside this we will define the width and the height of the image so the width would be 100% and we are going to keep the height at 95 vh so that it does not go beyond the web page let us quickly save it go back reload and yes it looks great and it's also visible on our screen now now next up what we're going to do is we will be creating different sections on this very web page for the different categories that is nature architecture and travel so go back to the code under this carousel code let us start writing our first section that would be section class so i'll be using my4 and pi4 the first div So what we want is we want the text to be in the center of the page. So the class would be text center. And the first category is nature. Now the next thing that we need to do is we need to add the images to it. So how do we do that? Also, we are not to display a single image on a, on the entire web page. What we need is we need to display small three blocks of images in a row. So we need to create another div class and inside the class, we will define the column for large systems for the mid ones and for the mobile devices so after you have written this class after you written this div the images doesn't matter the size of the screen only three images will be displayed on a large and middle screen and a single image will be visible when open on a mobile phone so all in all your website would be very responsive to all the devices that you will be using let's just close it and inside this div what we are going to do is we will link our image and the image would be since this is nature 
let's use nature one which image we have already used in the carousel nature four so let's skip that and put the class as fluid and padding bottom padding would be three well i think it's done so this is the First section let's go to our page refresh so nature and our first image is also visible here so what we need is we need to display two more images in this row go back and it's now all copy and paste just not this part this part of code copy paste and paste so now nature 2 and nature 3 go back refresh okay there seems to be a problem here let us figure out why this is happening okay we forgot to add the row div and without the row div the images will not be displayed in a row but of this so container fluid i'm using this since just a second let me paste it here yeah and we will create another div named row and our entire code will go inside it and we'll paste it let's go back and check if it changes anything and it does so our images are displayed perfectly our first section that is nature for our category is complete now now next what we need to do is i think you guessed it we just need to copy this section and paste it twice since there are two more sections so after the first section in the second one would be for architecture the images we need to change architecture one architecture two and architecture 3 yeah refresh nature architecture and well nature again because we did not ed edit the third part of the code so the third part of the code will be for travel let us quickly add the images so travel to travel four and I think we use travel five already. So travel six and go back, refresh and travel images, architecture and nature. So half of our website is already done guys now what we need to do is we need to create two more sections for the contact and about so 
for the contact part of the web page we'll be needing a form that we will then go on and link to a database that we'll be creating later on and the about section will be responsible to give a uh, some information regarding the website regarding the photographer that have uploaded the images so let's go back to our code and move on to creating another section for the contact so wait let me just copy only this section of the code and of course we'll be needing a closing tag this will be contact us and let's create another div class would be fifty and m auto so why i'm doing this is because inside the contact we'll be creating a form where there will be columns and to manage the width and margin of these columns i am writing the class for it inside this div we will write a form inside the form the first thing that we need is action and the action for the form will be about dot php this is a file that we'll be creating later on and the next thing is method which will be post let's close this create another div class named form group okay form group close it inside this i'll write a label that would be name this will be our first column input type text of course let's give it a name so this is very important so the name that you're going to write here should be matching should be matching with the name in the database and class um, control now just copy this paste and paste so the second section would be for email type will also be email name will also be email third would be for the number let us keep the type text in case someone wants to enter the std quotes and let's go back refresh check contact us the fields are visible now what we need is a submit button so after this diff let me create a button type submit class so this will make the button look green adding some CSS and the button would be called submit go back refresh 
submit button is here now let us also create a section for the about part of the page and then we'll move on to making a database so to do that what we need to do is we'll just copy this section for the about paste it here close the section and here let's start writing the code the class container fluid so why are we using this container fluid class is because sometimes when you don't use this class the images or text from your web page tends to create so you can see a scroll bar here vertically it tends to create another scroll bar horizontally which we don't want so container fluid close this div inside it let me create a class text center it will say the name Mac we just give some space and write a paragraph with a class of course text center otherwise if the text will start from the extreme left it would look weird and close it let's add some bold and write let's see i am a passionate photographer interested in working architecture nature and travel photography next would be um, a full time freelancer with them experience of five years well i think this would do refresh oh we did not change this we'll just get right on to it contact us i'm a passionate photographer interested in working architecture nature travel photography freelancer and all of the things that we just did about Mac, we just need to change this to about, and I think we're done. Yes, so our web page is almost complete, guys. Now we need to do some changes or add some things. So, the first thing that we'll be adding is an about.php file and inside this about.php file we will be creating a connection with our database and fetching the data from it or sending the data from our form to the database so before that let's go back to the browser type in localhost followed by php my admin click enter but before that you must open XAM control panel and start the Apache server and MySQL server since I already did I did not show you the steps so after the MySQL server has been started you can see this PHP my admin panel 
and from here we can create databases so inside this php my admin click on new and let us name our database as photography click on create now what we are going to do is we will create a table where the data will be stored from our form let us name the table as users number of columns would be four the first column would be course id which will be auto incremented the second column would be name type variable character 250 third is email also variable character 250 and the final was a number variable character 250 and click on save so as you can see the structure of our table the table users has been created inside the database photography now we need to go back to our code and write the code php code to connect our form to this database so first variable that i'll be creating is con to connect the database since a server is locally hosted the name of the server would be localhost root that is the default now if connection so this if condition will check if the connection is successful or not and if successful display connection successful next also add if the connection is not successful we should always have an error message connection failed next what we need to do is we need to SQLI select underscore DB and inside this we need to mention the name of our database which is photography let's just go back and recheck photography because the name is very important if you mess with the name the entire code goes to win now let me create some variables which will fetch the data from the form in order to send them to the database so let's keep the same names so that we don't create any confusion email and of course number post so now that we have our variables we need to run a query so since we are fetching the data from the form and inserting it into a table we need to run a query for insert into the name of the table that is users and then name email number followed by the values that we'll be giving them so notice this is the 
name of the fields that you've given in your table and this uh, these values are these variables that we've just created so inside it name second would be email and third would be number i think the query is done now to check if it works we will run another query and i am going to add a header file here because once you click on submit button let me just go back so if you click on submit button here the page will redirect to a different page which will just display connection successful we don't need that we need to stay on this page itself so in order to do that i am writing this header file with the location of index.php enter and i think we are done here now let's go back and add some details mac mac at the rate simply learn.com number would be one two three four five six seven eight nine zero click on submit go back to your database click on browse and if the connection was, would be successful you can see the data here and we can mac email and number that's great so now let's move on to the final section of the website so how do we make this categories navbar work well it's pretty simple we just need to redirect to a section of a web page whenever clicked a button so when we click on nature we need our web page to be redirected to this section so let's just go back to our code and what we're going to be doing is we will create links just a second for every section of our web page so let's go back to the first section that is nature and here write give it an id so the id for this section would be nature close the tag cut and paste it here so as you can see this id this section of our web page is enclosed in this id so now with this a tag we can refer our this section of the web page to any button similarly we will add another id here so the id would be architecture of course make sure the spellings are correct put it after the section now go back a id this would be travel okay just a second Cut it, paste it here. Again, what I'm going to do is instead of writing it again and again, I'll just copy it from here, paste it. Since this is contact us, let me just put contact here 
contact here yeah. and the section right and this will be of course about yes good now what we need to do is we need to refer these sections with the respective ids to the buttons go back to the navbar code on your web page so here is a navbar code so inside it you can see after every button there's a reference you just need to add the name of your id do not remove this and architecture travel contact and about let's go back refresh click on categories okay what happened here okay no nature yep travel yep contact about so everything works perfectly now so while we're at it let me just okay let me first show you mm, rob rob at the rate start dot com one two three four five 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 click on submit so as you can see whenever you click on submit it redirects you to the front of the web page i don't want that yeah the database is working so just go back to the about.php and here we added the header location index.php so it is redirecting the code to the start of the web page what we need to do is we need to redirect it to a particular section that is contact so just add contact in front of it save go back scroll down tony tony at the rate stock industries.com click on submit and as you can see after you click on submit the page does not go back to the starting it just stays here while the data has been submitted to our database now that we have completed our website a quick question for you guys if you were asked to create a website based on your interests what would the website be about let us know in the comment section below now let me show you a glimpse of the website we'll be creating which is called techbad.com but you can obviously create a website for the product of your choice so let me just go to the browser type in localhost website and this is the website that we'll be creating this is a very basic website for e-commerce services but as you can see we have displayed the top products on the front page of a website and here from the drop down menu you can see laptops and phones so without wasting much time let's get started now before we begin let me tell you that we'll be using visual studio code as the ide our code editor and xamp as the web server solutions package which will be hosting a local server server for the website now another thing that we need to do before beginning is we need to go to a browser and type in bootstrap download go to this website and from here download the bootstrap file this will be a compressed file you can download it from here and i'll tell you later what we're going to do with it now let's go and set up a coding environment 
So let me just close this, go to C, XAMPP folder, locate htdocs folder in it and create any name for your project. I'll be writing website and inside this website what you're going to do is go to your downloads. Now this bootstrap folder that we just downloaded we are going to extract it. Inside that website folder. So let's just go back. So we need them outside. Delete this. So as you can see, we have got a CSS and JS folder and we'll be using this in a website. Now let us begin our code. So right click, open with code. Now this is our Visual Studio code and as you can see our website folder is visible here and from here we can create a new file. So our first file would be index.php. Now let's start our code. Type an exclamation mark and hit enter and you can see this block of code will be visible here. Now we need to add a few things. Well, not a few, quite a lot. First would be title. The title would be, well, since my website is tech by, I'm going to keep the title as tech by. Next, what we're going to do is we are going to add some links. To this index.php. So these are the links for the CSS files present inside this folder that we just downloaded from Bootstrap. And we'll be linking some of the files from this folder onto our website so that the website looks good. Yeah. Now the reference would be CSS. This is the folder and the file is bootstrap dot min dot CSS. So this is the first file that we're going to be linking. Next, let's add a script here. So this is a pretty popular script and you can find it on the internet easily. It checks. Well, yeah, this ends our script here. Let me just recheck if I type it correctly. Yeah, seems fine. Now moving on, we are going to be adding another script that would be JavaScript and it will include boots jQuery 
sorry bootstrap i'm just going to find it bootstrap dot men dot js yeah this ends a second script now let us just end this title and move on to the body part of the code now what do we need to produce or create first now the first thing that we need is a navigation bar so to create a navigation bar i'll give you a pretty easy way to do that instead of writing a hefty big code you need to go to your browser since we are using bootstrap why not take the best out of it now type in bootstrap navbar go to this link navbar bootstrap and as you can see this bootstrap this navbar can be accessed using this code just copy it go back and paste it in your body now we'll be making a few changes to a navigation bar according to our e-commerce website but before that we need to check if this navigation bar is visible correctly on the web page now to do that first let's open our zam control panel start our apache server and go to a browser now to see the result of your code to see if this code that you've just written is how does it look on a web page we need to type in localhost followed by the name of the folder that you created for your project since the name of my folder is website i've written website here click on enter and well our navigation bar looks a bit weird there's no designing to it now let me go back to the code and see what i did wrong well yeah we don't need this bootstrap reboot.min.css instead we need just bootstrap.min.css let's save it go back and reload well our navigation bar is visible let's go back to the code and start making some of our changes the first change that I'm going to be making is I will change the color theme of this navigation bar and yeah looks much better now let me remove some things first let's change the name to techbuy.com well second uh, let us let it be home so this is the drop down i'll be changing it to products the first product is laptop the second one phones we don't need this here and let me put the divider in between we don't need this disabled part either and neither do we need the search form now i want to make a few changes to the navigation bar so this navigation bar seems a little thin let me add just a little bit of breadth to it yep looks good and as you can see laptops phones and this dividing line now what we need to do is create a front page that is the top featured content on the front page that will be visible on our e-commerce website so to do that create a div class 
let us name it and this will be a column div inside this another div class this will be for the row and now just a second yes this will also need a class since we want our text in the center of the page and top products okay let me just add some spaces well before adding those images and the products onto a page we need to prepare a little bit more so before that let us just save this piece of code and see how does it look so it displays top products in the center of the page looks great now what we need to do before we can display the products on this page is we need to create a database in where we are going to store all the information regarding our products and we will fetch that data from the database and displayed on our website now to create the database just go back to the XAM control panel and start the mysql server 2 now here type in localhost php my admin and you can see you are now redirected to the php my admin control panel where you can create different databases so as you can see i've already created a database named techby under which i have got another table that is products with some data here now i'll show you how to create a database from scratch now to do that we need to go to this new part now since we already have a techby database let us name it something different e-commerce and create now we have created a database named e-commerce and inside the e-commerce what we need to do is we need to create a table let us create the table and name it products now our table with will mainly consist of around six or seven columns and let us keep it seven the first would be id of course and it will be auto incremented the second title of the product which will be a variable character 255 price of the product since prices can be in decimal let us keep this decimal and the values would be 10 comma 2 next is brand name this is variable character 100 would do image now this column here will contain the location of the image on our server or on a system since our system is the local server so this will also be a variable character 255 next would be description this will be a text since a description can be long and last would be featured
all right let us save this table and we have a products table here in our new database that is e-commerce now we need some images for this image file for our products now i've already downloaded some images let me just copy them now go back to a c drive xam now what we are going to do is we are going back to our website folder and we'll be creating a new folder inside the website folder and let us name it images and paste your images here let me go back to this visual studio code and as you can see our images are visible here we'll be using them very soon let us go back to this and let me add an entry here so we'll be working with one product and once you understand the concept you can add many more products later on so the title would be google pixel 5 the price 65000 brand name goes google image now to add the path of your image what you need to do is you need to go back here images now the path would be inside website and inside images folder so website images and then followed by the name of the image since the name for my google phone is g pixel i'll be writing g pixel dot png make sure you do not make a mistake while writing a name and in the description well i've copied some description from the internet i will be posting the same here google pixel 5 5g 8 gb ram 128 gb space now inside the featured part we'll be numbering it one and click on go so go back to browse and you can see your field that you just created visible here so now that we have the entry for our image for our product that is google pixel 5 phone in our database let us go back to the code to see how to retrieve this information from this database into our code and display it on our screen let's go back to our code and in our code let us go back to the top and here we are going to be creating a php script and inside that script i will be accessing the database now let us create a connection to the database using my sqli connect and inside this what we are going to do is we will be writing the name of loop the server since the server is localhost and then the next would be root now again my sql i now here select db database and inside this we'll be selecting a database from the my admin panel so what we need to do is we need to write the variable name followed by the name of the database that we need information from so our uh, the name of a database was e-commerce yep so e-commerce so here we have created a connection with the database now let us create another file sql so for this this variable will be accessing all the information stored in our table products so 
we'll be writing some sql commands select star that is all the details from name of our table products let me just recheck products yep and where featured is equals to one so remember that while creating a entry we put this featured value as one so this part of the code is done now let us go back down where we stop last and write our php script so here what we are going to do is we will be creating a while loop now inside the while loop we will create another variable as products which will be equals to my sqli and this function is used to fetch the data from the database and feature well there's something that we missed we did not create the variable featured here and well it would have given an error so what featured would do is featured would use the connection to query the sql command now go back here what this while loop will be doing is this while loop will be fetching the data from a table under the category of featured number one so next what we're going to do is next we will create another div class which would be inside this h4 another php script is equals to product now inside this we are since this will be the title we will be displaying the title from here so what we need to do is we need to add the title and close the php script here next we need to display the image so here in this image src we don't need to write the path of the image since we have already entered that into the database what we need to do is we need to specify the path from where we need to fetch the image from the database so it's pretty simple again the same thing product and as you would have guessed it it will be image was it image or images let me just recheck it was image close this close the file and here we have retrieved our image now
product inside this product what we are going to get is the price title so that if one would hover over here it will display the title of the product and that's it we need to close it So set okay. So yep, looks good. Next, we will display the price of the product to do that we will create a class let us name it l price close it rupees we are doing it again product and here we, what we need to do is we need to get the price and close this similarly whatever details that we need to display here from the database we are going to be accessing them through this script with changing the name of the column that we need to access so now that we have all this let us also create a reference page and i'll be creating another file details.php which will display the details of the product but before that let me create a button type button Class button success now the name of the button would be more and well this ends here also what we need to do is we need to let me just see what we need to do is we need to end this while loop and while here and just close it so this div and this div everything's good save let's go back and see if it's working and voila we have our first product displayed here on the front page of our e-commerce website google pixel 5 the phone the more button does not work yet but we'll be working on it but it feels good doesn't it now let us go back to the code and see how to create this details.php file First, 
details.php and inside this file what we're going to do is we are going to just copy paste some part of the code here and also this part of the code okay and we don't need it now we need one or two more things to be displayed here so just copy this paste it and paste it again let's go back to um, our local host and what we need to display here is so we have already displayed the title the price and the image so the things that we are left with is the description and the brand name so let's go back price is already here just add description and brand name was it brand name yep brand name description looks good change class name here okay so what we're going to do is we will be refreshing this page and clicking on more and well yes good the details of our product are visible here now let's go back and make a little changes so the first change would be this so this would be product details and save click and there's still a big gap yes looks better now let me just you can add some bold or italics or whatever you like in this code um, what did I do? What did I do? So I've added bold in the title. Let's see if it works. I'm not sure if it does. Okay, since it's already a heading, my bad. Uh, let me add it here okay save it so this is the price and yes price is in bold now so you can make a few changes to look make your description look better and let us go back to the main page and what we are going to do is we are going to create two new files for this laptops and phones to display them separately when we click on any of the drop down menu since they don't work yet now let me show you an example to create a file for this product laptops and you can create the rest yourself so first thing that we need to do is we need to go back to this database into a table and create another entry so the title would be asus rogue laptop price would be one lakh twenty thousand brand name asus image so the image is website images 
and the name of the image is robeasus.png robeasus.png and I've copied some description for the from the internet and now the one thing that you need to notice is we are going to be keeping this featured part as two instead of one and go back to browse and you can see the detail that we just created with the feature number two so now go back to our code and create another file let us name it product laptops dot php let me just see yep i have so yeah i may have skipped this part so in the drop down menu when we created a navigation bar here it was written this so we need to replace this reference with the name of the php file that we just created that is product dash laptops dot php so product dash laptops dot php and inside this first thing that we need to do is copy this code paste it here now here change it to two and drop down top products everything looks fine save it since the feature number will be two let us go back refresh click on laptops and here you can see the asus rogue laptop visible now let me add another product on our feature page that is the front page to show you how do we display more than one product with the same code so go back to this database and create another entry let's say hp laptop price would be 80000 okay i think i just created an entry let me delete it go back hp laptop price 80000 brand name hp image website images name of the image that is hp underscore laptop dot png hp underscore laptop dot png and the description which i have copied from the internet and in this feature we are going to be writing one since we are displaying this on the front page of our website go back to browse here are the details now let's get back we don't need to change anything just save it go back and refresh and as you can see we have our hp laptop visible here and similarly we can just re add products into a database and this single piece of code is enough to display them all on our web page so guys these are some of the basics of an e-commerce website you can add more products choices more detailed descriptions and add more designing using css bootstrap cards and buy sell sections on your website just play along with the code and start making your own web pages with companies generating enormous volumes of data every minute it has become really important to make sense of this data and draw business insights and very often this data is stored inside relational databases in the form of rows and columns. SQL or SQL is the language to communicate with databases. The history of SQL dates back to 1970 when Edgar Cord, a computer scientist working for IBM, wrote a paper that described a new system of organizing data in databases. SQL is used to create, maintain, 
manipulate and retrieve vast volumes of data present in relational databases such as MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle DB, and IBM DB2. SQL is in high demand because so many companies use it that includes big giants such as Amazon, Google, Oracle, and Microsoft as well as startups. The popularity of SQL has grown over the years and is one of the most sought-after skills by employers. SQL is everywhere. It plays a critical role in almost every kind of job, whether you are a software developer, data analyst, marketing analyst, product manager, or a data scientist, SQL will make your life easier and save your time. SQL still remains the top language for data work. It is easy to learn and does not require any prior coding knowledge. Using SQL commands, you can unlock the power of business intelligence tools like Tableau and answer any questions related to the data. It can also integrate with scripting languages such as Python and R. According to Glassdoor, the average salary of a SQL developer is $88,912 per annum in the United States. That's a lot of money. So what's stopping you from learning SQL? Join us in our full course journey to learn the basics and advanced concepts of SQL that will help you solve business problems and make critical decisions. What is a database? So according to Oracle, a database is an organized collection of structured information or data that is typically stored electronically in a computer system. A database is usually controlled by a database management system or DBMS. So it is a storage system that has a collection of data. Relational databases store data in the form of tables that can be easily retrieved, managed and updated. You can organize data into tables, rows, columns and index it to make it easier to find relevant information. Now talking about some of the popular databases, we have MySQL database, we also have Oracle database, then we have MongoDB which is a NoSQL database, next we have Microsoft SQL Server, Next, we have Apache Cassandra, which is a free and open source NoSQL database. And finally, we have PostgreSQL. Now, let's learn what is SQL. So SQL is a domain specific language to communicate with databases. SQL was initially developed by IBM. Most databases use structured query language or SQL for writing and querying data. SQL commands help you to store, process, analyze and manipulate databases. With this, Let's look at what a table is. So this is how a table in a database looks like. So here you can see the name of the table is players. On the top you can see the column names. So we have the player ID, the player name, the country to which the player belongs to and we also have the goals scored by each of the players. So these are also known as fields in a database. Here each row represents a record or a tuple. So you have the player ID which is 103 here, the name of the player is Daniel, he is from England and the number of goals here scored is 7. So you can use SQL commands to query, update, insert records and do a lot of other tasks. Now we'll see what the features of SQL are. SQL lets you access any information stored in a relational database. With SQL queries, data is extracted from the database in a very efficient way. The structured query language is compatible with all database systems from Oracle, IBM to Microsoft and it doesn't require much coding to manage databases. Now we will see applications of SQL. SQL is used to create a database, define its structure, implement it and lets you perform many functions. SQL is also used for maintaining an already existing database. SQL is a powerful language for entering data modifying data and extracting data in a database. SQL is extensively used as a client-server language to connect the front-end with the back-end, thus supporting the client-server architecture. SQL, when deployed as data control language DCL, helps protect your database from unauthorized access. In this session, we will learn who is a SQL developer and what are the responsibilities in a company. Then we will focus on the skills required to become a successful SQL developer. We'll see the expected average salary in both US and India. We will also discuss how to become a SQL developer and look at the top companies hiring for SQL developers. So hey everyone, I'm Abhisar Rahuja from Simply Learn and welcome to this video on how to become a SQL developer. But before we begin, if you love watching tech videos, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update. When going through some of the popular job boards online, 
you would easily see SQL developer is one of the most demanding jobs seeked by companies. As we all know today, companies collect vast volumes of data and store it in their own databases. They want professionals with a good understanding of data who can keep it safe and secure. So, first we will understand who is a SQL developer. SQL developer is a person who is accountable in creating and managing huge data assets of a company. In other terms, SQL developer is a person who can develop SQL databases as well as write and test code. Let's understand this with the help of an example. Let's say we want to search a particular product on Amazon website and Amazon has stored all its data about products in a database. Now we will write the product name in the search bar and when we click on the search button, it will run a SQL query that fetches all the information about the product and displays us on the website. So this is the basic task done by a SQL developer. Now we will understand the responsibilities of a SQL developer. All databases have a structure and logic behind how data is stored and retrieved. A SQL developer designs the database accordingly for businesses that is called database modeling. After the database is created and deployed, it's the SQL developer who is responsible for fixing the general issues of the database. A SQL developer should be well versed with structured query language to create optimized SQL queries and refines the existing ones to extract information from the database. SQL developers run several diagnostic tests to keep a check on the server and the database. In order to understand how to organize company's data, SQL developers must communicate with technical and non-technical persons from the business. And SQL developer also gathers client requirements and identifies the features that the database owners want. As data is an asset to a company, SQL developers backup and restore data for their clients. They also perform tasks like data management and data migration. That is, if a company has stored all its data on a local storage and now it wants its data to be stored in a cloud storage. So the safe transmission of the data from local storage to cloud storage is known as data migration. And that is done by the SQL developers. After knowing the responsibilities, now you should look for skill set required to be a good SQL developer. One should have a good knowledge of SQL commands, functions, joints and procedures. Let's have a look at few commands such as create, drop, alter and truncate. These commands come under data definition language. We also have insert, update and delete commands. These commands come under data manipulation language. We have grant and revoke commands. These commands come under data control language. We also have commit, rollback and save point commands. These come under transaction control language. These are the basic commands a SQL developer should be familiar with. And a SQL developer may have a little command on any one programming language. You don't have to be expert in programming. All you need is how to interface between application and your database. For example, you are using MySQL and your web application is based on PHP. Then you should know how to connect your application to the database and how to issue queries, how to fetch results and then how to display it to the users. One should have a good understanding of various database management systems such as MySQL, Microsoft Access, Oracle, PostgreSQL, DBase, FoxPro, SQLite, IBM DB2, LibreOffice Base, MariaDB and Microsoft SQL Server. One should know integration of databases with data visualization software such as Power BI and Tableau which helps businesses to make better decisions and give you an add-on as a SQL developer. One should develop critical thinking and problem solving skills to create optimized queries. Now we will see how a SQL developer is compensated in both United States and India. In the United States, SQL developers draw an average salary of $72,282 per annum. In India, the average salary of a SQL developer is Rs. 4,49,532. Now we'll see how a person can become a good SQL developer. For that, one should have a good command on structured query language and know how to interact with database management system and can issue queries to get the desired result. 
earning industry recognized SQL developer certifications such as Microsoft Certified Professional Developer MCPD or Oracle PL SQL Developer Certified Associate which usually require a passing score on an exam. And it's important to accumulate as much practical experience as possible. Start by designing, creating and querying small databases connected with your hobbies and interests. For example, your favorite music, videos or your personal finances. This will enable you to gain experience, test your knowledge and build your project portfolio, which will be highly beneficial when you start applying for your first full-time position. Now we will see some major companies recruiting SQL developers. First we have the Multinational Financial Services Corporation, American Express, followed by the Multinational Professional Services Network, Ernst & Young. We also have the messaging company, WhatsApp. Then we have the e-commerce giant, Amazon, as well as the technology and computer solutions company, Dell. Finally, in our list of companies, we have the multinational technology company, Google. There are mainly four types of SQL commands. So first we have data definition language or DDL. So DDL commands change the structure of the table like creating a table, deleting a table or altering a table. All the commands of DDL are auto committed which means it permanently save all the changes in the database. We have create, alter, drop and truncate as DDL commands. Next we have data manipulation language or DML. So DML commands are used to modify a database it is responsible for all forms of changes in the database. DML commands are not auto committed which means it can't permanently save all the changes in the database. We have select, update, delete and insert as DML commands. Now select command is also referred to as DQL or data query language. Third we have data control language or DCL. So DCL commands allow you to control access to data within the database. These DCL commands are normally used to create objects related to user access and also control the distribution of privileges among users. So we have grant and revoke which are the examples of data control language. Finally we have something called as transaction control language or TCL. So TCL commands allow the user to manage database transactions. Commit and rollback are example of TCL. Now let's see the basic SQL command structure. So first we have the select statement. So here you specify the various column names that you want to fetch from the table. We write the table name using the from statement. Next we have the where clause to filter out our table based on some conditions. So you can see here where condition 1, condition 2 and so on. Then we have the group by clause that takes various column names. So you can write group by column 1, column 2 and so on. Next we have the having clause to filter out tables based on groups. Finally, we have the order by clause to filter out the result in ascending or descending order. Now talking about the various data types in SQL. So we have exact numeric which has integer, small int, bit and decimal. Then we have approximate numeric which are float and real. Then we have some date and time data types such as date, time, timestamp and others. Then we have string data type which includes car, this var car and text. Finally we have binary data types and binary data types have binary, var binary and image. Now let's see some of the various operators that are present in SQL. So first we have our basic arithmetic operators. So you have addition, the subtraction, multiplication, division and modulus. Then we have some logical operators like all, and, any, or, between, exists and so on. Finally we have some comparison operators such as equal to, not equal to, this greater than, less than, greater than equal to or less than equal to, not less than or not greater than. Now let me take you to my MySQL workbench where we will learn to write some of the important SQL commands, use different statements, functions, data types and operators that we just learned. Now let me now go ahead and open my MySQL workbench. So in the search bar I'll search for MySQL Workbench. You can see I'm using the 8.0 version. I'll click on it and here it says welcome to MySQL Workbench and below under connections you can see I have already created a connection which says local instance. Then you have the root, the local host and the port number. Let me click on it. You can see the service, the username is root and I'll enter my password. 
and hit OK. Now this will open the SQL editor. So this is how the MySQL Workbench looks like. Here we learn some of the basic SQL commands. So first let me show you the databases that are already present. So the command is so databases. You can hit tab to autocomplete. I'll use a semicolon. I'll select this and here you on the top you can see the execute button. So if I run this, below you can see the output. It says show databases, seven rows are returned, which means currently there are seven databases. You can see the names. All right. Now let's say I want to see the tables that are present inside this database called world. So I'll use the command use world, which is the database name. Now let me run it. So currently I'm using the world database. So to display the tables that are present in the world database, I can use the show command and write show tables. Give a semicolon and I'll hit control enter this time to run it. All right. So you can see the tables that are present inside this world database. So we have three tables in total, city, country and country language. Now, if you are to see the rows that are present in one of the tables, you can use the select command. So I'll write select star, which basically means I want to display all the columns. So star here means to display all the columns. Then I'll write my from the table name that is city. So this command is going to display me all the rows that are present inside the city table. So if I hit control enter, all right, you can see the message here. It says thousand rows were returned, which means there were total thousand records present inside the city table. So here you can see there's an ID column, a name column, this country code, district and population. All right. Similarly, you can check the structure of the table by using the describe command. So I'll write describe and then I'll give the table name that is city. Now let's just run it. There you go. The field shows the column names. So we have ID, name, country code, district, population. Type here shows the data type of each of the columns. So district is character 20. ID is an integer. Population is also integer. Null says yes or no, which means if no, then there are no null values if it's yes, which means there are null values in your table. Key here represents whether you have any primary key or foreign key. And these are some extra information. Now let's learn how to create a table in MySQL. So I'll use the create table command for this. And before that, let me create a database and I'll name it as SQL intro. So the command is create database and I'll give my database name that is SQL underscore intro. Let me give a semicolon and hit control enter. So you can see I have created a new database. Now, if I run this command that is show databases, you can see this newly created database that is SQL intro. If I scroll down, there you go. You can see the name here SQL intro. Okay. Now within this database, we'll create a table called employee details. Now this will have the details of some employees. So let me first show you how to create a table that will be present inside the SQL intro database. So I'll use the command create table and then I'll give my table name that is going to be employee underscore details. Next, the syntax is to give the column names so my first column would be the name column, which is basically the employee name, followed by the data type for this column. Since name is a text column, so I'll use var car and I'll give a value of 25. So it can hold only 25 characters. Okay. Next, I also want the age of the employee. Now age is always an integer. So I'll give int. Okay. Then we can have the gender of the employee. So gender can be represented as F or M, F for female and M for male. So I'm using the car data type or character data type and I'll give the value as one. Then let's have the 
date of join or DOJ and this is going to be of data type date all right next we'll have the city name that is the city to which the employee belongs to so again this is going to be worker 15 finally we'll have a salary column and salary will keep it as float since salary can be in decimal numbers as well now I'll give a semicolon all right so let me just quickly run through it so first I wrote my create command then the table which is also a keyword followed by the table name which is employee details here and then we gave the column names such as name age this gender date of join city and salary for each of the columns we also give the data type all right so let me just run it okay so here you can see we have successfully created our first table now you can use the describe command to see the structure of the table I'll write describe EMP underscore details if I run this there you go so under field you can see the column names then you have the data types null represents if the table can accept null values or not and these are basically empty and we haven't set any default constraint all right moving ahead now let's learn to add data to our table using the insert command so on a notepad I have already written my insert statement so let me just copy it and then I'll explain it one by one all right so if you see this so we have used an insert into statement or a command followed by the table name that is EMP details then this is the syntax using values I have passed in all the records so first we have Jimmy which is the name of the employee then we have 35 which basically represents the age then M means the gender or the sex then we have the date of join next we have the city to which the employee belongs to and finally we have the salary of the employee so this particular information represents one record or a tuple similarly the next employee we have is Shane you can see the age and other information then we have Mary this Dwayne Sarah and Amy all right so let me go ahead and run this so this will help you insert the values in the table that you have created you can see we have successfully inserted six records now to display the records let me use the select statement so I'm using select star from EMP underscore details if I run this you can see my table here and the values it has so we have the name column the age column the state of join city salary and these are the values that you can see here moving ahead now let's say you want to see the unique city names present in the table so in this case you can use the distinct keyword along with the column name in the select statement so let me show you how you can print the distinct city names that are present in our table now if you notice this table clearly we have Chicago Seattle Boston Austin this New York and this Seattle repeated again so I only want to print the unique values so for that I can write my select statement as select distinct then I'll give my column name which is city from my table name that is EMP details if I run this you can see my query has returned five rows and these are the values so we have Chicago Seattle which was repeated twice is just been shown once then we have Boston Austin and New York now let's see how you can use inbuilt aggregate functions in SQL so suppose you want to count the number of employees in the table so in that case you can use the count function in the select statement so let me show you how to do that so I'll write select I'll use my function name that is count now since I want to know the total number of employees I'm going to use their name inside the brackets from 
employee underscore details. Now if I run this, this will return the total number of employees that are present in the table. So we have six employees in total. Now if you see here in the result it says count name. Now this column is actually not readable at all. So what SQL provides is something called as an alias name. So you can give an alias to the resultant output. So here I can write select count of name and use an alias as as I can give an alias as count underscore name and run this statement again. There you go. You can see here in the resultant output we have the column name as count name which was our alias name. Now suppose you want to get the total sum of salaries you can use another aggregate function called sum. So I'll write my select statement and this time instead of count I'm going to write sum and since I want to find the sum of salaries so inside the bracket I'll give my salary column from my table name that is employee details. If I run this, this will result in the total sum of salaries. So basically it adds up all the salaries that were present in the salary column. Now let's say you want to find the average salary. So instead of sum, you can write the average function which is AVG. So this will give you the average salary from the column salary. So you can see it here, this says average salary. Now if you want, you can give an alias name to this as well. Now you can select specific columns from the table by using the column names in the select statement. So initially we were selecting all the columns for example like you saw here the star represents that we want to see all the columns from the employee details table. Now suppose you want to see only specific columns you can mention those column names in the select statement. So let's say I want to select just the name age and the city column from my table that is employee details. So this will result in displaying only the name, age and city column from the table. If I run it, there you go. It has given only three columns to me. Now SQL has a WHERE clause to filter rows based on a particular condition. So if you want to filter your table based on a specific conditions, you can use WHERE clause. Now WHERE clause comes after you give your table name. So suppose you want to find the employees with age greater than 30. In this case you can use a WHERE clause. So let me show you how to do it. I'll write SELECT star from my table name that is employee details and after this I'll use my WHERE clause. So I'll write WHERE age greater than 30. If I run this, it will give me the output where the age is only greater than 30. So it excluded everything that is less than 30. So we have four employees whose age is greater than 30 here. Now suppose you want to find only female employees from the table, you can also use a WHERE clause here. So I'll write select, let's say I want only the name, the gender which is sex here comma city from my table that is employee details where I'll give my column name that is sex is equal to since I want only the female employees I'll give F and run this statement. Okay you can see here our employee table has three female employees. Now suppose you want to find the details of the employees who belong to Chicago or Austin. In this case you can use the OR operator. Now the OR operator in SQL displays a record if any of the condition separated by OR is true. So let me show you what I mean. So since I want the employees who are from Chicago and Austin I can use an OR operator. So I'll write select star from EMP details which is my table name. Then I'll give my WHERE clause where city equal to I'll give my city name as Chicago and then I'm going to use the OR operator OR city equal to I'll write Austin 
will give a semicolon and let me run it there you go so in the output you can see all the employees who belong to the city Chicago and Austin now there is another way to write the same SQL query so you can use an in operator to specify multiple conditions so let me just copy this and instead of using the OR operator this time I'm going to use the IN operator so I'll delete this after the WHERE clause I'm going to write WHERE CITY and use the IN operator inside bracket I'll give my city names as Chicago and I want Austin so I'll give a comma and write my next city name that is Austin so this query is exactly the same that we wrote on top let me run this you will get the same output there you go so we have Jimmy and Dwayne who are from Chicago and Austin respectively now SQL provides the between operator that selects values within a given range the values can be numbers text or dates Now suppose you want to find the employees whose date of join was between 1st of Jan 2000 and 31st of December 2010 10 so let me show you how to do it I'll write select star from EMP details where my date of join that is DOJ between I'll give my two date values that is 1st of Jan 2000 and I'll give my second value the date value that is 31st of December 2010 so every employee who has joined between these two dates will be displayed in the output if I run it we have two employees who had joined between 2000 and 2010 so we have Jimmy and Mary here who had joined in 2005 and 2009 respectively all right now in WHERE clause you can use the AND operator to specify multiple conditions now the AND operator displays a record if all the conditions separated by AND are true so let me show you an example I'll write select star from employee details table where I want the age to be greater than 30 and I want sex to be male alright so here you can see I have specified two conditions so if both the conditions are true only then it will result in an output if I run it you can see there are two employees who are male and their age is greater than 30 now let's talk about the group by statement in SQL so the group by statement groups rows that have the same values into summary rows like for example you want to find the average salary of customers in each department now the group by statement is often used with aggregate functions such as count, sum and average to group the result set into one or more columns. Let's say we want to find the total salary of employees based on the gender. So in this case you can use the group by clause. So I'll write select let's say sex comma I want to find the total sum of salary as I'll give an alias name let's say total salary from my table name that is employee details next I'm going to group it by sex okay let me run it there you go so we have two genders male and female and here you can see the total salary so what this SQL statement did was first it grouped all the employees based on the gender and then it found the total salary now SQL provides the order by keyword to sort the result set in ascending or descending order now the order by keyword sorts the records in ascending order by default to sort the records in descending order you can use the DESC keyword so let's say I want to sort my employee details table in terms of salary so I'll write select star from EMP underscore details and I'll use my order by clause on the salary column so this will sort 
all the records in ascending order of their salary which is by default you can see the salary column is sorted in ascending order now suppose you want to sort the salary column and display it in descending order you can use this keyword that is desc let me run it you can see the output now this time the salary is sorted in descending order and you have the other values as well now let me show you some basic operations that you can do using the select statement so suppose i write select and do an addition operation let's say 10 plus 20 and i'll give an alias name as addition if i run this it will give me the sum of 10 and 20 that is 30 similarly you can use the subtraction operator and you can change the alias name as let's say subtract let's run it you get minus 10 now there are some basic inbuilt functions there are a lot of inbuilt functions in SQL but here I'll show you a few suppose you want to find the length of a text or a string you can use the length function so I'll write select and then use the length function I'll hit tab to autocomplete let's say I want to find the length of country India and I'll give an alias as total length if I run it you see here it returns 5 because there are 5 letters in India there's another function called repeat so let me show you how repeat works so I'll write select repeat let's say I want to repeat the symbol that is at the rate I'll put it in single quotes because it is a text character and I want to repeat this character for 10 times close the bracket and let's run it you can see here in the output it has printed at the rate 10 times you can count it all right now let's say you want to convert a text or a string to uppercase or lowercase you can do that as well so I'll write select and use the function called upper let's say I want to convert my string that is India to uppercase I'm not giving in any alias name if I run this see my input was capital I and everything else was in small letter in the output you can see it is converted my input to all caps similarly you can change this let's say you want to print something in lower case you can use the lower function let's say this time everything is in upper case if I run it it converts India to lower case now let's explore a few date and time functions let's say you want to find the current date there's a function called CUR which stands for current and this is the function I'm talking about which is current date if I run this you will get the current date that is 28th of Jan 2021 and let's say you want to extract the day from a date value so you can use the day function let's say I'll use day and I want to find the day from my current date if I run this you get 28 which is today's day now similarly you can also display the current date and time so for that you can use a function that is called now so this will return the current date and time you can see this is the date value and then we have the current time all right and this brings us to the end of our demo session so let me just scroll through whatever we have learned so first I showed you how you can see the databases present in MySQL then we used one of the databases and checked the tables in it then we created another database called SQL intro for our demo purpose we used that database and then we created this table called employee details with column names like name integer the sex date of join city and salary I showed you the structure of the database let me run this again so you get an idea you can see this was the structure of our table then we went ahead and inserted a few records so we inserted records for six employees so you have the employee name the age the gender the date of join 
the city to which the employee belongs to and the salary of the employee. Then we saw how you can use the select statement and display all the columns present in the table. We learned how you can display the unique city names. We learned how to use different aggregate functions like count, average and sum. Then we learned how you could display specific columns from the table. We learned how to use WHERE clause. Then we used an OR operator. We learned about IN operator, the BETWEEN operator. Then we used an AND operator to select multiple conditions. Finally, we learned about GROUP BY, ORDER BY and some basic SQL operations. Now it's time to explore some string functions in MySQL. So I have given a comment string functions. First, let's say you want to convert a certain string into uppercase. So I can write select. The function I'll use is upper. And within this function, you can pass in the string. Let's say I'll write India. If you want, you can give an alias name as let's say uppercase. I'll give a semicolon and let's run it. There you go. So my input was in sentence case and using the upper function we have converted everything into uppercase. Similarly, let me just copy this and I'll show you if you want to convert a string into a lower case you can use the lower function. I'll run this you can see the result everything is in lowercase now of course I need to change the alias name to lowercase. Now instead of using lower as the function there is another function that MySQL provides which is called the L case. So I'll just edit this and write L case and let's say I'll write India in uppercase. Let's run it. It returns me the same result. Cool. Now moving on Let's say you want to find the length of a string, you can use the character length function. I'll write select, use the function character length and I'm again going to pass in my string as India as let's say total length. Let's run it. This time I'm going to hit Control enter to run my SQL command. There you go. It has given us the right result which is 5 because India has 5 characters in it. Now these functions you can also apply on a table. Now let me show you how to do it. Let's say we already have the students table and you want to find the length of each of the student names. So here you can pass stu underscore name and you can give the same alias name let's say total length and then you can write from table name that is students if i run this you can see the output it has given me total 20 rows of information it is not readable actually let me also display the student names so that we can compare their length Alright, I'll run this again and now you can see the result. So Joseph has 6 characters, Nilesh has 6, Vipul has 5, Anubhav has 7. Similarly, if you see Akshay has 6, Tanishk has 7, Raghav has 6, Cummins has 7, Rabada has 6, so on and so forth. Now instead of using this character length, you can also use the function car length it will work the same way let's see the result there you go it has given us the same result you can either use character length or car length now there's another very interesting function called concat so the concat function adds two or more expressions together let's say i'll write select i'll use the function concatenate the function is actually concat and I'm going to pass in 
my string values let's say India is in Asia let's run this and see our result you can see here it has concatenated everything let us make it more readable I'll give a space in between so that you can read it clearly now this is much more readable India is in Asia and if you want you can give an alias name as well as let's say merged there you go now the same concat operation you can also perform on a table I'm going to use the same students table let's say I want to return the student ID followed by the student name and then I am going to merge the student name followed by a space followed by the age of the student and I can give an alias as let's say name underscore age from my table that is students let's see how this works okay you see here the result is very clear we have the student ID the student name and the concatenated column that we created which was name underscore age where we have the student name with a space followed by the age of the student if I scroll down you can see the rest of the results cool now moving ahead let's see how the reverse function works in MySQL so the MySQL reverse function returns a string with the characters printed in reverse order so suppose I write select reverse I'll use the same string again let's say I have India let's run it you will see all the characters printed in reverse order again you can perform the same operation on a table as well let's say I'll write select reverse and I'll pass in the column as student name from my table that is students let's run it it gives you 20 students and all the names have been printed in reverse order okay now let's see what the replace function does so the replace function replaces all occurrences of a substring within a string within a new substring so let me show you what I mean I'll write select replace I'll pass in my input string which is let's say orange is a vegetable which is ideally incorrect I'm purposely writing this so that I can replace the word vegetable with fruit okay so what this replace function does is it is going to find where my word vegetable is within the string my input string and it is going to replace my word vegetable with fruit let's run it and see the output there you go now this is correct which is orange is a fruit all right now MySQL also provides some trim functions you can use the left trim right trim and just the trim function so let me show you how this left trim works left trim or L trim removes the leading space characters from a string passed as an argument so say I write select I'll use the left trim function which is L trim and then I'm going to purposely give a few spaces in the beginning of the string I'll give a word let's say India and then I'll give some space after the word India and see how the L trim works if I run this it gives me India which is fair enough but before that let's first find the length of my string so I'll use my length function here and within this function I am going to 
find the length of my string which has India along with some leading and trailing spaces. I'll paste this here, give a semicolon and I'll run it. Okay, so the entire string is 17 characters long or the length of the string is 17. Now say I use L trim on my same string. What it returns me is India and if I run length over it, you can see the difference as in you can see how many spaces were deleted from the left of the string. You can see here now it says 17 and I'm going to use L trim. Let's see the difference. It gives me 12. The reason being it has deleted 5 spaces from the left. You can count it 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So 17 minus 5 is 12 which is correct. Similarly, you can use the rtrim function which removes the trailing spaces from a string. Trailing spaces are these spaces. When you use left trim, it deletes the leading spaces which is this. Now let me just replace l trim with r trim which stands for right trim and see the result. So the length is 10 now. The reason being it has deleted seven spaces from the right of the string if you can count it one two three four five six and seven cool you can also use the trim function which will delete both the leading and the trailing spaces so here if i just write trim and i'll run it it gives me five because India is total 5 characters long and it has deleted all the leading and the trailing spaces. Alright. There's also a function called position in MySQL. The position function returns the position of the first occurrence of a substring in a string. So if the substring is not found with the original string, the function will return 0. So let's say I'll write select position. I want to find where fruit is in my string that is orange is a fruit. I'll give an alias as name. There's some error here. This should be within double quotes. Now let's run it and see the result. Okay. It says at the 13th place or at the 13th position we have the word fruit in our string which is orange is a fruit. Now the final function we are going to see is called ASCII. So the ASCII function returns the ASCII value for a specific character. Let's say I write select ASCII of the letter small a. If I run this it will give me the ASCII value which is 97. Let's say you want to find the ASCII value of 4. Let's see the result. It gives me 52. Alright. In this session, we are going to learn two important SQL statements or clauses that are widely used, that is group by and having. First, we'll understand the basics of group by and having and then jump into MySQL Workbench to implement these statements. So let's begin. First, what is group by in SQL? So the group by statement or clause groups records into summary rows and returns one record for each group. It groups the rows with the same group by item expressions and computes aggregate functions for the resulting group. A group by clause is a part of select expression. In each group, no two rows have the same value for the grouping column or columns. Now below you can see the syntax of group by. So first we have the select statement and then followed by the column names that we want to select. From we have the table name followed by the where condition and next we have the group by clause and here we include the column names. Finally we have the order by and the column names. Now here is an example of the group by clause. So we want to find the average salary of employees for each department. So here you can see we have the employees table 
it has the employee ID, the employee name, the age of the employee, we have the gender, the date on which the employee had joined the company, then we have the department to which each of these employees belong to, we have the city to which the employees belong to, and then we have the salary in dollars. So actually, we'll be using this employees table on MySQL Workbench as well. So if you were to find the average salary of employees in each department, so this is how your SQL query with group by clause would look like. So we have selected department and then we are using an aggregate function that is AVG which is average and we have chosen the salary column and here we have given an alias name which is average underscore salary which appears in the output you can see here from employees and we have grouped it by department. So here in the output you can see we have the department names and the average salary of the employees in each department. Now let me take you to my MySQL workbench where we will implement group by and solve specific problems. Okay, so I am on my MySQL workbench. So let me make my connection first. I'll enter the password. So this will open my SQL editor. So first of all, let me check the databases that I have. So I'll use my query that is show databases. Let's run it. Okay, you can see we have a list of databases here. I'm going to use my SQL underscore intro database. So I'll write use SQL underscore intro. So this will take us inside this database. I'll run it. All right. Now you can check the tables that are present in SQL underscore intro database. If I write show tables, you can see the list of tables that are already present in this database. To do our demo and understand group by as well as having, let me first create an employee table. So I'll write create table employees. Next, I'll give my column name as employee underscore ID, which is the ID for each employee. I'll give my data type as integer and I'll assign employee ID as my primary key. Next, I'll give employee underscore name and my data type would be var car. I'll give the size as 25. My third column would be the age column. Age would obviously be an integer. Then I have my gender column. I'll use character data type and assign a value of 1 or size of 1. Next, we have the date of join and the data type will be date. We have the department column as well. This is going to be of varkar and 20 will be the size. Next, we have the city column, which is actually the city to which the employee belongs to. And finally, we have the salary column, which will have the salary for all the employees. Okay. Now, let me select and run this. You can see here, we have successfully created our table. Now, to check if our table was created or not, you can use the describe command. I'll write describe employees. You can see the structure of the table so far. All right. Now it's time for us to insert a few records into this employees table. So I'll write insert into employees and I'll copy paste the records which I have already written on a notepad. So let me show you. So this is my EMP notepad and you can see I have already put the information for all the employees. So let me just copy this and we'll paste it here. All right, let me go to the top and verify if all the records are fine. All right. So let's run our insert query. 
okay so you can see here we have inserted 20 rows of information and now let's check the table information or the records that are present in our employees table i'll write select star from employees if i run it you can see here i have my employee id the employee name age gender we have the city salary and in total we have inserted 20 records now let me run a few sql commands to check how the structure of our table is let's say i want to see the distinct cities that are present in our table so i'll write select distinct city from employees if i run this you see here there are total eight different cities present in our employees table so we have chicago the seattle boston we have new york Miami and Detroit as well. Now let's say you want to know the total number of departments that are present. So you can use distinct department. If I run this, alright, you can see we have seven rows returned and here are the department names. So we have sales, marketing, product, tech, IT, finance, and HR. Alright. Now let me show you another SQL command. Now this is to use an aggregate function. So I want to find the average age of all the employees from the table. So I can write select AVG which is the aggregate function for average. Inside that I have passed my age column from employees. If I run this. So the average age of all the employees in our table is 33.35. Now, say you want to find the average age of employees in each department. So for this, you need to use the group by clause. I will give a comment here. I want to find the average age in each department. So I will write select department comma i'll write average of age from employees group by department now if i run this you can see here we have our seven departments on the left and on the right you can see the average age of employees in each of these departments now you can see here in the output it says AVG of age which is not readable so I can give an alias name as average age all right I can bring this down and if you want you can round the values also so you can round the decimal places so I'll use a round function before the average function and the round function takes two parameters one is the variable and the decimal place you want to round it to so if i run this there you go you can see here we have the average age of all the employees in each of these departments all right now suppose you want to find the total salary of all the employees for each department so you can write select department comma now I want the total salary so I'll use the sum function and I'll pass my column as salary from employees group by department. Let's run this query. You can see here in the output we have the different departments and on the right you can see the total salary of all the employees in each of these departments now here also you can give an alias name as total underscore salary let's run it again and you can see the output here all right now moving ahead you can also use the order by clause along with the group by clause Let's say you want to find the total number of employees in each city and group it 
in the order of employee ID. So, to do this, I can use my select query. I'll write select count of let's say employee ID and I want to know the city as well from employees group by city and next you can use the order by clause. I'll write order by count of employee ID and I'll write DESC which stands for descending. If I run this query, you can see here on the left you have the count of employees and on the right you can see the city names. So in Chicago we had the highest number of employees working that was 4. Then we had Seattle, Houston, Boston, Austin and the remaining also had 2 employees. So in this case we have ordered our result based on the count of employee ID in descending order. So we have the highest number appearing at the top and then followed by the lowest. Okay. Now let's explore another example. Suppose we want to find the number of employees that joined the company each year. We can use the year function on the date of joining column. Then we can count the employee IDs and group the result by each year. So let me show you how to do it. So I'll write select. I'm going to extract year from the date of join column. I'll give an alias as year. Next, I'll count the employee ID from my table name that is employees and I'm going to group it by year date of join. I give a semicolon. Alright. So let's run this. Great. You see here in the result we have the year that we have extracted from the date of join column and on the right you can see the total number of employees that joined the company each year. So we have in 2005 there was one employee. Similarly, we have in 2009 there were two employees. If I scroll down, you have information of other years as well. Now, if you want, you can order this as well based on year or count. Okay. Now, you can also use the group by to join two or more tables together. So, to show you this operation, let me first create a sales table. So, I'll write create table sales and the sales table will have columns such as the product id which is going to be of integer type then we have the selling price of the product now this will be a, a float value then we have the quantity sold for each of the products so i'll write quantity quantity will be of integer type Next we have the state in which the item was sold and state I'll put it as varkar and give the size as 20. Let's run this so that we'll create our sales table. Alright, so we have successfully created our sales table. Next we need to insert a few values to our sales table. So I have already written the records in a notepad. Let me show you. Okay. So here you can see I have my sales text file. Let me just copy these information. I'll just paste it on the query editor. Okay. Now let me go ahead and run this insert command. Alright. So you can see here we have successfully inserted 9 rows of information. So let me just run it through what we have inserted. So the first column is the product ID column. Then we have the selling price at which this product was sold. Then we have the quantity that was sold and in which state it was sold. So we have California, Texas, Alaska. Then we have another product ID which is 123. And these are the states in which 
the products were sold so let me just confirm with the select statement i'll write select star from sales so i run this you can see we have successfully created our table okay now suppose you want to find the revenue for both the product ids one to one and let's say one to three since we have just two product ids here so for that you can use the select query so i'll write select product id next i want to calculate the revenue so revenue is nothing but selling price multiplied by the quantity so i'll use the sum function to find the total revenue and inside the sum function i'll use my selling price column multiplied by my quantity column I'll give this an alias name as revenue from my table name that is sales. Finally, I'll group it by product ID. Let's run it. There you go. So here you can see we have the two product IDs, one to one and one to three. And here you can see the revenue that was generated from these two products all right now let's say we have to find the total profit that was made from both the products one to one and one to three so for that i'll create another table now this table will have the cost price of both the products so let me create the table first i'll write create table let's say the table name is c product which stands for the cost price of the products i'll give my first column as product id this will be an integer and i'll have my second column as cost price cost price will have floating type values let's run this so we have successfully created our product cost table now let me insert a few values into the c product table so i'll write insert into c underscore product i'll give my values for one to one let's say the cost price was 270 dollars for each and next we have my product as one two three and let's say the cost price for product 1 2 3 was $250. Let's insert these two values. Okay. Next, we'll join our sales table and the product cost table. So this will give us the profit that was generated for each of the products. So I'll write select c dot product underscore id comma i'll write sum s dot sell underscore price now here c and s are alias names so if i subtract my cost price from the selling price that will return the profit that was generated i'll multiply this with s dot quantity close the bracket I'll give an alias name as profit from sales as s so here s stands for the sales table I'm going to use inner join c underscore product table as the alias name should be c where s dot product underscore id is equal to c dot product underscore id we are using product underscore id because this column is the common column to both the tables and finally i am going to group it by c dot product underscore id 
all right so let me tell you what i have done here so i am selecting the product id next i am calculating the profit by subtracting the cost price from the selling price and i have multiplied the quantity column I'm using an inner join to connect my sales and the product cost table and I am joining on the column that is product ID and I have grouped it by C dot product ID. Let's run this. There you go. So here you can see for product ID one to one, we made a profit of $1,100 and for product ID one to three, we made a profit of $840. So now that we have learnt group by in detail let's learn about the having clause in sql the having clause in sql operates on grouped records and returns rows where aggregate function results matched with given conditions only so now having and where clause are kind of similar but where clause can't be used with an aggregate function so here you can see the syntax of having clause you have the select statement followed by the column names from the table name then we have the where conditions next we have the group by finally we have having and at last we have order by column names so you can see here we have a question at hand we want to find the cities where there are more than two employees so you can see the employee table that we had used in our group by clause as well so if you were to find the cities where there are more than two employees so this is how your sql query should look like so we have selected the employee id and we are finding out the count using the count function next we have selected the city column from employees we have grouped it by city and then we have used our having clause so we have given our condition having count of employee id should be greater than 2 so if you see the output we have the different city names and these were the cities where the count of employees was greater than 2 all right so let's go to our MySQL workbench and implement how having works. So suppose you want to find those departments where the average salary is greater than $75,000. You can use the having clause for this. So let me first run my table which is employees. If I run this, you can see we had inserted 20 rows of information and the last column we had was salary so the question we have is we want to find those departments where the average salary is greater than $75,000 so let me show you how to do it so I'll write select department comma I'll use the aggregate function that is average salary I'll give an alias name as AVG underscore salary from employees next we'll use the group by clause and I want to group it by each department and then I'm going to write my having clause so in having clause I'll use my condition that is having average of salary greater than $75,000 let's run it and see the output there you go so here you can see there were total three departments in the company that is sales finance and HR where the average salary is greater than $75,000 okay next let's say you want to find the cities where the total salary is greater than $200,000 so this will again be a simple SQL query so I'll write select city comma I want to find the total salary so I'll use the sum function and I'll pass my column as salary as I'll give a alias name as total from employees group by city and then I'm going to use my having clause I'll pass in my condition as having sum of salary greater than $200,000 all right so let's run this query there you go so 
So the different cities are Chicago, Seattle and Houston where the total salary was greater than $200,000. Now suppose you want to find the departments that have more than two employees. So let's see how to do it. I'll write select department comma this time since I want to find the number of employees I'm going to use the count function. I'll write count star as employee underscore count or EMP underscore count which is my alias name from employees next I'll group it by department having I'll give my condition count star greater than 2 let's run this okay so you have departments such as sales product tech and IT where there are more than two employees okay now you can also use a where clause along with the having clause in an SQL statement so suppose I want to find the cities that have more than two employees apart from Houston so I can write my query as select city comma count star as EMP count from employees where I'll give my condition city not equal to Houston I'll put it in double quotes since I don't want to see the information regarding Houston I'll group it by city having count of employees greater than 2. So if I run this query you see we have information for Chicago and Seattle only and we have excluded the information for Houston. Now you may also use aggregate functions in the having clause that does not appear in the select clause. So if I want to find the total number of employees for each department that have an average salary greater than $75,000, I can write it something like this. So select department comma count star as EMP count from employees group by department and in the having clause I'm going to provide the column name that is not present in the select expression so I'll write having average salary greater than 75,000 this is another way to use the having clause Let's run this. Alright, you can see we have department sales, finance and HR and you can see the employee count where the average salary was greater than 75,000. Okay. So let me run you from the beginning what we did in our demo. So first we created a table called employee. Then we inserted 20 records to this table. Next we explored a few SQL commands like distinct then we used average and finally we started with our group by clause followed by looking at how group by can be used along with another table and we joined two tables that was sales and product cost table to find out the profit then you learned how to use the having clause so we explored several different questions and learned how to use having in SQL. In this session, we will learn about joins in SQL. Joins are really important when you have to deal with data that is present on multiple tables. I'll help you understand the basics of joins and make you learn the different types of joins with hands-on demonstrations on MySQL Workbench. So let's get started with what are joins in SQL. SQL join statement or command is often used to fetch data present in multiple tables. 
SQL joins are used to combine rows of data from two or more tables based on a common field or column between them. Now consider this example where we have two tables, an orders table and a customers table. Now the order table has information about the order ID which is unique here. We have the order date that is when the order was placed. Then we have the shipped date. This has information about the date on which the order was shipped. Then we have the product name which basically is the names of different products. We have the status of delivery whether the product was delivered or not or whether it was cancelled. Then we have the quantity which means the number of products that were ordered. And finally we have the price of each product. Similarly we have another table called customers and this customer table has information about the order ID which is the foreign key here. Then we have the customer ID which is the primary key for this table. We also have the phone number, customer name and address of the customers. Now suppose you want to find the phone numbers of customers who have ordered a laptop. Now to solve this problem we need to join both the tables. The reason being the phone numbers are present in the customers table as you can see here and laptop which is the product name is present in the orders table which you can see it here. So using a join statement you can find the phone numbers of customers who have ordered a laptop. Now let's see another problem where you need to find the customer names who have ordered a product in the last 30 days. In this case we want the customer name present in the customers table and the last 30 days order information which you can get from the order date column that is present in the orders table. Okay. Now let's discuss the different types of joins one by one. So first we have an inner join. So the SQL inner join statement returns all the rows from multiple tables as long as the conditions are met. From the diagram above you can see that there are two tables A and B. A is the left table and B is the right table. The orange portion represents the output of an inner join. Which means an inner join returns the common records from both the tables. Now you can see the syntax here. So we have the select command and then we give the list of columns from table A which you can see here is the left table followed by the inner join keyword and then the name of the table that is B on a common key column from both the tables A and B. Now let me take you to the MySQL workbench and show you how inner join works in reality. So here I'll type MySQL you can see I have got MySQL Workbench 8.0 version installed. I'll click on it. So it'll take some time to open. Okay. I'll click on this local instance. And here I'll give my password. Okay. So this is how an SQL editor on MySQL Workbench looks like. So first of all, let me go ahead and create a new database. So I'll write create database. This is going to be my command followed by the name of the database that is going to be SQL underscore joins. If I give a semicolon and hit control enter, this will create a new database. You can see here one row affected. Now you can check whether the database was created or not using show databases command. If I run it, here you can see I have SQL joins database created. Now I'll use this database so I'll write use SQL underscore joins. Okay. Now to understand inner join, consider that there is a college and in every college you have different teams for different sports such as cricket, football, basketball and others. So let's create two tables, cricket and football. So I'll write create table and my table name is going to be cricket. Next, I'm going to create two columns in this table. The first column is going to be cricket ID then I'm going to give the data type as int and use the auto increment operator. I'm using auto increment because my cricket ID is going to be my primary key. Then I'm going to give 
the name of the students who are part of the cricket team and for this I'll use varchar data type and give the length as 30 I'll give another comma and I'll assign my cricket ID as primary key within brackets I'll give cricket underscore ID cricket ID is nothing but a unique identifier for each of the players like you have role numbers in college okay let me just run it all right so we have successfully created our cricket table similarly let me just copy this and I'll paste it here I'll create another table called football this will have the information of all the students who are part of the football team and instead of cricket I am going to give this as football ID alright and the name column will have the names of the students I'll change my primary key to football ID alright let me run this ok so now we have also created our football table the next step is to insert a few player names into both the tables so I'll write my insert into command first let's load some data to our cricket table so I'll write cricket and I'll give my name column followed by values and here I'll give some names such as let's say Stuart I'll give another comma the next player I'll choose is let's say Michael similarly I'll add a few more let's say we have Johnson the fourth player I'll take is let's say Hayden and finally we have let's say Fleming okay now I'll give a semicolon and run this okay so let me just check if all the values were inserted properly for this I'll use select star from table that is cricket if I run it you can see I have created a table and have successfully inserted five rows of information now similarly let's insert a few student names for our football table so I'll change this to football and obviously there would be students who will be part of both cricket and football team so I'll keep a few repeated names let's say Stuart Johnson and let's say Hayden are part of both cricket and football team then we have let's say Langer and let's say we have another player in the football team that is Aston I'll just run it okay you can see there are no errors so we have successfully inserted values to our football team as well let me just recheck it I'll write select star from football all right so we have five players in the football team as well okay now the question is suppose you want to find the students that are part of both the cricket and football team in this case you can use an inner join so let me show you how to do it so I'll write select star from cricket as I'm using an alias name as C which stands for cricket then I'm going to write inner join my next table is going to be football as F which is an alias name for the football table then I'm going to use the on command or operator and then I'll give the common key that is name here so C dot name is equal to F dot name so based on this name column from both the table my inner join operation will be performed so let's just run it there you go so Stuart Johnson and Hayden are the only three students who are part of both the teams all right now you can also individually select each of the columns from both the tables 
so let's say I write select c dot cricket underscore id comma c dot name comma f dot football underscore id comma f dot name from I'll write cricket as c inner join football as f on c dot name is equal to f dot name now if i run this you see we get the same output here as well all right now let's explore another example to learn more about inner joins so we have a database called classic models let me first use classic models I'll run this okay now let me just show the different tables that are part of classic tables all right so here you can see there are tables like customers there's employees office there's office details orders payments products and product lines as well all right so let me use my select statement to show what are the columns present in the products table okay so this product table has information about different product names you have the product code now this product code is unique here we also have the product vendor a little description about the product then we have the quantity in stock buying price and MSRP let's see what we have in product lines if I run it you see here we have the product line which is the primary key for this table then we have the textual description for each of the products this is basically some sort of an advertisement all right now suppose you want to find the product code the product name and the text description for each of the products you can join the products and product lines table so let me show you how to do it I'll write my select statement and choose my columns as product code then we have product name and let's say I want the text description so I'll write this column name okay then I'll use from my first table that is products inner join product lines I can use using the common key column that is product line close the bracket I'll give a semicolon and if I run it there you go so you can see the different product codes then we have the different product names and the textual description for each of the products so this we did by joining the products table and the product lines table all right now suppose you want to find the revenue generated from each product order and the status of the product to do this task we need to join three tables that is orders order details and products so first let me show you what are the columns we have in these three tables we have obviously seen for the products table now let me show you for orders and order details table so I'll write select star from orders if I run it you can see it has information about the order number the date on which the order was placed we also have the shipment date we also have the status column which has information regarding whether the order was shipped or cancelled then we have some comments column we also have the customer number who ordered this particular product similarly let's check what we have under order details so I'll write select star from order details if I run it you can see it has the order number the product code quantity of each product 
we have the price of each product then we have the order line number okay so using the product orders and order details let's perform an inner join so I'll write select o dot order number comma o dot status comma I need the product name which I'll take from the products table so I'll write p dot product name now here o p are all alias name for the tables orders products and I'll use od for order details comma since we want to find the revenue we actually need to find the product of quantity ordered into price of each product so I'll use a sum function and inside the sum function I'll give quantity ordered multiplied by the price of each item I'll use an alias as revenue then I'll use my from clause from orders as O inner join order details as I'll use an alias name as OD on I'll write O dot order number is equal to OD dot order number I'll use another inner join and this time we'll join the products table so I'll write inner join products as P on P dot product code is equal to OD dot product code and finally I'll use the group by clause and group it by order number all right let me run this okay there's some mistake here we need to debug this it says you have an error in your SQL syntax check the manual all right okay I think the name of the tables is actually orders and not order all right now let's run it okay there's still some error it says classic models dot product doesn't exist so again the product name is I mean the table name is products and not product so let's run it again all right there you go so we have the order number the status the product name and the revenue this we got it using inner join from three different tables now talking about left joins the SQL left join statement returns all the rows from the left table and the matching rows from the right table so if you see this diagram you can see we have all the rows from the left table that is A and only the matching rows from the right table that is B so you can see this overlapped region and the syntax for SQL left join is something like this so you have the select statement and then you give the list of columns from table A which is your left table then you use the left join keyword followed by the next table that is table B on the common key column so you write a dot key is equal to b dot key okay now in our classic models database we have two tables customers and orders so if you want to find the customer name and their order ID you can use these two tables so first let me show you the columns that are present in customers and orders I think orders we have already seen let me first show you what's there in the customers table okay so you can see we have the customer number the name of the customer then we have the contact last name the contact first name we have the phone number then there's an address column there are two address columns actually we have the city name the state and we have other information as well and similarly we have our orders table so I'll write select start from orders so I'll write select star from orders if I run this you can see these are the information available in the 
orders table okay so let's perform a left join where we want to find the customer name and their order IDs so I'll write select C dot customer name or let's say first we'll choose the customer number comma then I want the customer name so I'll write C dot customer name then we have the order number column which is present in the orders table and let's say I also want to see the status then I'll give my left table that is customers as C left join orders as O on C dot customer number equal to O dot customer number let's run it okay again there is some problem alright so the table name is customers let's run it so there's another mistake here this is customer number so B is missing cool let me run it alright so here you can see we have the information regarding the customer number then the respective customer names we have the order number and the status of the shipment so if I scroll down you'll notice one thing there are a few rows you can see which have null values this means for customer number 125 and for this particular customer name there were no orders and similarly if I scroll down you will find a few more null values you can see here there are two null values here for customer number 168 and 169 there were no orders available alright now to check those customers who haven't placed any orders you can use the null operator so what I'll do is here I'll just continue with this I'll use a WHERE clause and write WHERE order number is null now let me run this okay so here you can see there are 24 customers from the table that don't have any orders in their names okay now talking about right joins so SQL right join statement returns all the rows from the right table and only matching rows from the left table so here you can see we have our left table as A and the right table as B so the right join will return all the rows from the right table and only the matching rows from the left table now talking about the syntax so here you can see we have the select statement followed by the select statement you will have the list of columns that you want to choose from table A right join table B on the common key column from both the tables alright now to show how right join works I'll be using two tables that is customers and employees so let's see the rows of data that are present in the customer table first so I'll write select star from customers let's run it so here you have the customer number the customer name then we have the phone number the address of the customers you also have the country to which the customer belongs to the postal code and the credit limit as well similarly let's see for the employees table here I'll change customers to employees let's run it okay so we have the employee number the last name the first name we have the extension the email ID the job title and also reports to here means the manager okay so based on these two tables we'll find the customer name the phone number of the customer and the email address of the employee and join both the tables that is customers and employees so let me show you the command so I'll write select C dot customer name comma then we have C dot phone I'll give a space here next I want the employee number from the employee table so I'll write E dot employee number comma E dot email from customers as C right join 
employees as e on e dot my common key column is employee number here so i'll write e dot employee number is equal to c dot we have sales representatives employee number and i'm also going to order it by the employee number column okay so you can see i have my customer name selected from the customers table the phone number of the customer then we have the employee number and the email address so let me run it okay there's some problem all right so the table name is customers actually let's run it once again there you go so you can see here we have all the values selected from our right table which is the employees table you can see right join employees which means your employees table is to the right and then we have the customer name and phone numbers of the customers from the customer table which is actually your left table so you have a few employee numbers such as 1002 this 1056 which don't have any customer name or phone numbers okay so there's another popular join which is very widely used in sql known as self joins so self joins are used to join a table to itself so in our database we have a table called employees let me show you the table first all right so here you can see we have the employee number the last name the first name of the employee we have the email id and here if you see we have a column called reports to now this you can think of as the manager column so the way to read is for example for employee number 1056 the manager is 1002 so if you check for 1002 we have Dane Murphy then if I scroll down let's say for employee number 1102 yeah for employee number 1102 the manager is 1056 so here you can see who is at 1056 you have Mary Patterson similarly if I scroll down let's say for employee number 1188 we have the manager as 1143 now if I check the table at 1143 we have Anthony Bow so so the employee Julie Ferelli reports to Anthony Bow all right now suppose you want to know who is the reporting manager for each employee so for that you can use a self join so let me show you how to join this employees table I'll write select and then I'm going to use a function called concat within brackets I'll start with my alias name that is m dot then I'll write last name I'm going to concat last name followed by a comma then I'll have my first name I'll close this bracket and then I'm going to give my alias name let's say manager comma next I'm going to concat the same last name and first name and this time I'm going to use a separate alias let's say E which stands for employee so I'll write E dot last name comma and within single quotes I'll give my comma and then I'll write E dot first name I close this bracket I'll give an alias as let's say employee from I'll write employees as E inner join employees as M on M dot I'll use my 
common key column as employee number so I'll write m dot employee number is equal to e dot here I'm going to use the reports to column and then I'll order it by let's say manager okay now let's run this there you go so you have your two columns as manager and employee so for employee Louis Bonder the manager is Zerard Bonder similarly if I scroll down you have there are multiple employees reporting to this particular manager similarly we have our manager as Anthony Bow and we have different employees who are reporting to this particular manager and so on all right now moving ahead now let's see what a full join is so SQL full outer join statement returns all the rows when there is a match in either left or right table now you must remember that MySQL workbench does not support full outer join by default but there's a way to do it so by default this is how the syntax of full outer join looks like now this statement will work on other SQL databases like Microsoft SQL Server but it won't work on MySQL Workbench I'll show you the right way of using full outer join on MySQL Workbench so to show full outer join I'm going to first use a left join and then we'll also use a right join and finally we'll use a union operator so the union operator is used to combine the result set of two or more select statements so first of all let me write c dot customer name so for this example I'm using the customer table and the order table comma o dot order number so I just want to know the customer name and the order number related to the customer from I have customers as C left join I'll write orders as O on C dot customer number is equal to O dot customer number let me just copy this and after this I am going to use my union operator so union operator is used to merge results from two or more tables so basically this performs a vertical join and next I am going to use my right join operation so here instead of left join I will write right rest all looks fine let me just run it there you go so we have successfully run our full outer join operation you can see we have the different customer names and the order that each customer had placed all right so that brings us to the end of our demo session so let me just run through whatever we did in this session so first we created a database called SQL joins then we created two tables like cricket and football then we had inserted a few rows to each of these tables then we used this table to learn about inner join next we used a database called classic models it had multiple tables so we explored all of these tables like products there was product lines orders customers and employees and learned how to use inner join left join self join right join as well as full outer join so in this video we will learn subqueries in SQL we'll also have a look at stored procedures and learn about triggers in SQL we'll cover views in SQL and look at some of the important windows functions in SQL now to learn all of these we'll be using the MySQL workbench on windows so let's get started with subqueries in SQL so let me head over to my MySQL workbench so currently I am on my MySQL workbench let me connect to the local instance so I'll give my password I'll click on OK alright so this is my MySQL workbench query editor 
So first we are going to learn subqueries. Let me give a comment and write subqueries. Alright. So first of all let's understand what a subquery is. So a subquery is a query within another SQL query that is embedded within the WHERE clause, FROM clause or HAVING clause. So we'll explore a few scenarios where we can use subqueries. So for that I'll be using my database that is SQL underscore intro. So I'll write my command use SQL underscore intro. Now this database has a lot of tables. I'll be using the employees table that is present inside SQL underscore intro. Let me just expand this and you can see here we have an employees table. So let me first show you the contents within this table. I'll write select star from employees. Let me execute it. Okay, you can see here we have the employee ID, employee name, age, gender, there's date of join, department, city and salary and we have information for 20 employees. If I scroll down, you can see there are 20 employees present in our table. So let's say you want to find the employees whose salary is greater than the average salary. In such a scenario, you can use a subquery. So let me show you how to write a subquery. I'll write the select statement. In the select statement, I'll pass my column names that I want to display. So the column names I want are the employee name. Then I want the department of the employee and the salary of the employee from my table name that is employees. Next, I'll use a where condition where my salary should be greater than the average salary of all the employees. So I'll write salary greater than. After this, I'm going to write my subquery. So I'll give select average of salary from my table name that is employees and I'll close the bracket and give a semicolon. So what it does is first it is going to find the average salary of all the employees that are present in our table. Once we get the average salary number, we'll use this where condition where salary is greater than the average salary number. So the inside subquery let me run it first. If I run this this gives you the average salary of all the employees which is $75,350. Now I want to display all the employees who have salary greater than $75,350. So let's run our subquery. There you go. So there are 8 employees in our table who have a salary greater than the average salary of all the employees. Alright. Next. Let's see another example. Suppose this time you want to find the employees whose salary is greater than John's salary. So we have one employee whose name is John. Let me run the table once again. Okay, if I scroll down, you see we have an employee as John. You see this? Our employee ID 116 is John and his salary is $67,000. I want to display all the employees whose salary is greater than John's salary. So basically all the employees who are earning more than $65,000, I want to print them. So let's see how to do it. I'll write select. I want the employee name, comma, the gender of the employee. I also want the department and salary from my table name that is employees I'll write where salary is greater than I'll start my opening bracket inside the bracket I'm going to give my inner query that is select salary from employees where the employee name is John so within single quotations, I'll give John as my employee. I'll end with a semicolon. So let me first run my inner query. So this will give us the salary that John has, which is $67,000.
Now I want the employees who are earning more than sixty-seven thousand dollars. So let's run our subquery. Okay, so you can see twelve rows returned, which means there are twelve employees in our table who are earning more than sixty-seven thousand dollars. You see here, all these employees have a salary greater than sixty-seven thousand dollars. Okay. Now you can also use subqueries with two different tables so suppose you want to display some information that are present in two different tables you can use subqueries to do that so for this example we'll use a database that is called classic models you can see the first database so let me use this database called classic models i'll write use classic models now this database was actually downloaded from the internet there's a very nice website i'll just show you the website name so this is the website that is mysql tutorial.org you can see here they have very nice articles blogs from where you can learn mysql in detail so we have downloaded the database that is classic models from this website you see here they have a mysql sample database if you click on this it will take you to the link where you can download the database so they have this download link which says download mysql sample database and the name of the database is classic models all right so we are going to use this classic models database throughout our demo session if i expand the tables section you can see there are a lot of tables that are present inside this classic models database we have cricket customers as employees office there's orders order lines and many more so for our subquery we'll be using two tables that is order details and products table first let me show you the content that is present inside the products table first if i run this you see here it says 110 rows return which means there are 110 different products that are present in our table which has the product code the product name product line we have the product vendor description quantity in stock buy price msrp the other table we are going to use is order details which has the details of all the orders let me show you the records order details tables has okay so there are thousand records present in this table you have the order number the product code quantity ordered price of each item you have the order line number as well okay now we want to know the product code the product name and the msrp of the products whose price of each product is less than hundred dollars for this scenario we are going to use two different tables and we are going to write a subquery okay so if you see here in the order details table we have a column called price each i want to display the product code the product name and the msrp of the products which have a price of each product less than hundred dollars so the way i'm going to do is i'll write select product code comma product name now one thing to remember that this product name is actually present inside our products table and product code is present in both the tables that is products and order details here you can see this is the product code column comma msrp which is present inside the products table again from my table that is products where i'll write product code I'm going to use the in operator. Next, I'll write my inner query that is select product code from my table order details. Where my price of each product is less than hundred dollars. Let me run this okay so you can see there are total 83 products in our table which have a price 
less than hundred dollars you can see the price here okay now we learn another advanced concept in sql which is known as stored procedures i'll just give a comment saying stored procedure okay so first let's understand what is a stored procedure a stored procedure is an sql code that you can save so that the code can be reused over and over again so if you want to write a query over and over again save it as a stored procedure and then call it to execute it so in this example i want to create a stored procedure that will return the list of players who have scored more than 6 goals in a tournament so i have a database called sql underscore iq these are a few databases that i have already created so this database has a table called players if i expand the tables option you see we have a table called players and you can see the columns player id the name of the player the country to which the player belongs to and the number of goals each player has scored in a particular tournament so i'll write a stored procedure that will return the list of top players who have scored more than six goals in a tournament so first of all let me begin by using my sql underscore iq database we'll run it so now we are inside the sql underscore iq database let me select star from players to show the values that we have in the players table you can see there are six players in our table we have the player id the names of the players the country to which these players belong to and the goals they have scored so i'll write a stored procedure so the stored procedure syntax is something like this it should start with a delimiter okay in the delimiter I'll write ampersand ampersand. Next, I'll write create procedure followed by the procedure name. Let's say I want to name my procedure as top underscore players. Next statement is begin. After begin, I'll write my select statement. I want to select the name of the player, the country and the goals each player has scored from my table that is players where I'll write goals is greater than 6. I'll give a semicolon then I'll end my procedure with a delimiter that was double ampersand next i'll write delimiter and give a semicolon now the semicolon suggests this is a default delimiter and there should be a space okay now let's run our stored procedure there you go so you have successfully created our stored procedure now the way to run a stored procedure is you need to use the call method and give the procedure name that is top underscore players in our case with brackets and a semicolon let's execute it okay there is some problem here so we made a mistake while creating a procedure the name of the column is goals and not goal let me create that procedure again okay it says the procedure top underscore player already exists let's just edit the procedure name instead of top player we'll write it as top players and similarly we'll edit here as well now let's create it again okay now to call my procedure i'll write call space followed by the procedure name which is top underscore players if i run this you can see we have two players in our table who have scored 
more than six goals. So we consider them as the top players in a particular tournament. All right. Now, there are other methods that you can use while creating a stored procedure. One of the methods is by using an in parameter. So when you define an in parameter inside a stored procedure, the call-in program has to pass an argument to the stored procedure. So I'll give a comment. Stored procedure using in parameter. All right. So for this example, I'll create a procedure that will fetch or display the top records of employees based on their salaries. So we have a table in our SQL underscore IQ database, which is called employee details. I'm going to use this table. You can see we have the name of the employee, the age, sex, then we have the date of join, city and salary. Using this table, I'll create a procedure that will fetch or display the top records of employees based on their salaries and we'll use the in parameter. So let me show you how to do it. I'll write delimiter. This time I'm going to use forward slash. I'll write create procedure followed by the procedure name. Let's say SP for stored procedure sort by salary is the name of my procedure. And inside this procedure, I'll give my parameter in. I'll create a variable var and assign a data type integer. Then I'll write begin followed by my select statement where I'll select the name, age, salary from my table name that is EMP details or employee details. I'm going to order this by salary descending and I want to display limited number of records. So I'm using this limit keyword and my variable var which I created here. I'll end my select statement. I'll end my stored procedure with forward slash and I'll go back to my default delimiter that is semicolon. All right. So let me run this. There should be a space here. All right. So let's run this. Okay. You can see we have successfully created our second stored procedure, which is SP underscore sort by salary. Now you can also check whether the stored procedure was created or not. Here you have an option to see the stored procedures. Let me just refresh this and you can see we have three stored procedures that we have created so far. One is SP underscore sort by salary. The other two were top underscore player and top underscore players. Okay. Now let's call our stored procedure. I'll write call space followed by the stored procedure name, which is SP underscore sort by salary. And inside this, I'll give my parameter, which was actually VAR and this VAR we have used in limit. Let's say I want to display only the top three records of the employees who have the top three highest salaries. Okay. So let me run it. There you go. So Amy, Sarah and Jimmy were the top three employees who have the highest salary. So you saw how you could use the in parameter in a stored procedure. We created a variable and that variable we used in our select statement and we called our stored procedure and passed in that variable. Okay. Now, instead of a select statement inside a stored procedure, you can also use other statements. Let's say update. So I'll create a stored procedure to update the salary of a particular employee. So in this procedure, instead of select statement, we'll use the update command. In this example, we'll use the in operator twice. So let me show you how to do it. I'll write my delimiter first, which is going to be forward slash. 
then I'll write create procedure. My name of the procedure is going to be update salary and inside the update salary name I'll write in and then temp underscore name which will be a temporary name variable and the type I'll assign is varkar20 I'll again use my in parameter I'll write in next my other variable would be new underscore salary and the data type would be float I'll write begin and write my update command or update statement I'll write update table name that is employee details set salary equal to new underscore salary where name is equal to my temporary variable that is temp underscore name so this is my update command and I'll end the delimiter all right so let's run this okay we have successfully created our stored procedure if I refresh this you can see I have my stored procedure update underscore salary okay now let's say first of all I'll display my records that are present inside employee underscore details table okay so we have six rows of information let's say you want to update the salary of employee Jimmy or let's say Mary from 70,000 to let's say 72,000 or let's say 80,000 so I'll call my stored procedure that is update underscore salary and this time I'm going to pass in two parameters the first parameter will be the employee name and next with a comma I'll give my new salary that I want to so my employee name let's say is Mary and the salary I want to be updated is let's say $80,000 I'll give a semicolon and I'll run it you can see it says one row affected now let's check our table once again there you go if you see this record for Mary we have successfully updated the salary to eighty thousand dollars now moving ahead we learn to create a stored procedure using the out parameter so I'll give a comment stored procedure using out parameter okay so suppose we want to get the count of total female employees we will create total employees as an output parameter and the data type would be an integer the count of the female employees is assigned to the output variable which is total underscore emps using the into keyword let me show you how to write a stored procedure using the out parameter so first I'll declare my delimiter to forward slash I'll write create procedure followed by the procedure name it is going to be sp underscore count employees and inside this I am going to give my out parameter and the variable name that is total underscore EMPs which is total employees and the data type will be integer next I am going to write begin followed by my select statement that is select I want the count of total employees and the output I am going to put into my new variable that is total underscore EMPs from my table that is EMP underscore details where sex is equal to f which means 
female i'll give a semicolon next i'll end it with the delimiter and i'm going to change the delimiter to a default delimiter that is colon so let me tell you what i am doing here I'm creating a new stored procedure that is sp underscore count employees. Using this stored procedure, I'm going to count the total number of female employees that are present in our table emp underscore details. So I've used my out parameter and I'm creating a new variable called total underscore emps. The data type is integer. Here in the select statement, I'm counting the names of the employees and the result I'm storing it in total underscore emps. I have used my where condition where the gender or the sex is female so let's run this okay so we have created our stored procedure let's refresh this okay you can see we have our new stored procedure sp underscore count employees now to call it i'll write call the name of the procedure that is count underscore sp underscore count employees within brackets i'll pass in the parameter as at the rate f underscore emp i'll give a semicolon then i'll write select at the rate f underscore emp as female employees okay so as is an alias name Let's run this one by one. First, I'll call my procedure and then we'll display the total number of female employees. You can see in our table we have three female employees. Alright. Now, with this understanding, let's move on to our next topic in this tutorial on advanced SQL. Now, we are going to learn about triggers in SQL. So, I'll give a comment here triggers in SQL. So first let's understand what is a trigger. So a trigger is a special type of stored procedure that runs automatically when an event occurs in the database server. Now there are mainly three types of triggers in SQL. We have the data manipulation trigger, we have the data definition trigger and login triggers. In this example we will learn how to use a before insert trigger. So we will create a simple students table that will have the students roll number, the age, the name and the students marks. So before inserting the records to our table, we'll check if the marks are less than zero. So in case the marks are less than zero, our trigger will automatically set the marks to a random value, let's say 50. So let's go ahead and create our table that is students. All right. So I'll write create table student now this table will have the student roll number the data type is integer it will have the age of the students again the data type is integer we have the names of the students so the third column would be name the data type would be variable or varying character size I am giving it as 30 finally we have the marks as floating type so let's create this table which is student so we have created our table now I'll write my trigger command so trigger command will start with delimiter like how our usual stored procedures have next this time I'll write create trigger then you need to give the name of the trigger that is mark underscore let's say verify I'm going to use a before insert trigger so I'll write before insert on my table name that is student next I'll write for each row if new dot marks is less than zero then 
will set new dot marks equal to 50 so this is my condition first we'll check before inserting if any student has marks less than 0 we'll assign a value 50 to that student because usually the marks are not less than 0 in any exam I'll write end if semicolon and I'll close the delimiter so this is my trigger command I'll run it it says trigger already exists so in this case we need to update the trigger name let's say I'll write marks underscore verify underscore student for ST let's run it again okay there is an error here because in our table the column name is mark and not marks so here we need to change it as mark instead of marks all right let's run it okay so we have created our trigger now let me insert a few records to the student table so i'll write insert into student I'll write values. I'll give the values as 501, which is the student roll number. The age is, let's say, 10. The name is, let's say, Ruth. And the marks is, let's say, 75.0. Give a comma. We'll insert our second student record. Student roll number is 502. Age is 12. The name is let's say Mike and this time I'm purposely giving a value of minus 20.5 give another comma we'll insert the third record for student roll number 503 age is 13 the name is Dave and let's say the marks obtained by Dave is 90 now we'll insert our final record for student number 504 the age is 10 name i'll enter as jacobs and this time again i'm purposely giving the marks in negative 12 point let's say 5 I close the bracket and give a semicolon and I'll run my insert statement. Okay, so we have inserted four rows of information to our student table. Now, let me run the select query. I'll write select star from student. If I run this, you see the difference. There you go. So, originally we had inserted for 502, the marks was minus 20.5 and for 504 for Jacobs the marks was minus 12.5 our trigger automatically converted the negative marks to 50 because when we created our trigger we had set our marks to 50 in case the marks were less than 0 so this is how a trigger works now you can also drop a trigger or delete a trigger you can just write drop trigger followed by the trigger name in this case our trigger name is marks underscore verify underscore st i'll just paste this here and if you run this it will automatically delete your trigger we'll give this as a comment okay now moving on now we are going to learn about another crucial concept in sql which is very widely used this is known as views so views are actually virtual tables that do not store any data of their own but display data stored in other tables. Views are created by joining one or more tables. I'll give a comment as views in SQL. Okay. Now to learn views, I am going to use my table which is present inside classic models database. Now this database as I mentioned we had downloaded we had downloaded it from the internet so first of all let me write 
use classic models so i'll switch my database first all right now we are inside classic models so here let me show you one of the tables which is called customers so i'll write select star from customers okay i missed s here let's run it again so this is my customer table which is present inside classic models database it has the contact last name the contact first name the customer name customer number we have the address state country and other information now i'll write a basic view command using this customer table the way to write is i'll write create view followed by the view name which is cust underscore details then you write as select i am going to select a few column names from my original customer table which is this one so i need the customer name let's say i need the phone number and the city so you have this information here you have the phone number and the city all right i'll write from my table that is customers if i run this my view that is cust details will be created let's run it there is some error here because the name of the table is customers and not customer i'll give an s and i'll run it again all right so you can see we have created our view and to display the contents that are present inside our view i can write select star from followed by the view name that is cust underscore details let's run it there you go so we have the customer name the phone number and the city of the different customers that we have in our table all right now let's learn how you can create views using joins so we'll join two different tables and create a view so for that i am going to use my products table and the products lines table i'm talking about the products table and the product lines table present inside classic models database so before i start let me display the records that are present inside the products table let's run it so these are the different products you can see here now let's see what we have in product lines table so we have the product line the text description and there is some html description and image so i'll create a view by joining these two tables and will fetch specific records that are present in both the tables so let me first start by writing create view followed by the view name that is product underscore description as i'll write select product name comma then i'll write quantity in stock i also want the msrp now these three columns are present inside the products table and next from the product lines table i want the text description of the products so i'll write from products table i'll give an alias as p followed by inner join my other table that is product lines as let's say pl on the common column that is product line so p dot product line is equal to i'll give a space pl dot product line okay so here we have used an inner join to fetch specific columns from both the tables and our view name is product underscore description let us run it all right so we have our view ready now let me view or display what is present inside our product underscore description view i'll select star from 
product underscore description let's run it there you go so we have the product name the quantity in stock msrp and textual descriptions of the different products in the table okay now there are a few other operations that you can perform let's say you want to rename a view instead of product underscore description you want to give some other name so i'll just give a comment rename description So to rename a description, you can use the rename statement. I'll write rename table product underscore description, which is my old name. I want to change this name to, let's say, I'll give vehicle description. Since all our products are related to some of the other vehicle, so I'll write vehicle description. okay let us run it all right so here you can see i have renamed my view so here if i just refresh it and i'll expand this you can see we have the cast details view and we have the vehicle underscore description view okay now either you can view all the views from this panel or you can use a command let's say I'll write display views is the comment. Now to show all the views you can use show full tables where table underscore type is equal to within single quote I'll write view. So this is the command that will display all the views that are present inside a database. There is some error here let's debug the error this should be okay so instead of table types it should be table type equal to view let's run it you can see the two different views that we have one is customer details another is vehicle underscore description okay now you can also go ahead and delete a view for that you can use the drop command so i'll write drop view followed by the view name let's say i want to delete customer underscore details or cust underscore details view i'll write drop view cust underscore details let's run it you can see here we don't have the cust underscore details view anymore all right now moving to our final section in this demo here we will learn about windows functions now windows functions were incorporated in mysql in the 8.0 version so windows function in mysql are useful applications in solving analytical problems so using the employees table present inside my sql underscore intro database so we'll find the total combined salary of the employees for each department so First, let me switch my database to SQL underscore intro database. I'll run it. OK. I'll display my table that is employee. So here we have 20 employees in our table. Using this table, we are going to find the combined salary of the employees for each department. So we'll partition our table by department and print the total salary and this we are going to do using some windows functions in mysql so i'll write select i want the employee name the age of the employee and the department of the employee comma next i'll write the sum of salary over I want to partition it by department so I'll write partition by department which is DPT and I'll give an alias as total salary so that it will create a new column with the name total salary from my table that is employees 
the output will be a little different this time. Let's execute it and see the result. There you go. So here we have created another column in our result that is total salary and for each of the employees and the respective departments we have the highest salary. So in finance the highest salary of one of the employees was $155,000. Similarly if I come down we have the highest salary from HR. If I scroll further we have the highest salary from IT, marketing, product, sales and the tech team. Alright. Now we'll explore a function which is called row number. Now the row number function gives a sequential integer to every row within its partition. So let me show you how to use the row number function. I'll write select row underscore number function over my column would be salary so i'll write order by salary i'll give the alias as row num I'll give a comma and i want to display the employee name and the salary of the employee from my table that is employees and i'll order by salary so let's see how our row number function will create sequential integers. Okay, you can see here we have a row num column and we have successfully given row numbers to each of the records. You can see it starts from 1 and goes up till 20. Okay. Now this row number function can be used to find duplicate values in a table. To show that, first I'll create a table. I'll write create table. Let's say I'll give a random name that is demo. And let's say we have in this table the student ID which is of type integer and we have the student name which is of type varkar. The size is 20. I'll create the small table with a few records. Let's create this table first. Now we are going to insert a few records to our demo table. So I'll write insert into demo values I'll give 101 the name is Shane give a comma I'll insert the second student name 102 the name is Bradley I'll give a comma this time for 103 we have two records let's say the name of the student is Herath I'll give a comma I'll copy this and we'll paste it again so we have duplicated 103 next we have 104 the name of the student let's say is Nathan then again let's say for the fifth student which is Kevin we have two records I'll copy this and I'll paste it here. Let me give a semicolon and we'll insert these records to our table demo. Alright. Now, let me just run this table for you. I'll write select star from demo. If you see this, we have a few information that are duplicated in our table. That is for student ID 103 and student ID 105. Now I am going to use my row number function to find the duplicate records present in my table. I will write select student underscore ID comma student underscore name. I will give another comma and write row underscore number over within brackets I'll write partition by st underscore id comma st underscore name okay then I'll write order by 
st underscore id close the bracket i'll give an alias as row num from my table that is demo let's just run it you can see here okay let me just delete n from here and do it again all right now if you see here there is just one student in the name shane we have one student in the name bradley but here if you see for herath the second record it says two which means there are two records for herath and if i scroll down there is one record for nathan and there are two records for kevin which means kevin is also repeated okay now we are going to see another windows function that is called rank function in mysql so the rank function assigns a rank to a particular column now there are gaps in the sequence of rank values when two or more rows have the same rank so first of all let me create a table and the name of the table would be a random name we'll give it as let's say demo 1 and it will have only one column let's say variable a of type integer we'll create this table first okay now let's go ahead and insert a few records to our table which is demo 1 so i'll write value 101 102 let's say 103 is repeated i'm doing this purposely so that in the output you can clearly distinguish what the rank function does next we have 104 105 we have 106 and let's say 106 is also repeated finally we have 107 okay let me insert these values to my table that is demo 1 okay this is done now if i write select var underscore a and use my rank function i'll write rank over then i'll order by my variable that is var underscore a as an alias name let's say test rank from my table that is demo1 let me execute this and show you how the rank function works now if i run this there you go so here if you mark so for variable a101 the test rank is 1 for 102 the test rank is 2 but for this value which is 103 the test rank is repeated because there was a repetition for 103 so we have skipped the rank 4 here for 104 the rank is 5 now for 105 the rank is 6 now for 106 again since the record was repeated twice we have skipped the 8th rank and our rank function has signed the same value which is 7 for 106 and for the last value 107 the rank is 9 all right now moving ahead we'll see our final windows function which is called first value so first value is another important function in mysql so this function returns the value of the specified expression with respect to the first row in the window frame all right so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to select the employee name the age and salary and i'll write first underscore value which is my function and pass in my employee name and then i'll write over order by my column that is salary descending i'll give an alias as highest underscore salary from my table that is employees so let me run this and see how the 
first underscore value function works. All right. So in our table, Joseph was the employee who had the highest salary, which was hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. So the first value function populated the same employee name throughout the table. You can see it here. Now you can also use the first underscore value function over the partition. So let's say you want to display the employee name who has the highest salary in each department. So for that you can use the partition. I'll write select emp underscore name comma. I want the department and the salary comma. I'll use my function that is first underscore value followed by the name of the employee inside my first value parameter I'll write over here I'm going to use partition I'm going to partition it by department since I want to know the employee name who has the highest salary in each department and I'm going to order by salary descending And I'll give my alias again as highest salary from my table that is employees. So let's run this and see the difference in the output. Okay. So as you can see here, we have the employee who had the highest salary from each department. So for finance, Jack had the highest salary. From HR, it was Marcus. Similarly, in IT, it was William. If I scroll down for marketing, it was John. For product, it was Alice who had the highest salary. Similarly, in sales, we had Joseph. And in tech, we had Angela. So this is how you can use the first underscore value function using partition. In this video, we'll discuss some of the frequently asked questions in PHP interviews. Now, the questions are categorized in two sections beginner and advanced questions so without any further ado let us get started with the beginner questions now the most basic question is what is php so php stands for hypertext preprocessor it is a server side scripting language that is embedded into html and is generally used for dynamic web development PHP is also a very compatible language that is it also works efficiently with almost 20 different databases such as MySQL, PostgreSQL, etc. Next question, what is a session in PHP? Now sessions in PHP are used to store data for users under a unique ID which can be then used across multiple web pages of a website. Next, what is peer in PHP? Now, peer stands for PHP Extension and Application Repository. It is a framework and repository for the reusable components. Focus on reusable components of PHP containing code snippets and libraries. Next, is PHP considered a case sensitive language? So, this is a very often asked question in interviews. So, PHP is partially case sensitive since Variables in PHP are case sensitive while functions and user defined functions are not. Next, name different types of data types in PHP. So, different data types in PHP include integer, float, string, boolean, array, object, null, and finally resource. So, there are total eight different data types that exist in PHP. Next question. How is echo different from print? Now echo, it can output multiple strings at a time. While in case of print, it can output only a single string. Now echo does not have a return value. While print always returns one. That is the reason that is echo is faster because it does not have to return a value. While it is Print is slower in comparison to echo because it always returns a value. Now, as you can see, both of these commands, echo and print, are used in the exact same way. Next, what are the rules for naming a variable? Now, there are certain rules 
which you have to follow or certain good coding practices which you have to follow while naming a variable in your PHP code. So variable name must always begin with underscore or a letter. So it cannot begin with a number or a special character for that matter. Next, variable names can include numbers but not special characters. So suppose you want to name your variable number one to three. So you can use this variable but you cannot use number at the rate one to three since special characters are not included. Next, a variable in PHP is declared using this dollar sign followed by the variable name. Now, as you can see, this is how we declare a variable dollar my underscore variable. You can also put a number in between or at the end while naming a variable, just not at the start. Next, name some popular PHP frameworks. So some of the popular PHP frameworks include Symfony, Codeigniter, CakePHP and Laravel. Moving on how to check if a defined variable is null or not. So is a thank function is used to check if the defined variable has any value or not. So to use this, suppose you have this block of code in front of you. So suppose you want to check if this X variable that you've defined is null or not. So what you do is you put the is it function inside the if condition and it will return true if it's not null while it will return false if it is a null value since it is not null it returns true and we can display echo as variable x is not null while in the case of variable y it is a null value since so the if condition will be false and it will not display anything next how are objects in php passed so objects in PHP are always passed by a value, not by a reference. Next question, how to display output directly to the browser? Now, in cases you want to display your output directly onto the browser while running a piece of code, you can use, it, use these special tags to display an output directly to the browser. Now, as you may notice, these tags does not contain the php written you can use them directly and replace php with an equal to sign followed by what you want to display and end it with a question mark and a closing bracket moving on what is define function used for in php now define is used to declare a constant in php also, in contrast to the variables, there is no need for a dollar sign before declaring a constant since the value of a constant does not change. Now, this is how you can use the define function to declare a constant. Suppose you want to declare the value of pi as 3.14 throughout your PHP code and which cannot be changed. So, we can use define for that. Next question is related to this question since what is constant function in use for in PHP then? So constant function returns the value of a constant. It is not used to define a constant but it returns the value of a constant. So suppose you define a function constant using this define function and you want to return this value you can use this constant function for that. Next is multiple inheritance supported in PHP? So PHP only supports single level inheritance, which means a class can be extended from only one class using the keyword extended. Next, what are the different types of loops in PHP? So PHP consists of a while loop, a do while loop, a for loop, and finally a for each loop. So PHP consists of total four loops. Next question, how to concatenate two strings in PHP? Now, two strings can be easily concatenated using the dot operator in PHP. Now, to do that, I'll show you with the help of a code. Suppose you want to concatenate or join these two strings, str1, hello guys, and the second string would be and welcome to simply learn, and want to display these strings together. 
so to do that you need to use this dot operator in echo as you can see this dot operator so first you write the name of the first string then followed by the dot operator i've given this space and then the next dot operator because this is also considered as a string and then the third string variable and this is how you concatenate two strings next question what is the use of function num ar arguments now this function as you can see is used to return the number of arguments passed in a function so suppose you pass a certain number of arguments in a function and want to know how many values or arguments were passed you can use this function for that so suppose in this sample code you want to know how many arguments were passed in this sample function so to do that we declare a variable number of arguments and we will equal it to the function of number function number arguments now we will display it and this sample has passed three arguments so the output would be three moving on what are super global variables in php now some predefined variables in php are known as super global variables because they are always accessible from any function file or class regardless of the scope so in all in all they are globally accessible so suppose you write a piece of code and you declare a variable inside it it would be a local variable and could be accessed only in that part of the code but in case of super global variable they are accessible throughout the entire code they include global server request post get files env cookie and session moving on how to invoke single line and multi line comments now a single line comment in php can be made using this hash followed by the comment or double slash followed by the comment while in case of multi line comments you can use this hash star and write your comments in multiple lines and enclose it with a star and slash what i'm go going to do now is i am going to show you the use of these comments in actual vs code now let us take this block of code for example now suppose you want to add a com single line comment after this variable so what you will do is you can use this double slash this is a variable also you can use slash this is also a variable so this is a single line comment now if you try to write something else after this in the next line it will take it as part of the code not part of the comment so what do you do when you need to write multiple lines of comment so suppose you need to write two three lines about this line of code what you will do is you will use a slash star now write the comment this is displaying simply learn so this is a three line comment which you can end simply by star and a slash this is how you write single line and multi line comments now let's move on to the next question that is name some common applications of php so some of the most commonly used php applications are system functions form handling so php is very commonly used to handle the forms that you see on the web pages crud tasks now crud tasks are create read update and delete so when you will be working with databases this is a very important part of using databases that is crud and php is used very commonly in that next accessing cookies variables and set keys and finally data encryption php provides security through some of its frameworks which can be used and is used very commonly throughout a lot of websites so now that we have gone through the beginner level questions that are frequently asked in php interviews let us now move on to the advanced level questions so 
The first question would be how can you execute a PHP script from the command line. Now a PHP script from a command line can be executed by, by opening the command line and inside the command line you have to specify the name of the script or name of the PHP file that you want to run. Suppose you want to run a PHP underscore script dot PHP. So you type in the name of the PHP script that you want to run and that particular PHP script will be executed. Next, differentiate between a dollar variable and double dollar variable. So what is the difference between the two? Now in case of a single dollar variable is it is a simple variable that is simply used to store data. So as we discussed earlier, it is a variable that we define to store different data types that is integer, float, strings, etc. While a double dollar variable is a reference variable of variable. So this is used to reference already existing variables. Now to use or to understand how these two work, you can see this particular block of code here. Now in this code, what you need to focus on is this is a simple variable hello which contains the string welcome to simply learn and we have defined another variable as where which contains the string hello now in this echo as you can notice what we are doing is we are using this also before that you need to notice is this is the same string as the name of this variable so First, we are displaying this variable and then we are referencing this variable here. So what it is doing is it is referencing the value to another variable. So hello variable is being referenced. So when you execute this block of PHP script, what you get the output is hello. Since this is the variable hello and after that what you will get is Welcome to simply learn since this variable is a reference to this variable. Next, differentiate between get and post method. Now, get method is used to submit form data while post method is also used for the same feature. So, the difference between them is get method sends data as part of PHP page URL sorry web page url while a post method sends data through http header in get the data since the data has been sent through the url it is displayed in the url of the web page so it is not secure while in case of post method it is a secure form of data transfer hence when developing a website for some security purposes Usually we prefer post method. Next up, how to connect to a database using a PHP script. Now suppose if you are asked this question in an interview, what you need to do is you need to just write this block of code and explain it to the interview. Now suppose we have a PHP script and we want to connect it to a database. What we need to do is we will create three different variables that is server name username and password now what we are going to do is we will create another variable con that will be used to connect it and then we'll use the mysqli functions which will then pass these variables to create a connection so these variable values are localhost username password these are the default values now to check if the connection is connected what we are going to do is we will use an if condition if the con variable gets an connect error we will display a error message that is connection failed if not we will display connected successfully now as you can see here these names can be the name of the server that you're trying to connect i have used localhost username password for the default values you can use the name of the database that you're trying to connect your php script to next up what does final class and final method mean in php now a final class in php means that the class 
cannot be extended while a final method means that it cannot be overridden now as you can see in this block of code we have used the final keyword for a class and the final keyword for a function now suppose you, this final class is being inherited by this child class what the program will return is an error because once you use this final keyword this class cannot be inherited and similarly suppose this function is trying to be overridden by this part of the code it cannot be because we have used the final function next question differentiate between function overloading and overriding now function overloading the same function is used for different purposes based on the number of arguments inside the function while in case of function overriding the same name and same argument function is used in parent and child class respectively to change the behavior of parent class method now let me show you and demonstrate the difference with an example so let us look at this code so suppose you have a function named show title which does have contain a single parameter and displays when called upon using this parameter displays function 1 now if you want to use the same name of the function for a different purpose what you can do is you can increase or change the number of parameters inside the function that is it now contains two parameters so when the same function is called using two parameters it will function differently and display function overloading so this is how function overloading works next from this piece of code we can understand function overriding suppose you display a function demo in a base class and you want to override this demo function inside the derived class so what you do is you make another function with the same name inside the derived class with some different properties as you can see it displays something different now you create an object for the base class and when you use this base class object to call this demo function you can use the properties of this function here while if you create another object that is object 2 for the derived class and you use this object to call upon the same demo function you are overriding this base class demo function that was inherited instead what it will use is it will use the properties of the derived demo function so that is how you overload or override a class function in php now let's move on to the next question that is differentiate between equal to equal to and triple equal operator so a double equal operator is generally used to check if the value of two operands are equal or not it is generally used in case of conditional statements while a triple equals to operator performs a type safe comparison which means that will that it will only return true if both operands have the same type and the same value so you can understand this more with this piece of code so suppose in this case since they both are equal it will return true while in this case they both have the same type hence it will return true now let us next check this equals to equal so since they both are one and in php it will display as true since they are equal while when you are type checking that is you are checking if they are equal with the same type and same value it will display a false since one is an integer and the other one is a string value also if you check two different strings with the type safe it will also display true next question how does exception handling work in php so when an exception is thrown code following the statement will not be executed and php will attempt to find the first matching catch block so if an exception is not caught a php fatal error with, will be issued with an uncaught exception an exception can be thrown and caught within php 
so what we do is we use this try and catch method to try the code and if an error occurs we can catch if an exception occurs we can throw it and the catch function will catch the exception and if there's we do not include the catch function it will result in a fatal error next up differentiate between require and include now require if a required file is not found it will throw a fatal error and stop the code execution while in case of include if an essential file is not found it will produce a warning and still execute the remaining scripts so as you can see both of these include and require are used in the exact same way with different functions next up explain different types of errors in php now php consists of mainly three errors notice warning and a fatal error now notice is a non critical error which means that something minor went wrong during execution and a lot of times you just don't pay attention to it a warning is a critical error now it is given in condition where suppose an include function that we just discussed in the previous question went to retrieve a non existent file so suppose you use an include function and the file does not exist it will display a warning and final is a fatal error so it is a critical error resulting in termination of the code so as we discuss in the try and catch part of the question if an exception is thrown and we do not have a catch function for it it will display a fatal error which will return in termination of the code next question how to call a function by reference so ampersand sign is used to call a function by reference now in case of reference the actual value is modified if the value pass inside the function is also modified while in case of value the value of the original value does not change so this piece of code here is an example of how you can call a function by reference here as you can see this ampersand sign will call this function by reference and any changes made in the variables here will affect the original ones next question create a singleton class in php so how do we create a singleton class in php before that let's have a look at what is a singleton class now a singleton class in php is a class that can have only one object and hence provides only a single point of access so in generally generally in class you can create as many objects as you want and it will in turn create different access points into that block of code so in a singleton class you can only create a single object hence singleton so this piece of code as you can notice is used to create a singleton class now in to create a singleton class you need to have the constructor function private now here as you can see a singleton class is created using this private construct and it then checks if there is only one instance created and if it is it functions properly and displays initialize only once next question how to encrypt a password using php so php can be used for encryption techniques now the password underscore hash function creates a hash password from the password string using hashing algorithm so suppose you create a password string and enter your password as password at the rate 1 to 3 and you put it inside the password hash hash function so what it will generate is we are echoing this generated hash so what it will generate is this so this is the this is random it changes every time you generate the password since it is encrypted and same when you pass this password to the database using hashing algorithm even in the database the password will not be visible so your data is secure next question mention different sorting functions for arrays in php now let us understand this question in the vs code so php consists of different sorting functions which you can use to sort an given array automatically 
So if you want to sort an array in ascending order, what you need to do is use this sort function. So it will sort this array in ascending order. Now if you want to sort it in descending order, use R sort that is reverse sort. Similarly, suppose you want to sort an array in terms of value in ascending order. So you need to use a sort function that is this. So in terms of value, what in terms of value means is suppose in a given array, there are keys and values. So it will sort the array based on the values that is this 22, 27 and 37. So the array will be the same since the values are already sorted. Now, if you want to sort the array in according to key, that is this, you can use k sort that is key sort function that is provided in PHP. So in case of key sort, what it does is it will sort the array in key. That is the first one would be D that is Duke, second M Mac and the third R that is raw. Now, if you want to sort this array in descending order in terms of value, you use instead of a sort you use a reverse sort similarly if you want to sort an array in terms of key in descending you use k instead of k sort k r sort that is k reverse sort so these are the different sorting functions that are inbuilt into php moving on what will be the output of the following code now if this code is given let me give you some time and try to pause this video and think of what will be the output of the following code. So the output of this code will be 21 comma 21 or 21 comma 21. How did it happen? But before that, if you got it correct, congratulations. But if you want to understand it, see a is a variable that contains the value one while a b is a variable that is getting the value of a variable through reference. Now, we make changes in the b variable with 2 followed by this variable again which is calling the value of a by reference. So, if we make changes here, we also make changes in the value of a. Now, if we display this since the value of a is already changed by reference, it will display 2, 1 that is the value here. And again, since the value of B is already 2, 1, it will again display 2, 1. Moving on, what are construct function and destruct function in PHP? So a constructor or construct function is automatically invoked when a new object of a class is created and then can be used to initialize value in class. So when you create an object, an object for a class, a constructor function is automatically invoked but this can also be so it does not contain any value when it is invoked but you can also use this construct function to initialize some properties to give some properties to the class which will act as its default properties if nothing or no new properties are given to the class next is a destruct now a destruct is automatically invoked when an object of a class is destructed suppose you end the part of the code of a class you want you are destroying the object when you're ending the piece of code a destruct function is automatically invoked to clean up the resources next is how can php and javascript interact now PHP and JavaScript cannot directly interact with each other since PHP is a server-side scripting language while JavaScript is a client-side language. But there is a way that these two wonderful languages can interact with each other. So we can swap variables since PHP can produce JavaScript code to be implemented by the browser. So yes, you can produce JavaScript code from PHP which can then be implemented by a browser and then it is probable to pass those precise variables back to php via a url next question is explain type hinting in php now in php type hinting is used to specify the expected data type that is array object interface etc for an argument in a function declaration 
now during a function call suppose if argument does not match the expected data type the runtime will display an error and the pro that is a fatal error and the program will then terminate now in this code here what we are doing is we are type hinting so this is this code is for string type hinting and this code is for integer type hinting now if these particular set of functions that have already specified the type they are expecting does not receive the same type of variable inside them the program will return in a fatal error and it will terminate so moving on to our final question of this video write a class so yes this is a an assignment a kind of assignment for you guys so what you need to do is you need to write a class to solve the following question which i'm going to say so implement a class named basketball we all like basketball right so implement a class named basketball with an attribute named baskets so you have to create an attribute named baskets and initialize it to zero as the starting position and then create a method named score now when the score method is invoked the baskets must increase by one so let's see the solution now so this is how you create a class that is basketball now inside this class what we are going to do is we are going to initialize the number of baskets that is this variable as zero as the starting position so to do that what we're going to do is we will be using construct function as we discussed to initialize some default properties for the class so this construct function is used to initialize this baskets variable to zero now suppose we do not call this function score which is increasing the number of baskets the default value will be displayed as zero every time now suppose we invoke this score function every time a basket is scored this will increase the number of baskets by one so this is pretty simple and this is how you create a simple class which will perform the following question in this video we will cover 30 important sql questions that are most frequently asked in the interviews now these questions consist of a set of theoretical and practical questions so we will use different commands functions joins and other functionalities in excel to solve the problems so let's get started with the first question so the first question is to state the difference between where and having clause in sql now where and having are very widely used in sql to solve specific problems now let's look at the difference one by one so where clause is used to filter the records from the table based on the specified condition and can be used without the group by clause on the other hand having clause is used to filter the records from groups based on specified conditions now where clauses cannot have aggregate functions so you cannot use sum count average min and maximum functions in the where clause while in the having clause you can operate on aggregate functions and those aggregate functions are used to filter values from a group now where clause is implemented on rows or at row level so for each row of data you have the where condition applied now having clauses are implemented on columns so for each column of data you have the having condition applied now another important difference between where and having is that the where clause is executed before the execution of the group by clause and after the execution of the from clause on the other hand the having clause is executed after groups are created now we will learn more about where and having and understand the usage better when we tackle practical problems in this video now moving to our next question which is how is drop different from truncate so drop and truncate are two different commands so drop command is used to drop the whole table removing the table definition and its contents while truncate deletes all the rows from the table now we can drop the whole table structure in one go so the view of the table does not exist by using the truncate command the existence of all the rows in the table is lost but the view in the table exists now integrity constraints will be removed in drop command 
while the integrity constraints will not be removed when you use the truncate command. Now moving to our third question. Now this is a practical question. So we will be using a table which is present in my MySQL database. So the table name is called employees and I want to find the lowest salary of the employees in each department. You can see here this is how my employees table looks and the output query would be something like this. So here since I want to find the lowest salary of the employees so I'm using a min function to find the lowest salary in the table and then I'm grouping all the employees and the results by department. So let's do this on MySQL Workbench. Okay, so here I am on my MySQL Workbench. First, let me go ahead and create a new SQL script. So I'll click on this and that will create a new script. Okay, so here we'll write our commands. Alright, so our question was to find the lowest salary for each department okay so I have given my comment to make my commands and whatever I am doing more readable so first before I proceed I need to select my database so I am going to use my SQL underscore intro database so I'll write use SQL underscore intro now this database has a lot of tables that we will be using in this interview questions video. I will run it. Okay. We are in our SQL intro database. Now there is a table called employees. Let me show you the table first. If I write select star from employees. Okay. So here you can see this is the table I am talking about. Now these are the rows that are present in the table. We have 20 rows and here you can see the different columns. We have the employee ID, employee name, age, gender. We have the department, city and salary. Now this is the same table that we have also used in our other videos that are already live on YouTube. Okay. So let's solve our question to find the lowest salary for each department. Now for that I'll write select, I'll select my department column which is DEPT, comma and then to calculate the lowest salary or to find the lowest salary I'm going to use the min function. So that will return the minimum salary present in the salary column. So I'll write min salary as I'm giving an alias name as let's say lowest underscore salary from my table name that is employees then I'll write group by department now I'm grouping it by department because we want to find the lowest salary of the employees in each department now let's run and see the result there you go I'll just move it to the top so that you can see the results clearly okay so here we have total seven departments you can see at the bottom and in these seven departments you can see in sales 70,000 let's say dollars was the lowest salary in marketing we had 55,000 dollars as the lowest salary similarly if I scroll down we have other departments like tech IT finance and HR so these are the lowest salary in each department all right now moving to our next question so our fourth question is which query will help you fetch unique values from a column in a table so this is a multiple choice question which is another type of question that is often asked in the SQL interviews now we have multiple queries here and you need to choose the right query that will solve our problem so since I want to get the unique values from a column in a table so the right option would be to use the distinct keyword in the query so if I write select distinct followed by the column name let's say you want to find the distinct cities or the distinct departments in the employees table 
so the query would be select distinct city or let's say department from the table name that is employees hence this is the right option if you want to find any unique values from a column now moving to the fifth question now the fifth question says it is actually a similar question here we want to write the SQL query to fetch unique departments from the employees table. So as we saw this is our employees table and if you want to find the unique departments from the employees table you can just write select distinct then followed by the column name which is departments here so DEPT from employees. Let's do this on our MySQL workbench. Okay so let me just scroll down and I'll give a comment here that is we want to find the unique departments so the query would be select then I'll use the distinct keyword if I hit tab it will auto complete then I have my column that is department from my table name that is employees if I run this the query will give us the unique departments that are present in the table so here we have total seven unique departments in the table you can see here we have sales marketing product tech IT finance and HR but if you see our original table which is the employees table so there are total 20 records and if you see the department column there are multiple departments to which each of these employees belong to okay now moving ahead now the sixth question is to write an SQL query to fetch the unique values of departments and print their length now this question consists of two parts first we need to fetch the unique values of departments that we saw in our fifth question and then we want to print the length of each of the departments so for that I'm using the distinct keyword to find the unique departments and then I'm using the inbuilt length function that is present in MySQL to find the length of the department and then I'm using an alias that is length underscore department from employees so let's say this on our workbench okay so let me give a comment I'll say unique departments and length okay so the query would be I'll write select distinct department and then let me just scroll down I'll give a comma and use my inbuilt length function see I'm hitting tab to auto complete and inside the length function I'll give my column name that is department I'll give an alias as department underscore length from my table that is employees this is pretty simple so first I'm finding the unique departments and then using the length function I'm finding the length of each department let's run and see okay you can see the result here so sales the length is 5 marketing the length of marketing is 9 so basically you are counting the number of characters that are present in each of the departments so in sales there are total 5 characters in marketing there are total 9 characters in product there are total 7 characters in IT we have just 2 letters I and T so hence the length is 2 similarly finance is 7 and HR is 2 because we have just two letters H and R okay so this is another variation of using distinct along with any inbuilt function all right now moving to the seventh question the question is what is the use of date diff function in SQL now date diff returns the number of days between two date or date time or timestamp values so date diff is another crucial inbuilt function that is present in MySQL so here is how you can use the date diff function so it will return the 
number of days between two dates or date time or timestamp values. So here I have two date values that is 10th of April 2021 and I have 30th of March 2021. So this query will give us the total number of days that lie between these two dates and similarly here is another example of using the date diff function. So I want to calculate the total number of days that are present between today's date. So I am using the now function and between 20th of April 2021. So let's do this demo on the workbench. Alright, first I will give a comment saying date diff function. Okay, now the way to use is I'll write select and then you can see here once I type date, MySQL Workbench is automatically suggesting some of the inbuilt functions. I'm going to use date diff and within date diff, I'm going to pass in two values. So I'm passing in two date values, let's say 2021 April. So I'll write 04 and let's say 10th of April. I'll give another comma and I'll pass in my second date value that is going to be 30th of March 2021. Alright. Now another thing to note here is the date value should be present inside quotations. Now if you want you can give an alias as well. I'll write as total days. Let's run it. There you go. It has given us the output as 10. So there are total 10 days between 31st of March to 10th of April. Now let's see another example. I'll write select date diff and we'll pass in my now function. So the now function returns the current date that is today's date and I'll give another date value let's say 2021 April 20th. Now we'll see the results. If you want you can give an alias name so that the output is more readable here. I'll run it. Okay so between today's date and my previous date that was 20th of April there are total 49 days so today's date is actually 8th of June so between 20th of April and 8th of June there are total 49 days all right now moving ahead now in the eighth question we want to write an SQL query to display the departments that have more than two employees. So this is our employees table that we have been using and here is how the command looks like. So here we are using both group by and having. Now I am grouping by department because I want to display the departments that have more than two employees. Now for the second filter I am using the count function of the employee IDs and checking if the employees in each department are more than two or not. Let's do this. Let me move down a bit and I'll give a comment. Departments with more than two employees. Okay. Now let's write our query. So I want to select the department and then I'm using the count function to count the employee IDs in each department or the employees present in each department from my table that is employees I'm going to group by department and then I'll use having my count of employee ID this should be greater than 2 so our query will return only those departments which have more than two employees. Let's run and see. 
there you go so we have total four departments that is sales product tech and IT where we have more than two employees you can see here sales has four employees product has three tech has four and IT has three the rest of the departments like finance HR and others have less than two employees now if you want you can give an alias as well let's say as total employees okay let me run it again and here you can see I have the column name as total employees okay so moving ahead the ninth question we want to display the details of the employees for all the departments except marketing now here I have my employees table now if I were to display all the details of the employees apart from marketing department I can give a condition like where department not equal to marketing so this is the way how you write not equal to so you use the less than and greater than symbol another way to do is use the exclamation mark and give equal to so this means select all the employees where department is not equal to marketing now let's do this I'll move down a bit and will give a comment as details of employees apart from marketing so the query would be select star from employees I'm using star because I want to display all the details that means I want to display all the columns then I'm going to use my where condition where department not equal to marketing I'll put marketing under quotes let's run it and see the results there you go so we have total 18 rows of information and if you see the department column we have all the departments apart from marketing now if you remember our employees table had total 20 rows of information out of which two are missing which means there were two employees who were from marketing department and those departments were not displaying now another way to do is to use exclamation mark and equal to so this also means select all the employees where department is not equal to marketing let's run this you see here it gives us the same result and has returned us 18 rows of information leaving apart the employees from the marketing department all right now moving ahead so our tenth question is to write an SQL query to print the details of the employees who have joined before April 2010 and after May 2005 so here is my employees table and this is my SQL query so here we are using just a where condition to filter our results and my condition is the employee should have joined after May 2005 so I have written after 31st of May 2005 and before April 2010 which is before 31st of March 2010 let's do this I'll give a comment here we'll write employees joined before April 2010 and after May 2005 now let's write our SQL query so I'll write select star from employees where my date of join if you see here I have a column called date of join which has the details about the day on which the employee had joined the company 
so I'm going to write where date of join is greater than 31st of May 2005 so I'll write 2005 this is one of the formats to use date values so this is the year value this is the month value and this is the day value and my date of join should be less than 31st of March 2010 so I'll write 2010 March 31st I hope you were able to understand this date of join greater than 31st of May 2005 means after May 2005 and date of join less than 31st of March 2010 this means employees joined before 2010 April let's run it okay so we have total three employees in our table you can see the date of join and all of them have joined after May 2005 and before April 2010 okay now moving ahead to the 11th question so here we want to find the employee with the third highest salary from the table so I have my employees table here and my command would look something like this so here we are going to explore how to write sub queries in SQL so I'm using a sub query here where I'm trying to find the employees who have the top three salaries or the top three employees who have the highest salaries and from that I'm going to filter out my third highest salary employee so let's do it on our workbench okay so I'll come down and let me give a comment as third highest salary okay so let me first write down my SQL query and then I'll explain so I'll write select star from after that I'll start a bracket and write my inner query so I'll write select star from employees order by salary descending then I'll use my limit keyword and I'll write limit 3 as I'll give an alias name let's say T and then I'm again going to use my order by salary limit 1 okay now let me explain you the flow so first let me run the inner query I'll select my inner query and I'll run it so the inner query returns my top three employees who have the highest salary and this is ordered in descending order since I used salary descending now let me just use this okay now you can see it clearly so these are my top three employees who have the highest salary so Joseph has the maximum salary followed by Angela and then we have Jack now from this I want to return only the record for Jack because Jack is the employee who earns the third highest salary so for that I am going to use the result return by my subquery or the inner query and on top of this I'm going to order the salary and say limit equal to 1 so I'm again ordering this salary in ascending order so what will happen Jack will appear at the top Angela will be at the second place and Joseph will come to the third place and from there I'm using limit 1 so that I can only get the record for Jack now if I run the entire query you see the result I have my employee name as Jack who earns the third highest salary okay now moving ahead to the 12th question the question is to print all the alternate records in a table so here is my employees table and from this table I'm going to print all the alternate records for example I'm going to print the, my employee ID 101 then 
I'm going to skip 102 and print 103 followed by 105, 107, 109. So all the employee IDs that have an odd value and you can look at this example in another way of displaying the employees which have an employee ID of even numbers. So 102, 104, 106 and so on. Now the way to do is either you can use a simple select clause and say employee ID percentage or modulus 2 equal to 0 which means I want to filter only those employees which have an even employee ID else what you can do is you can use a CTE as you can see here. So CTE or the common table expression is a temporary named result set that you can reference within a select insert update or delete statement. Now it is used to simplify complex joins and subqueries and to provide a means to query hierarchical data. Now let's write this query on our workbench and see how it works. So before that let me explain you I am using a few new functions such as row number this will create a row number for each of the rows or the records present in my table and then from this CTE I am going to use my filter clause or the where clause where rn which is row number percentage 2 equal to equal to 1 so this will return only the odd records from the table let's see how to do it okay so I'll give a comment print alternate records okay now I'll start with my simple query which is select star from employees where let's say I want to find only the even employee IDs or the employees who have an even employee ID so I can use employee ID percentage 2 equal to 0 so it has to be a perfect division and the result should be 0 only then I can get only the even employees if I run this okay there was an error here it should be employees I'll run it again you can see here I have printed the alternate records in a table so we have skipped 101 because it is not divisible by 2 I've started with 102 followed by 104 106 108 and then finally we have 120 or 120 now if you want to print only the odd records in the table you can use employee ID percentage 2 equal to 1 so you can see here I have 101, 103, 105, 107 up to 119 now the best way to do this is to use a common table expression or CTE so I'll start with my command that is with CTE as I'll start with my bracket I'll write select star comma then I'm going to use my row number function so I'll write row number then I'll write over then I'll use order by employee ID so this row number for each of the rows is going to be created over my employee ID column and that is sorted in ascending order I'll give an alias as RN which stands for row number from my table that is employees I'll scroll down and then I'm going to close my bracket I'll write select let me remove the space here okay I'll write select star from CTE where my row number percentage 2 equal to 1 now let's see this from the top so I have my common table expression where I am going to create a row number column named as RN and this row number column is based on my employee ID column which is sorted in ascending order and from that 
I am going to filter only those row number values that are not divisible by 2 or I am going to print only the odd records from the table. So let's run it and see the results. There you go. So here if you mark, I have my row number column created and I am filtering only the odd records in the table. So it starts with 1, 3, 5, 7 and goes up to 19. And similarly here you can see the employee IDs, the name, the age, gender and other information. Now if you were to print the even records in the table, the alternate even records, you can use RN percentage 2 equal to 0. Let's see the difference. I'll run this. There you go. So I have my even row number starting from 2 which goes up to 20. Okay. So this is how you can print alternate records in a table. Now moving to the next question. Now in the 13th question, we want to write an SQL query to fetch all the duplicate rows in a table. Now this is another crucial interview question that is often asked in most of the interviews. Now I have a table which is named as duplicate table and here you can see I have some employee ID, name and age and a few records are duplicated. For example, 101 Sam 40, the first record is duplicated and you can see here it has the same values. Now if you mark 103 Mary and 28 is not duplicated because here the age is different. So this is a different person than compared to the third name that we have. So this is how you can find the duplicate rows in a table. So I'm going to select my employee ID, name and age and then count all the employee IDs, the names and age and compare them with whether they are greater than 1 or not. So if they are greater than 1, then I'll say that particular record is duplicated or is present more than one time in the table. Let's do this implementation on our workbench. Okay, so I'll come down and let me give my comment as duplicate records. Okay, so let me first show you the records that are present in my table. So I'll write select star from dup underscore employees. I'll run it. Okay, you can see here I have my table that we saw in the slides. So employee ID 101 with name Sam and age 40 is duplicated. So we want to find this duplicate record. The way to do is I'll write select e underscore id which is employee id comma name comma age comma I'm going to count all of them. So I'll write count star as duplicate count this is my alias name from my table that is dup underscore employees I'll say group by employee id name and age and then I'm going to use my having clause saying having count of employee id is greater than 1 and count of name should also be greater than 1 and my count of age should also be greater than 1. Let's run it and see the results. Okay, there is some error here. The name of the table should be employees. Okay, let's run again. We have our correct result that is employee ID 101 with name Sam and age 40 is duplicated. So the value is 2. Great. Now moving ahead. Now the 14th question is a bit tricky wherein we want to display the employees with exactly two 
A is in their name. So you see here I have my employee names and there are certain employees who have just two A's in their names. So I want to find those employees only. Now the way to do is it is a bit tricky to understand. I am going to break it down and make you understand on my MySQL workbench. So here you can just have a glance. I write select star from employees where I am finding the length of my employee name and then subtracting my length wherein I have replaced my employee name that has A with a blank and if this subtraction is equal to 2 then that particular employee has two A's in their names. So let me show this first. Let me first give my comment as employees with two E's. Okay. So first I'm going to write a select statement. Okay, before that I'll show you the records present in my table okay if you see here Shane is one of the employees that has just one A in its name then we have Mary one A Dwayne has one A but if you see Sarah Sarah has two A in the name so we want to extract Sarah then Jack has one A Again, if you see Angela, Angela has 2A. It doesn't matter if it is uppercase A or lowercase A. We just need to find if the employees have 2As in their name. And similarly, if I scroll down, let me check if we have any other employee with 2As in their name. Marcus has 1, David has 1, Sophia has 1. We also have Amelia that has 2As in its name or in her name and we also have Maya okay now let me go ahead and write a SQL query and then I'll explain you what I'm trying to do I'll write select I'm using the length function and in the length function I'm going to replace then I'll use another function called upper on top of employee name I'll write A and then replace it with a blank so I'm using quotations to represent blank from employees okay let's run this and see the results you see here it has given us the length of the employee strings after replacing all the A's with a blank. So here I'm essentially converting my employee names to uppercase and I'm changing wherever there is an A, I'm replacing that A with a blank and then I'm finding the length. So this trick I'm going to use in my final query. So I'll write select star from employees where what I'm going to do is I'll bring this to the next line I'll write length of employee name minus then I'm going to use my above condition I'll copy this I'll paste it here and this value should be 2 so what I am doing is I am first finding out the length of my employee name from that I am subtracting the length after replacing the A's present in the employee name with a blank and this value should be equal to 2 the reason being we are only trying to find the employees who have 2 A's in their name let's run and see the results okay if you see here we have Sarah Angela Emilia and Maya who have two A's in their name so we have Sarah 
that has 2a, Angela has 2a, Amelia has 2a's and then Maya also has 2a. Okay, now moving ahead. Now the 15th question is, given a string, how will you extract 4 characters starting from the second position? So I have my string here which says Michael Balak. Now Michael Balak, you must be aware, is a popular footballer. He is from Germany and also was the captain of Germany. So from the string Michael Balak, I am going to extract 4 characters starting from the second position. You can use two inbuilt MySQL functions to do this. The first is called sub str wherein we pass in the string then we give the position from where we want to extract the characters so here I am going to extract from the second position so hence 2 and then the number of characters that you want to extract which is 4 the other way is to use the substring function which is again similar to the sub str function in the substring function also I am first passing in my input string and then giving my starting position which is 2 and then I want to extract 4 characters from it. Let's do it. I'll give a comment extract strings so here I'm going to write select first I'm going to use sub str which is my inbuilt function I'm going to pass in my input string which says Michael Balak and then I'll give my starting position which is 2 and then the number of characters that is 4. Let's run it and see the results. You can see here it has given us ICHA. So if you see M is at the first position from the second position onwards I needed 4 characters so M, C, H and E. These are the 4 characters starting from the second position. Similarly let me just copy this and instead of sub str I'm going to use the substring function. I'll write just ing that becomes substring. Let's select and run it and this also returns the same result. Suppose you wanted to extract from the fourth position you wanted to extract let's say three characters. Let's see the results. It gives us h, a and e. If you see here M is the first position, I is at the second position, C is at the third position, H starts from the fourth position. So H, A and E are the next three characters starting from the fourth position. So hence this is the result. Alright, now moving ahead. Now my 16th question is on how does self-join work? So self-join joins a table to itself. So the table must contain a column X that acts as the primary key and a different column let's say y that stores values that can be matched up with the values in column x now this might not be really easy to understand you'll get to know once we do this demo so i have a table which is called employee manager so this is my table now let me tell you how to interpret this table we have five different employees starting from employee id 1 to employee id 5 Gary, Gibbs, Smith, Latham and Jimmy are the different employees we have. You have their salaries and now you have the employees reporting to which manager. Now if you see here, Gary's manager ID is 3. So if you see our table at 3 we have Smith. So Gary is reporting to 3 or in other words Smith has a employee under him who is Gary. Similarly Gibbs is reporting to manager ID 1 or employee ID 1 which is Gary. So Gibbs manager is Gary. Similarly if you see for Smith, Smith is reporting to the person with manager ID 4 or employee ID 4. We have Latham. So Latham has one employee under him who is Smith. Now Latham in our table has no managers. Then we have Jimmy who is reporting to the employee ID 3 who is Smith. Okay. Now I want to use this table and return the name of the manager for each employee. To do that, I'm going to use my self join. So here I'm using a self join to join both the tables. Here, both the tables mean I'm using 
the same table twice. So I have written select e dot employee ID, e dot employee name. Then we have e dot manager ID. Then I'm using another alias for managers. So m dot employee name as manager underscore name from employee underscore manager as e. This join means self join employee underscore manager as m on e dot manager id equal to e dot employee id so this is my common column that is employee id or manager id let's do it all right i'll give a comment here saying self join and i'll start with my self join i'll write select let me first display my table i'll write select star from and my table name is emp underscore manager I'll run it. You can see the table here. This is the same table that we saw in the slides. Now I'll write my join query. I'll write select e dot employee ID comma e dot employee name comma e dot manager ID. comma then I'm using another alias as M for finding the manager name so M dot employee name as manager name there shouldn't be any space in the alias name then I'll write from EMP underscore manager as E join EMP underscore manager as M on e dot manager underscore id equal to m dot emp underscore id let me run this and we'll see the results there you go so gary reports to the manager id 3 so from the table 3 is for Smith so Gary's manager is Smith Gibbs manager is Gary Smith's manager is Latham and Jimmy's manager is Smith okay so this is how you can use self join now moving ahead with our next question so the 17th question is on which of the following is called a virtual table in SQL so again we have a multiple choice question so the answer is view you can see here so view is a virtual table that has rows and columns as they are in a real table in the database now we can create a view by selecting fields from one or more tables present in the database next moving to the 18th question so here we want to write an SQL query to fetch the list of employees with the same salary again I am going to use a self join here wherein I'll join the same employees table and this is how my query would look like so I'm selecting distinct employee ID so e dot employee ID e dot employee name e dot salary from employees then I'm joining employees as e on employees e1 where e dot salary equal to e1 dot salary because I want to fetch the list of employees with the same salary and I'm ensuring that the employee IDs from both the tables are different Let's do it. I'll give a comment here and write employees with same salary and I'll start with my query. I'll write select distinct e dot employee ID comma I'll write e dot employee name comma e dot salary from employees as e then employees as e1 where e dot salary equal to e1 dot salary and 
e dot employee id is not equal to e1 dot employee id i'll give a semicolon and let's print the results you see here we have emilia bela shane and sara who have the same salary so emilia and shane have the same salary of fifty five thousand dollars bela and sara have the same salary of seventy two thousand dollars okay now moving to the 19th question so the question is to write an sql query to print one row twice in results from a table so i have a table here called employees and i want to print one row twice in the results so to solve such kind of problems you need to use the union all operator in sql so union all combines the result sets of two or more select statements it does not remove duplicate rows between the various select statements all the rows are returned so let's say i want to print the employee name and department for those employees who are from the hr department now to do this we can use the union all operator you can see it here so i'm selecting my employee name the department from my table employees as e then i'm giving my where clause where e dot department equal to hr and then i'm using the union all operator then i'm again selecting my employee name department from employees with another alias as e1 where e1 dot department equal to hr so let's do this okay so i'll give my comment as print row twice okay now i'll start with my query i'll write select my employee name comma the department from my table that is employees as e then i'll use where e dot department equal to hr then i'm going to use the union all operator so the union all will combine the result set of two or more select statements then i'm going to write select emp underscore name comma my department from employees as e1 where e1 dot department equal to hr i'll give a semicolon now let's run it there you go you can see here marcus and sophia are from the hr department and we have printed them twice in our results coming to the next question the question is using the num table write a query to add 10 when number is 0 20 when number is 1 else print the number itself so you can see here i have my table called num and it has just one column which is num id or number id we have some numbers here and from these numbers i want to add 10 if the number is 0 20 if the number is 1 else i would print the number itself so to answer this question we'll use the case statement in sql so the case statement is sql's way of handling if then logic the case statement is followed by at least one pair of when and then statements so here you can see i have my case statement i'm writing when case my column name n underscore id equal to zero then add plus 10 if it is one then add plus 20 else we'll just return the number id now let's do this okay i'll give a comment saying using case statements okay first of all let me display the values present in my num table you can see here this is my table and there are total 12 rows of numbers now let's start with our query i'll write select 
n underscore id comma then i'm going to write my case statement so i'll use the keyword as case when n underscore id equal to zero i'll use then n underscore id plus 10 i'll write when n underscore id equal to 1 then n underscore id plus 20 else i'll just print an id now i'll end my key statement i'll write end as an alias name let's say num underscore add from my table that is num let's run and see the results okay you can see here my first number was 0 so since it was 0 we have added num id or n id plus 10 so the result is 10 now wherever the num id is 1 for example here we have added 20 so the result or the output becomes 21 similarly here the value was 0 so we have added 10 the output is 10 and you see here again here we had another 1 so we added 1 to 20 so the result becomes 21 and for the rest of the numbers for example 3 we had 2 the values are the same okay now moving ahead so we have a table called num1 and using this table we want to write a query to find the sum of all positive values and the negative values so let's see the table first so this is my table which is num1 you can see here we have a list of integers and there are positive as well as negative integers so for positive values and the negative values we want to find the sum separately so again for this we are using the case statement you can see here i have used two case statements i'm writing select and then i'm using the case to find if the number is greater than zero which means it's a positive number so i'm finding out the sum and then i'm checking case when the integer is less than zero so it's a negative number and I'm finding the sum for the negative numbers as well let's do this okay so I'll give my comment as add positive and negative numbers okay so let's start with our select query I'll write select I'll use the sum function and inside the sum function I'll use my case statement so i'll write case when num underscore integer okay before that let me just print the values present in my table so i'll write select star from my table name that is num1 okay so you can see here these are the values or the list of integers that we have there are some positive as well as negative integers okay let's continue with our query so here i'm going to write case when num underscore integer or int which is my column name if it is greater than zero then i'll return num underscore int else i'll say zero and end my case statement i'll give an alias as sum of let's say positive numbers I'll give a comma then i'll use another sum function and inside the sum function we'll use the case statement to find the sum of negative numbers or integers so i'll write num underscore int if it is less than zero then num underscore int else 0 and I'll end okay and I'll give another alias name as let's say sum underscore neg which stands for negative pos is for positive integers and then 
I'll write from my table that is num1. Let's run it. Okay, there you go. We have our results. So we have two columns sum of positive integers and sum of negative integers. You can see the results 19 and minus 14 respectively. Okay, now moving ahead. Now in question number 22, we want to list the difference between primary key and foreign key. So as you can see here, primary key is something that can uniquely identify a record in a table. So if you consider a school database, a primary key would ideally be the roll number or the registration number of the student because that is unique to all the students in a school. Now foreign key is the field in the table that is primary key to another table. So suppose you have another table called courses to which the students have enrolled to. Now if you have a roll number or a registration number column in the course table that becomes the foreign key. Now the other difference is primary key don't accept or cannot accept null values while foreign key can accept null values. Now you can have only one primary key in a table but you can have more than one foreign key in a table. Now coming to the 23rd question, what is the difference between primary key and union? So you can have only one primary key in a table as we discussed in the previous question but you can have more than one unique key in a table. A primary key column cannot have null values but union can accept null values. Now if you assign a column as a primary key you create a clustered index and similarly if you assign a column with union you create non-cluster index. Okay. Now coming to the 24th question, what is a check constraint in SQL? So check constraints are used while creating tables. Check constraint helps to limit or restrict the values that can be inserted into a column. For example, we have a table here, let's say dummy1 and you want to ensure that every time you insert the age of people or persons in the table you want to make sure that age should be always greater than zero reason being a person cannot have or an animal cannot have or a tree cannot have a negative age similarly you can set a constant for the salary column in a table to ensure that it is always greater than zero because you cannot earn a negative salary or it cannot be less than zero now we are going to create a dummy table on my MySQL workbench and see how check constraints can be applied. Okay, so let's give our comment as check constraints. Alright, so I'm going to create a table called dummy, let's say underscore. SQL. Now this table will have a few columns. First we have let's say EID which stands for employee ID. The data type is integer and I'm going to assign employee ID as my primary key. So I'll write primary key here. Okay. I'll give a comma. Next we'll have a city column city column is of type var char or varying character I'll give the size as 30 and here I'm going to apply my check constraint to this city column I'm going to check the city should take only values as Mumbai let's see I'll have my final column that is age, age is of type integer and here I'm going to check my age should always be greater than 0. So I'll write check age greater than 0. Okay, 
so our dummy sql table has one primary key constraint and we have applied two check constraints on city and age column let's run this okay so we have created our table successfully you can see it here now let's insert a few records and we can see the difference i'll write insert into dummy underscore sql i'll write values i'll have my employee id as 101 i am giving my city as mumbai which is what we want and let's say I'll give my age as 10. Now this should perfectly work because my city is Mumbai and my age is greater than 0. So I should be able to insert this record successfully. You can see here I have inserted this record to the table. I'll write select star from dummy SQL so that you can check. Let's run it. Uh, there is some mistake I should write from okay let's run it you can see it here we have one record or one row returned now let's say we'll insert another record and this time I'm going to give my employee ID as 102 because it has to be unique and this time instead of Mumbai I'm going to give my city as let's say Delhi so I'm not following my check constant where I am supposed to give only Mumbai. I'm purposely giving Delhi here to see the difference. If I run this, let's say we'll have ages 40, which is greater than zero. Let's run it. You see here, we get an error saying check constraint dummy underscore SQL underscore check is violated. Similarly, Let's say I'll change this to Mumbai again and instead of 40, let's say I'll give us minus 30. So your age can never be in negative numbers. If I run this, I get the same error. My check constraint has been violated because age should be greater than 0. Okay, so this is how you can use check constraints in SQL. Now coming to the 25th question, so given two tables A and B, you want to write a query to fetch values in table B that are not present in table A. Now to answer this question, you can use the left join. So what left join does is, it returns all the rows from the left table and only matching rows from the right table. And I've used my condition as a dot id, which is in the right table, should be null. Let's write this query on the workbench. Okay, so I'll give my comment using left join. First of all, let me display my tables. I'll write select star from a. If I run this, I have the IDs. There are total 5 IDs in table A. Similarly, I'll copy this and we'll see the values that are present in table B. So again, I have 5 values. There are a few non-matching values as well. So I want to return those non-matching values that are not present in table A. So for that, I'll write select id from table b i'll use left join a using my id column this is another way to give the condition or you can use the on operator then i'll give where a dot id is null let's run and see the results there you go so 150 
275 are not present in table A but are present in table B. Thank you all for watching this full course video on PHP and MySQL. I hope it was useful and informative. Thanks again. Stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.